adhering to the truth. During their migration to Medina, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked by a passerby who the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was, as he did not recognize him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, did not want to tell him the truth, as this information might have reached the non-Muslims of Mecca, who were in pursuit of them. But at the same time, he did not desire to lie, as he was the pinnacle of honesty and truthfulness. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, told the man that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was simply his guide. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, meant his guide in this world whereas, the man assumed he meant that he was his guide during his journey. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 104-105. It is a great shame that Muslims nowadays lie for no real reason. Even though Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, remained honest, even when facing a deadly situation. Lying is unacceptable, whether it is a small lie, which is often called a white lie, or when one lies as a joke. All of these types of lies are forbidden. In fact, the one who lies to make people laugh, so their aim is not to deceive someone, has been cursed three times in one narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2315. Another popular lie people often speak, believing it is not a sin, is when they lie to children. This is undoubtedly a sin according to narrations such as the one found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4991. It is plain foolishness to lie to children, as they will only adopt this sinful habit from the elder who lies to them. Behaving in this manner shows children lying is acceptable when it is not acceptable according to the teachings of Islam. Only in very rare and extreme cases is lying acceptable, for example, lying in order to protect the life of an innocent person. It is vital to avoid lying, as according to one narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 1971, it leads to other sins such as backbiting and mocking people. This behavior leads one to the gates of hell. When a person continues to lie, they are recorded by Allah, the exalted, as a great liar. It does not take a scholar to predict what will happen to a person on judgment day, who has been recorded by Allah, the exalted, as a great liar. All Muslims desire the company of the angels, Yet when a person lies, they are deprived of their company. In fact, the stench that is emitted from the mouth of a liar causes the angels to move a mile away from them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1972. Telling lies which spread to others in society is a such a serious sin that according to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7047, if a person does this and fails to repent, they will be punished after their death to such an extent that an iron hook will be placed in their mouth and their facial skin will be torn off. Their face will regenerate instantly and the process will then be repeated. This will continuously occur until the day of judgment. To conclude, all Muslims should avoid all forms of lying irrespective of who they are conversing with. True love. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina with Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him. During their journey, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would first position himself in front of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when walking, and then sometimes position himself behind him. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questioned him about his behavior, he responded that every time he feared that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would be attacked from behind, he would position himself behind the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but then he would fear a frontal attack and this would cause him to switch positions. They eventually took shelter in the cave of Mount Thor for a few days. Before entering the cave, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, insisted on entering it first in order to clean and remove any harmful things from inside it. He even placed his foot on a crevice inside the cave out of fear a creature might emerge from it and harm the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 157. Every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The other holy prophets, peace be upon him them, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. 
They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, yet they barely know him as they are too busy to study his life, character and teachings. This is foolish, as how can one truly love someone they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on the life, character and teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious, as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. Finally, it is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on Judgment Day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. The Best Companion When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, sought refuge in the cave of Mount Thor during the migration to Medina, they were pursued by the non-Muslims of Mecca, determined to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. The non-Muslims of Mecca eventually reached the cave where they were hiding. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, observed that if the non-Muslims were to look down at their feet, they would see both him and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, hiding in the cave. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, made it clear that he was not worried about his own safety, rather he was fearful something would happen to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. At this the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated that he should not grieve as Allah, the Exalted, was their third companion. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3922, and in Ibn Kathir's, The Life of the Prophet, volume 2, pages 159 to 160. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 40. When they were in the cave and he, i.e. the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him said to his companion, Do not grieve, indeed Allah is with us. In a divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the Exalted, advises that he is with anyone who remembers him. With the rise of mental problems and disorders, such as depression, it is vital for Muslims to understand the importance of this declaration. There is a small chance of a person experiencing a mental issue when they are constantly surrounded and aided by someone that truly loves them. If this is true for a person, it is undoubtedly more befitting for Allah, the Exalted, who has promised to be with the one who remembers him. Acting on this declaration alone would eliminate all mental issues, such as depression. It is the reason why being secluded from others or being amongst others did not affect the mental state of the righteous predecessors, as they were always in the company of Allah, the Exalted. It is obvious that when one obtains the company of Allah, the Exalted, they will overcome all obstacles and difficulties successfully until they reach His proximity in the hereafter. In addition, out of His infinite mercy Allah, the Exalted, has not restricted this declaration in any way. For example, he did not declare he was only with the righteous or with those who perform specific good deeds. He in fact encompassed every Muslim irrespective of the strength of their faith or how many sins they have committed. So a Muslim should never lose hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted.
But it is important to note the condition mentioned in this narration, namely, to remember Allah, the Exalted. This is not only remembering Him with one's tongue, but more importantly, it is to remember Him through one's actions. This is only achieved by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is the true remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. The one who behaves in such a manner will be blessed with the company and support of Allah, the Exalted. Simply put, the more one obeys Allah, the Exalted, the more they will receive his company. What one gives is what they shall receive. Trusting correctly. The migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, proves that trusting in Allah, the Exalted, consists of using the means one has been provided by Allah, the Exalted, in the correct way, and then to firmly believe that whatever Allah, the Exalted decides, is best for everyone involved. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2344, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that if people truly trusted Allah, the Exalted, he would provide for them just like he provides for birds. They leave their nests hungry in the morning and return in the evening satisfied. Truly trusting in Allah, the Exalted, is something which is felt in the heart but is proven through the limbs meaning, when one sincerely obeys Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Chapter 65 at Talak verse 3 And whoever relies upon Allah, then he is sufficient for him. The aspect of trust which is internal involves firmly believing that only Allah, the Exalted, can provide one with beneficial things and protect them from harmful things both in worldly and religious matters. A Muslim understands that no one except Allah, the Exalted, can give, withhold, harm or benefit someone. It is important to note that truly trusting in Allah, the Exalted, does not mean one should abandon using the means which Allah, the Exalted, has provided, such as medicine. As the main narration under discussion clearly mentions that the birds leave their nests actively searching for provision. When one uses the strength and means provided by Allah, the Exalted, according to the teachings of Islam, they are undoubtedly obeying Him. This is in fact the outward element of trusting in Allah, the Exalted. This has been made clear in many verses and narrations. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 71. O oh, you who have believed, take your precaution. In reality, the outward activity is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and trusting Allah, the Exalted, inwardly is the inward state of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One should not abandon the outward tradition, even if they possess the inward state of trust. Actions and using the means provided by Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of trusting him. In this respect, actions can be split into three categories. The first are those actions of obedience which Allah, the Exalted, commands Muslims to do so that they can avoid hell and obtain paradise. Abandoning these while claiming trust that Allah, the Exalted, will forgive them is simply wishful thinking and is therefore blameworthy. The second type of actions are those means which Allah, the Exalted, has created in this world in order for people to live in it safely, such as eating when hungry, drinking when thirsty and wearing warm clothes in cold weather. A person who abandons these and causes harm to themselves is blameworthy. However, there are some people who have been provided special strength by Allah, the Exalted, so that they can avoid these means without harming themselves. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, used to fast for days on end uninterrupted but forbade others from doing the same as Allah, the Exalted, provided for him directly without the need for food. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1922. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, prayed for the fourth rightly guided Caliph Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, so that he would not feel excess cold or heat. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 117. Therefore, if a person turns away from these means but is provided with the strength to endure without failing in their duties to Allah, the Exalted, and people, then it is acceptable otherwise it is blameworthy. The third type of actions in respect to trusting in Allah, the Exalted, are those things which have been set as a customary practice which Allah, the Exalted, sometimes breaks for certain people. An example of this 
are the people who become cured of illnesses without the need of medicine. This is quite common, especially in poorer countries where medicine is difficult to obtain. This is linked to a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2144, which advises that no person will die until they utilize every ounce of their provision which was allocated to them, which according to another narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748, was over 50,000 years before Allah, the Exalted, created the heavens and the earth. So the one who truly realizes this narration might not seek provision actively, knowing that what was allocated to them so long ago cannot miss them. So for this person, the customary means of obtaining provision, such as obtaining it through a job, is broken by Allah, the Exalted. This is a high and rare rank. Only the one who can behave in such a manner without complaining or panicking, nor expecting things from people, is free of blame if they choose this path. It is important to note that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1692, that it is a sin for a person to fail in providing for their dependents, even though they may be on this high rank. Having real trust in Allah, the Exalted, leads to being content with destiny. Meaning, whatever Allah, the Exalted, chooses for them, they accept without complaint and without desiring things to change, as they firmly trust that Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. To conclude, it is best to follow the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by using the lawful means one has been granted firmly believing they are from Allah, the Exalted, and trust internally that only what Allah, the Exalted, decides will occur, which is undoubtedly the best choice for each person whether they observe this or not. Best of Places Before entering Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, resided for ten days in Kuba, where he built the first mosque of Islam, which is regarded to be the mosque which is indicated in chapter 9 at Torba, verse 108. A mosque founded on righteousness from the first day is more worthy for you to stand in. Within it are men who love to purify themselves, and Allah loves those who purify themselves. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3906. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1528, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the most beloved places to Allah, the Exalted, are the mosques and the most hated places to him are the marketplaces. Islam does not prohibit Muslims from going to places other than the mosques, nor does it command them to always inhabit the mosques. But it is important that they prioritize attending mosques for the congregational prayers and attending religious gatherings over visiting the marketplaces unnecessarily. When a need arises, there is no harm to attend other places, such as shopping centers, but a Muslim should avoid going to them unnecessarily, as they are places where sins more often occur. Whereas, the mosques are meant to be a sanctuary from sins and a comfortable place to obey Allah, the Exalted, in. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. Just like a student benefits from a library, as it is an environment created for studying similarly, Muslims can benefit from mosques, as their very purpose is to encourage Muslims to obtain and act on useful knowledge so that they can obey Allah, the Exalted. Not only should a Muslim prioritize the mosques over other places, but they should encourage others such as their children to do the same. In fact, it is an excellent place for the youth to avoid sins, crimes and bad company, which lead to nothing but trouble and regret in both worlds. The Blessed Life in Medina The First Year After Migration A Beautiful Legacy When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, arrived in Medina, one of the first things he did was build a house of Allah, the Exalted, the Masjid and Nabawi. The land belonged to two orphan boys, Suhail and Sal, may Allah be pleased with them, who offered the land for free, but the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, refused to take it for free and purchased it from them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 165 to 166. 
First of all, it is important to understand worldly legacies come and go. How many rich and powerful people have built massive empires, only for them to be torn apart and forgotten shortly after their death? The few signs left behind from some of these legacies only endure in order to warn people not to follow in their footsteps. An example is the great empire of Pharaoh. Islam not only teaches Muslims to send blessings ahead of them to the hereafter in the form of righteous deeds, but it also teaches them to leave a lovely legacy behind from which people can benefit from. In fact, when a Muslim passes away and leaves behind anything which is useful, such as an ongoing charity in the form of a water well, they will be rewarded for it. This is confirmed in narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4223. So a Muslim should strive to perform righteous deeds and send forward as much good as possible, but they should also try leaving a good legacy behind which will benefit them after they pass away. Unfortunately, many Muslims are so concerned about their wealth and properties, that they only end up leaving them behind, which does not benefit them in the least. Each Muslim should not be fooled into believing they have plenty of time for creating a legacy for themselves, as the moment of death is unknown and often pounces on people unexpectedly. Today is the day a Muslim should truly reflect on the legacy they will leave behind. If this legacy is good and beneficial, they should praise Allah, the Exalted, for granting them the strength to do so. But if it is something which will not benefit them, then they should prepare something which will, so that they not only send forward good to the hereafter, but also leave good behind. It is hoped that the one who is surrounded by good in this way, will be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted. So each Muslim should ask themselves what is their legacy. Led by example. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, arrived in Medina, one of the first things he did was build a house of Allah, the Exalted, the Masjid and Nabawi. Instead of ordering others to build the mosque and relax himself, which most leaders in this day and age would do, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, actively took part in constructing the mosque. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 166. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached, had a much more positive effect on others, compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3. Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. Achieving goodness. When the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, arrived in Medina, one of the first things he did was build a house of Allah, the Exalted, the Masjid and Nabawi. Instead of ordering others to build the mosque and relax himself, which most leaders in this day and age would do, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, actively took part in constructing the mosque. While building the mosque, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would chant, O oh Allah, there is no good except the good of the afterlife. Please aid the helpers and the emigrants. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 453. 
This means that one will only achieve good in both worlds when they connect their worldly blessings to the hereafter. In reality, in most cases nothing in this material world in itself is good or bad, such as wealth. What makes a thing good or bad is the way it is used. It is important to understand that the very purpose of everything which was created by Allah, the Exalted, was for it to be used correctly according to the teachings of Islam. When something is not used correctly, it in reality becomes useless. For example, wealth is useful in both worlds when it is used correctly, such as being spent on the necessities of a person and their dependents. But it can become useless and even a curse for its bearer if it is not used correctly, such as being hoarded or spent on sinful things. Simply hoarding wealth causes wealth to lose value. How can paper and metal coins one tucks away be useful? In this respect, there is no difference between a blank piece of paper and a note of money. It is only useful when it is used correctly. So if a Muslim desires all their worldly possessions to become a blessing for them in both worlds, all they have to do is use them correctly according to the teachings found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But if they use them incorrectly, then the same blessing will become a burden and curse for them in both worlds. It is as simple as that. One can adopt the correct attitude when they understand the purpose of these blessings. Every worldly blessing a Muslim possesses is only a means which should aid them in reaching the hereafter safely. It is not an end in itself. For example, wealth is a means one should use in order to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, fulfilling their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. It is not an end or an ultimate goal in itself. This not only aids a Muslim in maintaining their focus on the hereafter, but it also aids them whenever they lose worldly blessings. When a Muslim treats each worldly blessing, such as a child, as a means to please Allah, the Exalted, and reach the hereafter safely, then losing it will not have such a detrimental impact on them. They may become sad, which is an acceptable emotion, but they will not become grieved which leads to impatience and other mental problems, such as depression. This is because they firmly believe the worldly blessing they possessed was only a means, so losing it does not cause a loss in the ultimate goal namely, paradise, the loss of which is disastrous. Therefore, still possessing and concentrating on the ultimate goal will prevent them from becoming grieved. In addition, they will understand that just like the thing they lost was only a means they firmly believe, they will be provided with another means to reach and fulfill their ultimate goal by Allah, the Exalted. This will also prevent them from grieving. Whereas, the one who believes their worldly blessing is the end instead of a means will experience severe grief when losing it, as their whole purpose and objective has been lost. This grief will lead to depression and other mental issues. To conclude, Muslims should treat each blessing they possess as a means to reach the hereafter safely, not as an end in itself. This is how one can possess things without being possessed by them. This is how they can keep worldly things in their hands and not in their hearts. Effects of Jealousy When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, entered Medina, he rode by the house of one of the chiefs of Medina, Abdullah bin Ubay, who later became the chief of the hypocrites. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, expected an invitation from him, but Abdullah bin Ubay rudely told him to stay with the people who invited him to Medina. Saad bin Ubadah, may Allah be pleased with him, apologized for Abdullah's behavior and commented that before his arrival to Medina, they were preparing to make Abdullah their king. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 180. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4210, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that envy destroys good deeds just like fire consumes wood. Envy is a serious and major sin because the envious problem is not with another person, in reality, it is with Allah, the Exalted, as He is the one who granted the blessing which is envied. So a person's envy only demonstrates their displeasure with the allocation and choice of Allah, the Exalted. They believe Allah, the Exalted, made a mistake when He allocated a particular blessing to another person instead of them. Some exert efforts through their speech and actions, 
in order to confiscate the blessing from the other person, which is undoubtedly a sin. The worst kind is when the envier strives to remove the blessing from the owner, even if the envier does not obtain the blessing. Envy is only lawful when a person does not act on their feelings, dislikes their feelings and strives to obtain a similar blessing without the owner losing the blessing. Even though this type is not a sin, it is considered disliked if the envy is over a worldly blessing and praiseworthy if it is over a religious blessing. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned two examples of the praiseworthy type in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The first person who can be lawfully envied is the one who acquires and spends lawful wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. The second person who can be lawfully envied is the one who uses their knowledge in the correct way and teaches it to others. An envious Muslim should strive to remove this feeling from their heart by showing good character and kindness towards the person envied, such as praising their good qualities and supplicating for them until their envy becomes love for them. Doing business correctly. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, many of the merchants traded unfairly, and so Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 83 al mutafifan verses 1 to 6. Woe to those who give less than due, who, when they take a measure from people, take in full. But if they give by measure or by weight to them, they cause loss. Do they not think that they will be resurrected? For a tremendous day, the day when mankind will stand before the Lord of the worlds. After this, the merchants began to trade fairly and honestly. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al nuzal 83-1, page 162. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 2146, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that merchants will be raised as a moral people on Judgment Day, except those who fear Allah, the Exalted, act righteously and speak the truth. This narration applies to all those who take part in business transactions. It is extremely important to fear Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This includes treating others kindly according to the teachings of Islam. In respect to business dealings, a Muslim should be honest in their speech by disclosing all the details of the transaction to all who are involved. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2079, warns that when Muslims hide things in financial transactions, such as defects in their goods, it will lead to a loss in blessings. Acting righteously includes not striving to con others by making them pay excessively for goods. A Muslim should simply treat others how they desire to be treated meaning, with honesty and full disclosure. The same way, a Muslim would not like to be mistreated in financial matters, they should not mistreat others. Those conducting business should always avoid lying, as it leads to immorality and immortality leads to hell. In fact, a person will keep telling and acting on lies until they are recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971. Great Sacrifices After the violence against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased them, escalated further he gave the companions, may Allah be pleased them, permission to migrate to Medina. Covertly they began to migrate to Medina, leaving behind everything they owned and knew. After Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, fulfilled the command of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to return the belongings of the people of Mecca to them, which was entrusted to him. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, migrated to Medina to join the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He left alone with no riding animal, and the journey was therefore extremely dangerous and difficult. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 83. When one of the companions, Shoaib, may Allah be pleased him, decided to migrate, the non-Muslims of Mecca attempted to prevent him from doing so. They claimed that when he first entered Mecca, he was poor, and through the financial opportunities there he became wealthy, so they would therefore not allow him to leave Mecca after benefiting from it. Shoaib, may Allah be pleased him, 
offered them his entire wealth which he had buried in Mecca in exchange for letting him go or they could fight with him until one side was victorious. They chose to let him go in exchange for his wealth. On his arrival to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised him that his trade was most profitable. In this regard, Allah the Exalted revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 207. And of the people is he who sells himself, seeking means to the approval of Allah. And Allah is kind to his servants. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, Volume 1, page 580. Damra, may Allah be pleased with him, was a wealthy blind man of Mecca who accepted Islam. Even though he was exempt from the obligatory duty of migrating to Medina because of his disability, he desired to gain the reward and join the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He died during his migration and the following verse was revealed about him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 100. And whoever emigrates for the cause of Allah, will find on the earth many alternative locations and abundance. And whoever leaves his home as an emigrant to Allah and his messenger, and then death overtakes him, his reward has already become incumbent upon Allah. And Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad Kandlawi's Hayatus Sahaba, Volume 1, pages 365-367. It is important for Muslims to understand that Allah, the Exalted, does not demand Muslims to overcome the difficulties which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, endured. For example, this incident mentions the migration from Mecca to Medina, whereby they left behind their families, homes, businesses, and migrated to a strange land, all for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In comparison, the difficulties Muslims face now are not as difficult as those the righteous predecessors faced. Muslims should therefore be grateful that they are only required to make a few small sacrifices, such as sacrificing some sleep to offer the obligatory dawn prayer and some wealth to donate the obligatory charity. Allah, the Exalted, is not commanding them to leave their homes and families for His sake. This gratitude must be shown practically by using the blessings one possesses in ways pleasing to Allah the Exalted. In addition, when a Muslim faces difficulties, they should remember the difficulties the righteous predecessors faced and how they overcame them through steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This knowledge can provide a Muslim the strength to overcome their difficulties as they know the righteous predecessors were more beloved to Allah, the Exalted yet they endured more severe difficulties with patience. In fact, a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4023, advises that the holy prophets, peace be upon them, endured the most difficult of tests, and they are undoubtedly the most beloved to Allah, the exalted. If a Muslim follows the steadfast attitude of the righteous predecessors, it is hoped they will end up with them in the hereafter. A sign of love. The holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised that if he was not compelled to perform the migration from Mecca to Medina, thereby making him a migrant, a muhajir, he would have liked to be a helper from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them all. And if people had been told to journey to any valley, he would have gone to the valley of the companions of Medina, the helpers, may Allah be pleased with them. He also once stated that the helpers from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, were part of his household and family. On another occasion, he warned that none loves the helpers of Medina. May Allah be pleased with them, except a believer, and none hates them, except a hypocrite. Whoever loves them is loved by Allah, the Exalted, and whoever hates them is hated by Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 186. There are countless verses and narrations which discuss the high status of all the companions. May Allah be pleased with them and the importance of honoring, loving, and following them under all occasions. A sign of truly loving Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is to love all those who love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, even if this contradicts one's personal opinion about them.
This love includes those who proclaim love through their words and more importantly, through their actions. For example, it is obvious to all that all the household of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with them, all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the righteous predecessors possess this true love. So loving each of them is a duty upon the one who claims love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been proven through many narrations such as the one found in Sahih Bukhari, number 17. It advises that love for the helpers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, meaning the residents of the holy city of Medina is a part of faith and hatred for them is a sign of hypocrisy. In another narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3862, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has clearly warned Muslims not to criticize any of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, as loving them is a sign of loving the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and hating them is a sign of hating the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and Allah, the Exalted. This person will not succeed unless they sincerely repent. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned a similar statement regarding his blessed household, may Allah be pleased with them, in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 143. If a Muslim unjustifiably criticizes any Muslim who demonstrates their love for Allah, the Exalted, it proves their lack of love for Allah, the Exalted. If a Muslim commits a sin, other Muslims should hate the sin, but they should, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, still have love for the sinful Muslim, because of their love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The sign of loving others is to treat them kindly and respectfully. Simply put, one should treat others how they wish people to treat them. In addition, a Muslim should dislike all those who show dislike for those who love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, irrespective of if the person is a relative or a stranger. A Muslim's feelings should never prevent them from fulfilling this sign of true love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This does not mean they should harm them, but they should make it clear to them that hating those who love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is unacceptable. If they persist on this deviant attitude, then one should separate from them until they sincerely repent. The Truth After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, arrived in Medina, Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, a well-respected and knowledgeable Jewish scholar, immediately accepted Islam after seeing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as he recognized his signs mentioned in the previous divine revelations. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 146 Those to whom we gave the scripture know him, i.e., Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as they know their own sons. But indeed, a party of them conceal the truth while they know it. He warned the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that the other Jewish scholars highly respected him, but if they found out that he accepted Islam, they would make up lies about him. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, summoned the Jewish scholars and asked them to admit the fact that they recognized him as the final Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, they denied him. They initially praised Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned him, but after finding out he accepted Islam, they called him a liar. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 194 to 195. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity, meaning they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. 
The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon Him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience, which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Heavenly Characteristics On entering Medina, one of the first things the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the people included, spreading peace, offering food to people, and praying at night when others are sleeping, and promised paradise to them in return. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 1334. The first thing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised was spreading peace. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 12, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised a good quality found within Islam. Namely, to spread the Islamic greeting of peace to people one knows and to those they do not know. It is important to act on this good characteristic, as nowadays Muslims often only spread the Islamic greeting of peace to those they know. It is important to spread it to all, as this leads to love between people and strengthens Islam. In fact, this characteristic leads to paradise, according to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 194. A Muslim should never forget that they will receive a minimum of 10 rewards for every greeting of peace they extend to others, even if others fail to reply to them. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5195. Finally, a Muslim should fulfill the Islamic greeting of peace correctly by demonstrating this peace in their other speech and actions towards others by keeping their verbal and physical harm away from the self and possessions of others. This is in fact, the definition of a true Muslim and believer, according to a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998. The next thing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised was to offer food to people. Allah, the Exalted, gives people according to what they do. For example, the Holy Quran mentions that if one remembers Allah, the Exalted, he in turn will remember them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 152 So remember me, I will remember you. Feeding others for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, is just the same. The one who performs this righteous deed will be fed food from paradise, and whoever gives drink to others will be given drink from paradise on Judgment Day. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2449. When asked about the best type of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6236, that feeding others and greeting others with kind speech are the best traits in Islam. Muslims should make it a top priority to act on this righteous deed and strive to feed others especially, the poor on a regular basis. This is an amazing deed which does not require much wealth. Each person should feed others according to their capacity, even if it is only half a date fruit, as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1417, that this will protect them from the fire of hell on Judgment Day. This leaves people with no excuse from abstaining from this righteous deed. The final thing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised was to offer the night prayer when others are asleep. 
In a divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1145, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, descends every night to the nearest heaven according to his infinite majesty and invites people to ask him to fulfill their needs so that he can fulfill them. Voluntary nighttime worship proves one's sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, as no other eyes are watching them. Offering it is a means to having an intimate conversation with Allah, the Exalted. And it is a sign of one's servanthood to Him. It has countless virtues for example, a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1614, declares that it is the best voluntary prayer. No one will have a rank higher on Judgment Day or in Paradise than the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and this rank has been directly connected to the voluntary night prayer. This shows that those who establish the night voluntary prayer will be blessed with the highest ranks in both worlds. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 79 And from part of the night, pray with it, i.e., recitation of the Quran as additional worship for you. It is expected that your Lord will resurrect you to a praise station. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3579, advises that a Muslim is closest to Allah, the Exalted, in the last part of the night. Therefore, one can derive countless blessings if they remember Allah, the Exalted, at this time. All Muslims desire their supplications to be answered, and their needs to be fulfilled. Therefore, they should strive to offer the voluntary night prayer, as a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1770, advises that there is a special hour in every night when good supplications are always answered. Establishing the voluntary night prayer is an excellent way to prevent one from committing sins, it helps a person to stay away from pointless social gatherings, and it protects a person from many physical illnesses. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3549. One should prepare for the voluntary night prayer by not overeating or drinking especially before bed as it induces laziness. One should not unnecessarily tire themselves out during the day. A short nap during the day can help with this. Finally, one should avoid sins and strive to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience as the obedient find it easier to offer the voluntary night prayer. Complete Submission Some of the companions who were formerly from the people of the book, such as Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with them, desired to act on the teachings of Islam and on those teachings from their previous religion which did not contradict the teachings of Islam. Allah, the Exalted, warned them in the following verses not to behave in this manner, as there is no right guidance except Islam. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verses 208 to 209. O you who have believed, enter into Islam completely and perfectly, and do not follow the footsteps of Satan. Indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. But if you slip deviate after clear proofs have come to you, then know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. This has been discussed in Tafsir al kirchubi Volume 1, page 531. The aim of the devil is to prevent Muslims from acting on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as he knows salvation for them lies in this. Muslims should therefore adhere to these two sources of guidance above all else. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4606, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that any matter which is not based on Islam will be rejected. If Muslims desire lasting success in both worldly and religious matters, they must strictly adhere to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though certain actions which are not directly taken from these two sources of guidance can still be considered a righteous deed, it is important to prioritize these two sources of guidance over all else. Because the fact is that the more one ACTS on things which are not taken from these two sources, even if it is a righteous deed, the less they will act on these two sources of guidance. An obvious example is how many Muslims have adopted cultural practices into their lives which do not have a foundation in these two sources of guidance. Even if these cultural practices are not sins, they have preoccupied Muslims from learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, 
as they feel satisfied with their behavior. This leads to ignorance of the two sources of guidance, which in turn will only lead to misguidance. This is why a Muslim must learn and act on these two sources of guidance, which have been established by the leaders of guidance, and only then act on other voluntary righteous deeds if they have the time and energy to do so. But if they choose ignorance and made up practices, even if they are not sins over learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, they will not achieve success. Love for the world. Many different narrations and incidents have been recorded which discuss the rejection of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Islam by many of the Jewish and Christian scholars of his time, even though they fully believed he was the final Holy Prophet, peace be upon them, whom they recognized through their divine scriptures. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 146 Those to whom we gave the scripture know him, i.e., Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as they know their own sons. But indeed, a party of them conceal the truth while they know it. For example, two Jewish scholars once returned from meeting the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One of them swore by Allah, the Exalted, that he was undoubtedly the final Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, as they recognized him through the signs recorded in their divine scriptures. But then he swore by Allah, the Exalted, that he would treat the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with enmity as long as he lived. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 197. Two major reasons why they behaved in this manner was due to their extreme love for wealth and social status. They understood that accepting the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would mean that they would lose their social influence and the wealth gained from it. They would go from being the leaders of their tribes and religion, to being ordinary followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that craving for wealth and status is more destructive to one's faith than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are set free on a herd of sheep. This shows that hardly any of a Muslim's faith remains secure if they crave after wealth and fame in this world, just as hardly any of the sheep will be saved from two hungry wolves. So this great similitude contains a severe warning against the evil of craving after excess wealth and social status in the world. The first type of craving for wealth is when one has extreme love for wealth and strives without fatigue to acquire it through lawful means. To behave in such a manner is not the sign of wise person, as a Muslim should firmly believe their provision is guaranteed to them, and this allotment can never change. In fact, the provision of the creation was allocated over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. This person will undoubtedly neglect their duties, as they are too preoccupied with obtaining wealth. A body which is too busy acquiring wealth will never prepare adequately for the hereafter. In fact, this person will dedicate so much effort to acquiring wealth that they may not even get a chance to enjoy it. Instead, they will depart this world and leave it behind for other people to enjoy even though they will be held accountable for it. This person may acquire wealth lawfully, but they will still not find peace of mind, as no matter how much they obtain, they will only desire more. This person is needy and therefore a real pauper, even if they possess much wealth. The only craving which is beneficial is craving for accumulating true wealth, namely, righteous deeds, in order to prepare for one's day of return. The second type of craving for wealth is similar to the first type, but in addition to it, this type of person acquires wealth through unlawful means and fails to fulfill the rights of people, such as the obligatory charity. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned against this in many narrations. For example, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6576, he warned that this attitude destroyed the past nations as they made unlawful things lawful, withheld the rights of others, and killed others for the sake of excess wealth. This person strives for the wealth they are not entitled to, which leads to countless major sins. When one adopts this attitude, they become intensely greedy. As warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961, the greedy person is far from Allah, the exalted, far from paradise, far from people, and close to hell. In fact, a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3114, warns that extreme greed and true faith will never combine in the heart of a true Muslim. If a Muslim adopts this type of craving, then the extreme danger of it is clear even to an uneducated Muslim. It will destroy their faith until nothing except a little remains, just like the main narration under discussion warns that this destruction to one's faith is more severe than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are let loose on a herd of sheep. This Muslim risks losing the little faith they possess at the moment of their death, which is the greatest loss. A person's craving for fame and status is arguably more destructive to one's faith than craving for excess wealth. A person will often spend their beloved wealth on obtaining fame and prestige. It is rare for someone to obtain status and fame, and still remain firm on the correct path whereby they prioritize the hereafter over the material world. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6723, warns that a person who seeks status in society, such as leadership, will be left to deal with it themselves, but if someone receives it without asking for it, they will be aided by Allah, the Exalted, in remaining obedient to Him. This is the reason the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would not appoint a person who requested to be appointed in a position of authority, or even showed desire for it. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6923. Another narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7148, warns that people will be keen to obtain status and authority, but it will be a great regret for them on the day of judgment. This is a dangerous craving as it forces one to strive intensely to obtain it and then strive further in order to hold on to it, even if it encourages them to commit oppression and other sins. The worst type of craving for status is when one obtains this through religion. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2654, that this person will go to hell. Therefore, it is safer for a Muslim to avoid the craving for excess wealth and high social status, as they are two things which can lead to the destruction of their faith by distracting them from preparing adequately for the hereafter. Fine allies. After some of the Jewish scholars, such as Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with them, accepted Islam, Many of their tribesmen deserted them and swore not to keep company with them, which was difficult for them, as they were their family and friends. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 5 al maidah verses 55 to 56. Your ally is none but Allah and therefore his messenger and those who have believed, those who establish prayer and give zakah and they bow in worship. And whoever is an ally of Allah and his messenger and those who have believed, indeed the party of Allah, they will be the predominant. When hearing these verses, Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that they accepted Allah, the Exalted, his Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the believers as guardians. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al nuzul 555, page 69. One must join the party of Allah, the Exalted, by adopting sincerity. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, his book, meaning, the Holy Quran, to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to the leaders of society and to the general public. Sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, includes fulfilling all the duties given by him in the form of commands and prohibitions solely for his pleasure. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one, all will be judged by their intention. So if one is not sincere towards Allah, the Exalted, when performing good deeds they will gain no reward in this world or in the next. In fact, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154, those who performed insincere deeds will be told on Judgment Day to seek their reward from those who they acted for, which will not be possible. Chapter 98 al bayna verse 5 And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to him in religion. If one is lax in fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, it proves a lack of sincerity. 
Therefore, they should sincerely repent and struggle to fulfill them all. It is important to bear in mind Allah, the Exalted, never burdens one with duties they cannot perform or handle. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286 Allah does not charge a soul, except with that within its capacity. Being sincere towards Allah, the Exalted, means that one should always choose his pleasure over the pleasure of themselves and others. A Muslim should always give priority to those actions which are for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, over all else. One should love others and dislike their sins for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and not for the sake of their own desires. When they help others or refuse to take part in sins, it should be for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The one who adopts this mentality has perfected their faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. Sincerity towards the Holy Quran includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship, and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 al hash verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is being sincere to the leaders of the community. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. 
one should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. The final thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is sincerity towards the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people that one is pleased when they are happy and sad whenever they are grieved as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53. Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77. And do good as Allah has done good to you. The First Friday Sermon in Medina. The following is the sermon of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, given on the first Friday he prayed in Medina. Praise be to Allah the Exalted, I give him praise and I ask his help. I ask for his forgiveness and for his guidance. I believe in him, will not disbelieve in him, and will do battle with those who do. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, that he has no associate, that Muhammad is his servant and messenger whom he has sent with guidance and the religion of truth and light. At a time without messengers, when there is little knowledge, the people are misguided, when the time is out of joint, and the day of retribution and fate is at hand. Whoever obeys Allah, the Exalted, and His Messenger is rightly guided. Whoever disobeys Allah, the Exalted, and His Messenger is misled, and has erred and gone far astray. I charge you to fear Allah, the Exalted. This is the best advice a Muslim can give a Muslim, to urge him onto the afterlife, to order him to fear Allah, the Exalted. Beware of what Allah, the Exalted, has Himself cautioned you. There is no better advice nor charge than this. It is an act of piety for those who accomplish this, with apprehension and fear, and a true means of assistance towards your aspirations for the afterlife. Whoever cultivates, both openly and in secret, his relationship with Allah, the Exalted, seeking only His favor thereby, shall receive recognition in the short term and reward after death when a man will wish he had done differently than he had done before, and would want to put great distance between himself and that behavior. Allah, the Exalted, bids you beware of him, though he is merciful towards his worshippers. 
Whoever believes his words and fulfills his promise will find nothing taken back therefrom for Allah, the exalted states. Whatever I say shall not be changed, and I am not unjust towards my worshippers. Chapter 50 Kaf, verse 29 Fear Allah, the exalted, both in matters that are at hand and those that follow, in secret and openly, for Whoever fears Allah, Allah will remove his evil ways from him and give him a great reward. Chapter 65 at Talak, verse 5 and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will have won a mighty success. Chapter 33 Al-Azab, verse 71. Fearing Allah, the exalted, will forestall his disapproval, his punishment and his anger. Fearing Allah, the exalted, will bring satisfaction, please the Lord and elevate one's status. Take advantage of your good fortune and do not be lax in matters pertaining to Allah, the exalted. Allah, the Exalted, has instructed you in his book, laid out for you his path, so that he may make evident those who speak the truth and those who lie. Do good, just as Allah, the Exalted, does good to you. Oppose his enemies and strive energetically for Allah, the Exalted. It is he who chose you and named you Muslims, so that those who perish do so with evident cause, while those who live do so with evident cause. There is no power but with Allah, the Exalted. Make frequent mention of Allah, the Exalted. Strive for what comes after death. For he who makes good his relationship with Allah, the Exalted, will find his relationship with people satisfactory. That is because Allah, the Exalted, passes judgment upon people, while they do not pass judgment upon him. It is he who controls people, while they do not control him. Allah, the Exalted, is truly great. There is no power but with Allah, the Exalted and Glorious. This has been recorded in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 197 to 199. Best Places on Earth The Mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in Medina, was initially built with bricks above which was a light roof made of palm leaves. Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, made no improvements to it during his caliphate. But during his caliphate Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, enlarged it, rebuilding it in the same manner as in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that is with bricks and palm leaves and he also restored its wooden pillars. During his caliphate Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, made changes and major additions. He had its walls built with cut stone and plaster, its pillars of stone and its roof of teak. He was putting into effect the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 738. It advises that whoever builds a mosque for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, even as small as a sparrow's nest or smaller, Allah, the Exalted, will build for them a house in paradise. This has been discussed in Imam ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, volume 2, pages 201-202. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1528, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the most beloved places to Allah, the Exalted, are the mosques and the most hated places to him are the marketplaces. Islam does not prohibit Muslims from going to places other than the mosques, nor does it command them to always inhabit the mosques. But it is important that they prioritize attending mosques for the congregational prayers, and attending religious gatherings over visiting the marketplaces unnecessarily. When a need arises, there is no harm to attend other places, such as shopping centers, but a Muslim should avoid going to them unnecessarily, as they are places where sins more often occur. Whereas, the mosques are meant to be a sanctuary from sins and a comfortable place to obey Allah, the Exalted, in. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. Just like a student benefits from a library, as it is an environment created for studying similarly, Muslims can benefit from mosques, as their very purpose is to encourage Muslims to obtain and act on useful knowledge so that they can obey Allah, the Exalted. Not only should a Muslim prioritize the mosques over other places, but they should encourage others such as their children to do the same. In fact, it is an excellent place for the youth to avoid sins, crimes and bad company, which lead to nothing but trouble and regret in both worlds. Simple Housing The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
built apartments around his mosque which would be dwellings for himself and his family. These were small dwellings with narrow courtyards. They were short in size, as an adult could touch the highest ceiling in these apartments while standing. This has been recorded in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 207. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2482, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that all lawful spending gains reward from Allah, the Exalted, except the wealth which is spent on buildings. This includes all spending on lawful things, which is free from excessiveness, waste or extravagance. Spending on construction, which is necessary, is not included in this narration, but the construction which is beyond one's needs is. This is disliked as spending on construction easily leads to waste and extravagance. In addition, the one who spends wealth on construction is less likely to donate charity and spend in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. Also this behavior often leads a Muslim to adopt hopes for a long life, as the one who believes their stay in this world is extremely short will not waste energy and wealth on constructing a beautiful home. The greater one's hope for a long life, the less righteous deeds they will perform, believing they can always perform good deeds in the future. It also causes one to delay sincere repentance, believing they can always change for the better in the future. Finally, it causes one to dedicate more efforts to the world in order to create a more comfortable life for their supposed long stay in this world. Actively taking part in unnecessary construction occupies one's time which prevents them from performing voluntary righteous deeds, such as fasting and the voluntary night prayer out of extreme fatigue. It also prevents them from striving to gain and act on Islamic knowledge. Finally, in reality, taking part in unnecessary construction never ends. Meaning, the moment a person completes one part of their home, they move to the next until the cycle repeats itself. Therefore, Muslims should adhere to what is within their necessity in respect to all things, not just construction, so that they can avoid these negative consequences. Call to Success After the construction of the Mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the people needed to be alerted to when the congregational prayers at the mosque were about to begin. Some suggestions were made, such as using a horn or a bell, but these were rejected by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, as he did not desire to imitate the people of the book. Someone suggested that a person should call out when the congregational prayer was about to commence. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, favored this option. Abdullah bin Zayed, may Allah be pleased with him, saw a dream where a person dictated to him what the call of prayer should consist of. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, also experienced a similar dream. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded Bilal bin Rabah, may Allah be pleased with him, to make the call for the congregational prayer. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 731 to 733. The first thing to note is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, chose an Ethiopian former slave to give the call to prayer someone who was often looked down by the wider society of Arabia because of his ethnicity and social status. This indicates the importance of equality in Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead, he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this narration indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though, many Muslims have erected these barriers, such as social castes and sects thereby believing some are better than others, 
Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. Finally, this incident also indicates the importance of attending the mosques for the sake of education and offering the obligatory prayers with the congregation. The Holy Quran indicates the importance of offering the obligatory prayers with congregation usually at a mosque. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah verse 43 and bow with those who bow in worship and obedience. In fact, due to this verse and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, some reliable scholars have declared this obligatory on Muslim men. For example, one narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 550, clearly warns that the Muslims who would not offer their obligatory prayers with congregation at the mosque were considered hypocrites by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even threatened to burn the houses of the men who failed to perform their obligatory prayers at the mosque with congregation without a valid excuse. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1482. Those Muslims who are in a position to perform this important deed should do so. They should not fool themselves into claiming they are performing other righteous deeds, such as helping their family with house chores. Even though this is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, according to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 676, but it is important not to rearrange the importance of his traditions according to one's desires. Whoever does this is not following his traditions, they are only following their own desires, even if they are performing a righteous deed. In fact, this same narration concludes by advising that when it was time for the obligatory prayer, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would leave for the mosque. Kind Treatment The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, drew up a contract between the different Muslim and non-Muslim groups of Medina. It included that the non-Muslims of Medina, such as the Jews, must never be mistreated, nor should a Muslim help someone acting against them unjustly. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 213. In a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the signs of a true Muslim and a true believer. A true Muslim is the one who keeps their verbal and physical harm away from others. This in fact, includes all people irrespective of their faith. It includes all types of verbal and physical sins which can cause harm or distress to another. This can include failing to give the best advice to others, as this contradicts sincerity towards others which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan an Nasai, number 4204. It includes advising others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, thereby inviting them towards sins. A Muslim should avoid this behavior as they will be taken account for every person who ACTS on their bad advice. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. Physical harm includes causing problems for other people's livelihood, committing fraud, conning others and physical abuse. All of these characteristics contradict Islamic teachings and must be avoided. A true believer, according to the main narration under discussion, is the one who keeps their harm away from the lives and property of others. Again, this applies to all people irrespective of their faith. 
This includes stealing, misusing or damaging the property and belongings of others. Whenever one is entrusted with someone else's property, they must ensure they only use it with the owner's permission and in a way which is pleasing and agreeable to the owner. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan an nasa number 5421, that whoever illegally takes someone else's property through a false oath, even if it is as small as a twig of a tree will go to hell. To conclude, a Muslim must support their verbal declaration of belief with actions as they are the physical proof of one's belief which will be needed in order to obtain success on the Day of Judgment. In addition, a Muslim should fulfill the characteristics of true belief in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. An excellent way of achieving this in respect to people is to simply treat others how they wish to be treated by people, which is with respect and peace. Brotherhood the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, established brotherhood between his fellow emigrants, the Mahajirin and the helpers, the answers, may Allah be pleased with them all. He advised them to become brothers in the cause of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 215. With the passing of time, people become divided and lose the strong connection they once had with one another. There are many causes of this, but a major cause is the foundation on which their connection was formed by their parents and relatives. It is commonly known that when the foundation of a building is weak, the building will either get damaged over time or even collapse. Similarly, when the foundation of bonds connecting people are not correct, the bonds between them will eventually weaken or even break. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, brought the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Together he formed the bonds between them for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, most Muslims today bring people together for the sake of tribalism, brotherhood and to show off to other families. Even though the majority of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not related, but as the foundation of the bonds connecting them was correct namely, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, their bonds grew from strength to strength. Whereas, many Muslims nowadays are related by blood yet, with the passing of time, become separated, as the foundation of their bonds was based on falsehood namely, tribalism and similar things. Muslims must understand that if desire for their bonds to endure and to earn reward for fulfilling the important duty of upholding the ties of kinship and the rights of non-relatives, then they must only forge bonds for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The foundation of this is that people only connect with one another and act together in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This has been commanded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Two parts of gratitude. The emigrants of Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, once complimented the helpers of Medina, May Allah be pleased with them, to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. They said that they had never been to a people who gave more help to them, and yet desired nothing in return than the helpers of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them. They added that the helpers of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, spared them of much difficulty and shared their comfort with them. They concluded that they were afraid that the helpers of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, would receive all the reward of Allah, the Exalted. And they, the emigrants of Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, would receive nothing, as they were not in a position to reciprocate. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that the emigrants of Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, would receive reward as they correctly praised and supplicated for the helpers of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 217. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1954, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever is not grateful to people, cannot be grateful to Allah, the Exalted. Even though there is no doubt that the source of all blessings is none other than Allah, the Exalted, nonetheless showing gratitude to people is an important aspect of Islam. This is because Allah, the Exalted, sometimes uses a person as a means to help others such as one's parents. As the means has been created and used by Allah, the Exalted, 
Being grateful to them is in fact being grateful to Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, Muslims must show good character and always show appreciation for any aid or support they receive from others irrespective of its size. They should show gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, by using the blessing according to His commands, as He is the source of the blessing, and show gratitude to the person, as they are the means which was created and chosen by Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should show gratitude verbally to people, and practically, by repaying their act of kindness, according to their means, even if it is only a supplication on their behalf. This has been advised in a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 216. The person who does not show gratitude to people cannot show true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, and therefore they will not be given an increase in blessings. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. If a Muslim desires an increase in blessings, they must fulfill both aspects of gratitude, namely, to Allah, the Exalted, and to people. Unparalleled Generosity The companions of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, once requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to divide their orchards of palm trees equally between them and the companions of Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them. He did not decide to cause stress to them, so instead advised them to retain ownership, and instead allow the companions of Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, to work with them on their lands, and then divide the produce of the land between them. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3782. This verse is connected to chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92. Never will you attain the good reward, until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And whatever you spend, indeed Allah is knowing of it. This verse makes it clear that a person cannot be a true believer, meaning, they will possess a defect in their faith, until they are willing to dedicate the things they love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Even though many believe this verse applies to wealth, but it in fact means much more. It includes every blessing which a Muslim likes and loves. For example, Muslims are happy to dedicate their precious time on the things which please them. But they refuse to dedicate time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, beyond the obligatory duties which barely takes an hour or two in one's day. Countless Muslims are happy to dedicate their physical strength in different pleasurable activities, yet, many of them refuse to dedicate it to the things which please Allah, the Exalted, such as voluntary fasting. More commonly, People are happy to strive in things which they desire, like obtaining excess wealth which they do not need, even if it means they have to do overtime and give up their sleep. Yet how many strive in this way in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience? How many give up their precious sleep in order to offer voluntary prayers? It is strange that Muslims desire lawful, worldly and religious blessings yet overlook a simple fact that they will only gain these things when they dedicate the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. How can they dedicate minimal things to Him and still expect to achieve all their dreams? This attitude is truly strange. Earning provision Even though the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, shared their wealth and homes with the companions from Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, the latter did not become lazy and dependent on others. Rather, they worked hard to earn lawful provision in order to provide for themselves and others. For example, Sa'd ibn al-Rabi offered half his wealth to Abdur Rahman bin Auf, may Allah be pleased with them, but the latter kindly declined and instead headed for the marketplace to earn his lawful provision. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2048. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, allocated all things such as provision to all creatures over 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. It is important to understand that there are two aspects in respect to all situations, such as gaining one's provision. The first aspect is what Allah, the Exalted, has decided meaning, destiny. This will occur and nothing in creation can prevent this from occurring. As this is out of a person's hands, it makes no sense to stress over this aspect, 
as they have no influence on destiny irrespective of what they or anybody else does. The second aspect is one's own efforts. This aspect a person has full control over, and they should therefore concentrate on this aspect by using the means they have been provided, such as their physical strength to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience, which they have no control over, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to gain lawful provision in order to fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents while avoiding the unlawful, excess, waste and extravagance. To conclude, a Muslim should never waste time stressing over things they have no control or influence over. Instead they should use the means they possess and act on those things which they have control over according to the teachings of Islam. This is what Allah, the Exalted, has commanded. True Knowledge in Medina, most of the Jewish scholars arrogantly rejected Islam and were full of antagonism towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. They were those who asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, many pointless questions in order to confuse others and express their obstinacy and disbelief. They made things difficult for Islam and tried tirelessly to extinguish it, even though they recognize the truthfulness of Islam. Chapter 6 Al-Anam, verse 20 Those to whom we have given the scripture recognize it, the Holy Quran, as they recognize their own sons. And chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 146 Those to whom we gave the scripture know him, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as they know their own sons. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 227. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 253, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the one who obtains religious knowledge in order to show off to scholars, argue with others or attract attention to themselves will go to hell. Even though, the foundation of all good in both worldly and religious matters is knowledge. Muslims must understand that knowledge will only benefit them when they firstly correct their intention. Meaning, they strive to obtain and act on knowledge in order to please Allah, the Exalted. All other reasons will only lead to a loss of reward and even punishment if a Muslim fails to sincerely repent. In reality, knowledge is like rainwater which falls on different types of trees. Some trees grow by this water in order to benefit others such as a fruit tree. Whereas other trees grow by this water and become a nuisance to others such as a thorny tree. Even though, the rainwater is the same in both cases but the outcome is very different. Similarly, religious knowledge is the same for people but if one adopts the incorrect intention then it will become a means of their destruction. Conversely, if one adopts the correct intention, it will become a means of their salvation. Muslims should therefore correct their intention in all matters as they will be judged on this. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. And they should remember that one of the first people to enter hell will be a scholar who only obtained knowledge in order to show off to others. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4923. To conclude, only obtaining and acting on useful knowledge with the correct intention is true beneficial knowledge. Two-faced It is well known that apart from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and those who openly disbelieved, a third group emerged in Medina who were known as the hypocrites. They pretended to accept Islam outwardly in order to reap the rewards of being a Muslim, but were disbelievers as they rejected Islam internally and secretly. They possessed many evil traits which have been discussed extensively in the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. For example, one of them would attentively listen to the Holy Quran being recited by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, while secretly planning against Islam with his fellow hypocrites. This man once stated that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was just an ear who believed anything which was said to him. At this Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 9 at Torba, verse 61. And among them are those who abuse the Prophet and say, He is an ear. Say, 
It is an ear of goodness for you that believes in Allah and believes the believers, and is a mercy to those who believe among you. And those who abuse the Messenger of Allah, for them is a painful punishment. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al nuzul 9-6162, pages 88-89. A sign of hypocrisy is being two-faced. This is the one who changes their behavior in order to please different groups of people, intending thereby to gain some worldly things. They speak with many different tongues, showing their support to different people, while harboring dislike for them. They fail to be sincere towards people, which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. If they fail to repent, they will find themselves in the hereafter, with two tongues of fire. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4873. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 14. When they meet the believers, they say, we believe, but when they meet their evil companions in privacy, they say, surely we are with you, we were merely jesting. Causing disunity. When the non-Muslims of Mecca became aware that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had established an Islamic state in Medina and even signed treaties with the local non-Muslims, they sent a threatening letter to the chief of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, warning him to fight and expel the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, otherwise they would launch a military campaign against him and destroy Medina. Abdullah gathered some of his cronies in order to challenge the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, talked them down and reminded them that the non-Muslims of Mecca were only trying to cause problems between them. Abdullah bin Ubay and his followers did back down, but he continued harboring ill feelings towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 199. A sign of hypocrisy is that a person spreads corruption in society. This negative characteristic affects all social levels beginning from a family unit and ending at the international level. This type of person dislikes seeing people uniting on good as this may cause the worldly status of others to increase beyond their own. This drives them to backbiting and slander in order to cause people to turn against each other. Their evil attitude destroys their own ties of kinship and when they observe other families who are happy, it drives them to destroy their happiness also. They are fault finders who dedicate their time unveiling the mistakes of others in order to drag their social status down. They are the first people to begin gossiping about others and act deaf whenever good things are spoken about. Peace and quiet disturbs them, so they seek to create problems in order to entertain themselves. They fail to remember the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2546. It advises that whoever covers the faults of others Allah, the Exalted, will cover their faults. But whoever seeks out and unveils the faults of others Allah, the Exalted, will expose their faults to the people. So in realty, this type of person is only unveiling their own faults to society, even though they believe they are exposing the faults of others. Divine Guardianship Initially, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was guarded by his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, especially at night, as they feared a surprise attack from their enemies. Thereafter Allah, the Exalted, revealed the following words in Chapter 5 al maida verse 67. And Allah will protect you from the people. After this, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, not to guard him thereafter, as Allah, the Exalted, was guarding him. This has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3046. Allah, the Exalted, safeguards and preserves the creation and takes care of them with special care. He protects the obedient from the plots and traps of the devil, and he safeguards the disobedient from his immediate punishment, in order to give them an opportunity to sincerely repent. A Muslim should act on this divine name by using the means provided to them by Allah, the Exalted, but always trust in his divine care and choices in every situation and outcome they face, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind some choices. This inspires patience and even contentment with the choice of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 65 at Talak verse 3. 
and whoever relies upon Allah, then he is sufficient for him. A Muslim should also understand that they will only be protected from misguidance and punishment by the guardian namely, Allah, the Exalted. This removes any signs of pride and ensures they seek his protection through sincere obedience to him. A Muslim must act on this divine name by safeguarding every trust they possess, such as their blessings, by using them according to the teachings of Islam. They should safeguard their actions and speech from the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. This will ensure they receive more blessings from Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. Importance of good business The main trading markets were controlled by the Jews, who took part in unlawful and unjust practices, such as usury. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then established a marketplace near his mosque. He outlined the importance of just and fair business dealings, so that the people would trade fairly with one another. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 923 to 925. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2146, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that merchants will be raised as a moral people on Judgment Day, except those who fear Allah, the Exalted, act righteously and speak the truth. This narration applies to all those who take part in business transactions. It is extremely important to fear Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This includes treating others kindly according to the teachings of Islam. In respect to business dealings, a Muslim should be honest in their speech by disclosing all the details of the transaction to all who are involved. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2079, warns that when Muslims hide things in financial transactions, such as defects in their goods, it will lead to a loss in blessings. Acting righteously includes not striving to con others by making them pay excessively for goods. A Muslim should simply treat others how they desire to be treated meaning, with honesty and full disclosure. The same way, a Muslim would not like to be mistreated in financial matters, they should not mistreat others. Those conducting business should always avoid lying, as it leads to immorality, and immortality leads to hell. In fact, a person will keep telling and acting on lies until they are recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971. Permission to fight. As the enemies of Islam, the non-Muslims of Mecca, were persisting in aggression towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Allah, the Exalted, granted the Muslims permission to fight in self-defense and for the sake of establishing peace and justice. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 39. Permission to fight has been given to those who are being fought, because they were wronged. And indeed, Allah is competent to give them victory. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 200 to 201. It is vital to understand that in order to correctly understand the meanings of the verses of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, one must place them in their correct context. Meaning, no verse or narration can be taken in isolation without observing the context in which it was revealed in order to justify someone's actions. In order to correctly understand the context, one must assess the verses and narrations which are linked to it in the light of the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Only in this way will it become clear what or who a specific verse or narration refers to. In addition, Muslims can only take up arms against external aggressors under the banner of a legitimate ruler, and when it is done according to the injunctions found within the Holy Quran and traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Those who fight must constantly fear Allah, the Exalted, in crossing these limits and rules. One such rule is to resort to war only when one is attacked, as indicated by the main verse under discussion. Therefore, Showing physical aggression against an enemy in a state of peace is forbidden. Another rule is that when the enemy desists from aggression, then Muslims must desist also. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 193. 
but if they cease, then there is to be no aggression, i.e. assault, except against the violators. If the enemy desires peace, it must be granted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 90. So if they remove themselves from you and do not fight you and offer you peace, then Allah has not made for you a cause for fighting against them. The third rule is that civilians are not to be harmed. This has been indicated by the main verse under discussion, as this is transgressing. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, repeatedly forbade women, children, elders and the sick, as well as monks and hermits to be harmed during war. This has been confirmed in many narrations such as the one found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2614, and Musnad Ahmad, number 2728. The first caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased him, forbade the killing of children, women, and the elderly. He forbade the cutting of fruit-bearing trees, damaging property, and the killing of cattle. This has been advised in Muzanif ibn Abi Shaiba, number 33,121. The second caliph of Islam, Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, made it clear to the Muslim armies not to harm non-soldiers such as a farmer. This has been advised in Muzanif ibn Abi Shaiba, number 33,120. In case of impending conflict, the Muslim nation are commanded to prepare as best as they can. This preparation aims to deter the enemy from attacking, in which case, if the enemy wish for peace, it must be granted to them. Chapter 8 in Anval, verses 60 to 61. And prepare against them whatever you are able of power and of steeds of war by which you may terrify the enemy of Allah and your enemy, and if they incline to peace, then incline to it also. Permission is granted to fight those who do not honor their treaties with the Muslims. Chapter 9 at Torba, verses 12 to 13. And if they break their oaths after their treaty and defame your religion, then combat the leaders of disbelief, for indeed there are no oaths sacred to them, fight them that they might cease. Would you not fight against a people who broke their oaths and determined to expel the messenger, and they had begun the attack upon you the first time? Islam has forbade attacking those who respect their treaties. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 7. So as long as they are upright toward you, be upright toward them. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear him. There is no question of forcing anyone to accept Islam, as it is something which must be accepted by one's heart, not only through one's tongue and actions. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 256. There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. Those who are at peace with the Muslims are to be treated with justice at all times. Chapter 60 Al-Mumtahana, verses 8 to 9. Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion and do not expel you from your homes, from being righteous toward them and acting justly toward them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. Allah only forbids you from those who fight you because of religion and expel you from your homes and aid in your expulsion. War is hateful to Allah, the exalted, and Muslims must be forced into it and not desire it. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216. Battle has been enjoined upon you, while it is hateful to you. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even warned Muslims not to desire fighting, and instead commanded them to desire safety from Allah, the Exalted. But if they were forced to encounter the enemy, then they must remain steadfast. This has been mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2966. The real intent of these verses is to stress that force should be used only when its use is unavoidable, only to the extent that is absolutely necessary, and under the guidance of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. As mentioned earlier, it is vital to assess a verse or a narration in its right context in order to understand who, what and where it applies. Unfortunately, many people, intentionally or unintentionally, fail to interpret the verses and narrations on fighting in this way. One very famous example is of a verse which is referred to as the sword verse, even though the word sword is not mentioned in the Holy Quran. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 5. And when the inviolable months have passed, 
Then kill the polytheists wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit in wait for them at every place of ambush. As explained earlier in detail, even this statement of war is restricted to specific conditions and concessions of peace. In addition, studying the historical context of this and other related verses clearly prove that it is not a universal principle for fighting non-Muslims. Meaning, the verse refers to a specific group of people, at a specific time and in a specific place. The surrounding verses of the sword verse clearly indicate multiple times that the polytheists referred to are only those who repeatedly violated their peace treaties with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and engaged in ACTS of violent aggression against the Muslim community and its allies. For example, the verse immediately before the sword verse, meaning chapter 9 at Torba, verse 4, states, Accepted are those with whom you made a treaty among the polytheists, and then they have not been deficient toward you in anything or supported anyone against you, so complete for them their treaty until their term has ended. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear him. This is followed by another command in a related verse, chapter 9 at Torba, verse 7. How can there be for the polytheists a treaty in the sight of Allah and with his messenger, except for those with whom you made a treaty at Al-Masjid Al-Haram? So as long as they are upright toward you, be upright toward them. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear him. The crimes of these polytheists whom fighting was commanded against are mentioned in other related verses. Chapter 9 at Torba, verses 8 to 10. How? Can there be a treaty, while if they gain dominance over you, they do not observe concerning you any pact of kinship or covenant of protection? They satisfy you with their mouths, but their hearts refuse compliance, and most of them are defiantly disobedient. They have exchanged the signs of Allah for a small price, and averted people from his way. Indeed, it was evil that they were doing. They do not observe toward a believer any pact of kinship or covenant of protection. And it is they who are the transgressors. And chapter 9 at Torba, verses 12 to 13. And if they break their oaths after their treaty and defame your religion, then combat the leaders of disbelief, for indeed there are no oaths sacred to them, fight them that they might cease. Would you not fight against a people who broke their oaths and determined to expel the messenger, and they had begun the attack upon you the first time. Theses specific polytheists continuously broke their agreements and aided others against Islam. They began hostilities against the Muslims, prevented people from accepting Islam, expelled Muslims from Mecca and Masjid al-Haram. At least eight times in the quoted verses, their crimes against the Muslims are mentioned. In chapter 9 Torba, verse 12, which is quoted above, the goal of fighting the leaders of disbelief is so they cease from their ACTS of aggression. These verses, like the rest, indicate the importance of adhering to specific conditions during times of war, such as fighting only those who fight them first. In addition, these polytheists were still offered many warnings and concessions. They were given a four-month period of respite and peace. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 2. So travel freely, O disbelievers, throughout the land during four months, but know that you cannot cause failure to Allah. And chapter 9 at Torba, verse 5. And when the inviolable four months have passed, then kill the polytheists wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit in wait for them at every place of ambush. This respite was given so that they either accept Islam or peacefully leave the Arabian Peninsula. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was commanded to grant protection to any of these polytheists who request it, so that they have the opportunity to listen to the teachings of Islam without any fear or pressure, or they could peacefully leave the Arabian Peninsula without the fear of being harmed. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 6. And if any one of the polytheists seeks your protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the words of Allah, i.e. the Quran then deliver him to his place of safety. That is because they are a people who do not know. The command in the sword verse of fighting and killing these polytheists would only come into effect if they remained in the Arabian Peninsula after the four-month respite without accepting Islam. It is important to note that many of the polytheists
took advantage of this respite and accepted Islam. Because of this respite, fighting came to an end and no blood was actually shed on account of the sword verse, as the aim of this verse was to act as a deterrent from further bloodshed meaning either these polytheists accept Islam or leave the Arabian Peninsula peacefully. To conclude, the surrounding verses and the blessed life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, place the sword verse in its correct context. Meaning, these verses were specifically revealed in order to put an end to attacks from specific hostile polytheists against the Muslim community. Therefore, they cannot be blankly applied to others after them. The second year after migration. Always facing Allah, the exalted. In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, the direction of the prayer, the Qibla, was changed from Masjid Aqsa in Jerusalem to the Kaaba in Mecca. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, desired this change and showed his desire by turning his blessed face towards the heavens. Then Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 144. We have certainly seen the turning of your face toward the heaven, and we will surely turn you to a Qibla with which you will be pleased. So turn your face, i.e. yourself, toward Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And wherever you believers are, turn your faces, i.e. yourselves, toward it in prayer. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 248. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 528, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the five obligatory prayers erase one's sins just like taking a bath five times a day would clean the body of dirt. The first thing to note is that this narration refers to minor sins only as major sins require sincere repentance. In addition, it is important for Muslims to not only purify their outer beings of minor sins by establishing the five obligatory prayers, but also fulfill the other aspect of purification namely, inner purification. This is indicated by the fact that the five obligatory prayers were spread across the day instead of being put together. Meaning, a Muslim should repeatedly inwardly turn to Allah, the Exalted, throughout the day, just like their body turns to Allah, the Exalted, five times a day, through the obligatory prayers. This inner purification involves correcting one's intention, so that they are only perform actions in order to please Allah, the Exalted. This is the foundation of Islam and is what Allah, the Exalted, assesses when judging an action. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. Those who act for the sake of other people will be told to gain their reward from them on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. Finally, this inner purification includes learning and acting on the teachings of Islam so that one removes the bad characteristics they possess, such as envy, and instead adopt good characteristics, such as patience. The outer purification is important but if a Muslim desires to achieve success and overcome all difficulties in both worlds, they must purify their inner being as well as their outer being. The Prayer Direction In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, the direction of the prayer, the Qibla, was changed from Masjid Aqsa in Jerusalem to the Kaaba in Mecca. Allah, the Exalted, declared the purpose of having two prayer directions, one after the other, in chapter 2 al-Baqarah, verse 143. And we did not make the Qibla which you used to face, except that we might make evident who would follow the messenger from who would turn back on his heels. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, volume 2, page 249. The purpose of having two prayer directions, one after the other, was to make apparent who was truly sincere to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by following him in the change. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship, and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 Al-Kalam, verse 4. 
and indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 Al-Hash, verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. Good effort. In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, the direction of the prayer, the Qibla, was changed from Masjid Aqsa in Jerusalem to the Kaaba in Mecca. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, whether the prayers of the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who died before the change in the prayer direction would be accepted. Allah the Exalted then revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 143. And never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith, i.e. your previous prayers. Indeed Allah is to the people kind and merciful. This has been recorded in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2964. This incident is connected to chapter 11, HUD, verse 115. Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. This verse provides hope that as long as one strives to do something lawful and beneficial, their efforts will not be wasted. If Allah, the Exalted, does not waste the efforts of people who do not even believe in Him, why would He not support the Muslims who believe in His oneness and Lordship? If Allah, the Exalted, does not waste the efforts of people when they strive for the material world, how can He then waste the efforts of those who strive to achieve good in the hereafter? People should therefore never give up striving to achieve good in both this world and in the next. Unfortunately, some Muslims have given up struggling to earn a lawful income after facing some hardship. They instead opt to receive social benefits and become a burden on society. Those who are rightly entitled to receive benefits should continue to utilize them as it is their right. But those who have the ability to earn for themselves should do so. This verse also encourages Muslims to continue doing good to others, even if they do not appreciate their efforts. If one ACTS with sincerity meaning, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, they should be confident their efforts have been recorded and will be rewarded in both worlds. To conclude, whatever lawful action a Muslim performs whether it's worldly, such as a business opportunity, or whether they perform a religious deed, they should put full effort into it knowing that Allah, the Exalted, will support them and grant them success, sooner or later. Establishing the prayers is faith. In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, the direction of the prayer, the Qibla, was changed from Masjid Aqsa in Jerusalem to the Kaaba in Mecca. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, whether the prayers of the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who died before the change in the prayer direction would be accepted. Allah the Exalted then revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 143. And never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith, i.e. your previous prayers. Indeed Allah is to the people kind and merciful. This has been recorded in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2964. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, 
use the word faith in place of the prayers in this verse. This indicates that one cannot possess true faith without establishing the obligatory prayers. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2618, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the difference between belief and disbelief is abandoning the obligatory prayers. In this day and age, this has become far too common. Many give up their obligatory prayers for trivial reasons, all of which are undoubtedly rejected. If the obligation of the prayer has not been removed for the one who is engaging in battle, how can it be removed from anyone else? Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 102. And when you, i.e. the commander of an army are among them and lead them in prayer, let a group of them stand in prayer with you and let them carry their arms. And when they have prostrated, let them be in position behind you and have the other group come forward which has not yet prayed and let them pray with you, taking precaution and carrying their arms. Neither is the traveler or the sick exempt from offering their obligatory prayers. The traveler has been advised to reduce the amount of cycles in some of the obligatory prayers in order to reduce the burden for them, but they have not been exempt from offering them. Chapter 4 and Nissa, verse 101. And when you travel throughout the land, there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer. The sick have been advised to perform dry ablution if contact with water will harm them. Chapter 5 al Maida, verse 6. But if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself, or you have contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it. In addition, the sick can perform the obligatory prayer in a way which is easier for them. Meaning, if they cannot stand, they are allowed to sit, and if they cannot sit, they can lay down and offer the obligatory prayer. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 372. But again, no complete exemption is granted to the sick unless one is mentally ill, which prevents them from comprehending the obligation of the prayer. The other major issue is that some Muslims delay their obligatory prayers and offer them beyond their correct times. This clearly contradicts the Holy Quran, as the believers have been described as those who offer their obligatory prayers on time. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 103. Indeed, prayer has been decreed upon the believers a decree of specified times. Many believe that the following verse of the Holy Quran refers to those who unnecessarily delay their obligatory prayers. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, volume 10, pages 603 to 604. Chapter 107 al Ma'an, verses 4 to 5. So woe to those who pray, but who are heedless of their prayer. Here Allah, the Exalted, has clearly cursed those who have adopted this evil trait. How can one find success in this world or the next if they have been removed from the mercy of Allah, the Exalted? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 512, that delaying one's obligatory prayers unnecessarily is a sign of hypocrisy. The Holy Quran has made it clear that one of the main reasons people will enter hell is failing to establish the obligatory prayers. Chapter 74 al Mudathir, verses 42 to 43. And asking them, what put you into Sakal? They will say, we were not of those who prayed. Abandoning the obligatory prayers is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2621, that whoever commits this sin has disbelieved in Islam. In addition, no other good deed will benefit a Muslim until their obligatory prayers are not established. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 553, clearly warns that one's good deeds are destroyed if they miss the afternoon obligatory prayer. If this is the case for abandoning one obligatory prayer, can one imagine the penalty of abandoning them all? Observing the obligatory prayers at their correct times has been advised to be one of the most beloved deeds to Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 252. From this one can determine that delaying the obligatory prayers beyond their time or completely missing them is one of the most hated deeds by Allah, the Exalted. 
It is an important duty for all elders to encourage the children under their care, to offer the obligatory prayers from a young age, so that they establish them before it becomes legally binding on them. Those adults that delay this and wait until children are older have failed in this extremely important duty. The children who were only encouraged to offer the obligatory prayers when it became obligatory on them very rarely established them quickly. In most cases, it takes years for them to fulfill this important duty correctly. And the blame falls on the elders of the family especially, the parents. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 495, that families most encourage their children to offer the obligatory prayers when they turn seven years old. Another major issue many Muslims face is that they may offer the obligatory prayers but fail to do so correctly. For example, many do not complete the stages of the prayer correctly and instead rush through it. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 757, clearly warns that the one who prays like this has not prayed at all. Meaning, they are not recorded as a person who offered their prayer, and therefore their obligation has not been fulfilled. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 265, clearly warns that the prayer of the one who does not settle in each position of the prayer is not accepted. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the one who does not bow or prostrate correctly in the prayer as the worst thief. This has been warned in a narration found in Mawata Malik, book number 9, narration number 75. Unfortunately, many Muslims who have spent decades offering their obligatory and many voluntary prayers like this will find that none of them have counted, and thus they will be treated as one who did not fulfill their obligation. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1313. The Holy Quran indicates the importance of offering the obligatory prayers with congregation usually at a mosque. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 43 And bow with those who bow in worship and obedience. In fact, due to this verse and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, some reliable scholars have declared this obligatory on Muslim men. For example, one narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 550, clearly warns that the Muslims who would not offer their obligatory prayers with congregation at the mosque were considered hypocrites by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even threatened to burn the houses of the men who failed to perform their obligatory prayers at the mosque with congregation without a valid excuse. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1482. Those Muslims who are in a position to perform this important deed should do so. They should not fool themselves into claiming they are performing other righteous deeds, such as helping their family with house chores. Even though this is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, according to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 676, but it is important not to rearrange the importance of his traditions according to one's desires. Whoever does this is not following his traditions, they are only following their own desires, even if they are performing a righteous deed. In fact, this same narration concludes by advising that when it was time for the obligatory prayer, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would leave for the mosque. The People of the Bench After the changing of the prayer direction, the Qibla, the southern part of the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then became the back of the mosque. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, instructed for a roof to be built over that part so the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who had no place to stay and were poor could stay there, as the companions of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, could not house everyone. Their numbers would vary throughout the years, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would host them personally. Any charity that came to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, for him to distribute. He and his family would take no share of it, and he would instead distribute it to the poor of Medina, and particularly to these companions, may Allah be pleased with them. If anyone sent the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, a gift, he would utilize some of it for himself and his family, and give the rest to the poor, and particularly to these companions, may Allah be pleased with them. 
These people became known as the people of Safa, meaning the people of the bench. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the noble life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 734 to 736. One should bear in mind that many of these companions, may Allah be pleased with them, had wealth and property, but chose to leave everything behind in order to migrate and stay with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to learn directly from him. This is connected to Chapter 47 Muhammad, Verse 7. O oh, you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. This verse means that if one aids Islam, then Allah, the Exalted, will help them in both worlds. It is strange how countless people desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet do not fulfill the first part of this verse through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. The excuse most people give is that they do not have time to perform righteous deeds. They desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet will not make time to do the things which please Him. Does this make sense? Those who do not fulfill the obligatory duties and then expect the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need are quite foolish. And those who do fulfill the obligatory duties yet refuse to go beyond them will find that the aid they receive is limited. How one behaves is how they are treated. The more time and energy dedicated to Allah, the Exalted, the more support they will receive. It really is that simple. A Muslim needs to understand that the majority of the obligatory duties, such as the five daily prayers, only takes a small amount of time in one's day. A Muslim cannot expect to barely dedicate an hour a day to offering the obligatory prayers, and then neglect Allah, the Exalted, for the rest of the day, and still expect his continuous support through all difficulties. A person would dislike a friend who treated them in such a manner. How then can one treat Allah, the Exalted, the Lord of the Worlds like this then? Some only dedicate extra time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, when they encounter a worldly problem, then demand Him to fix it as if they done Allah, the Exalted, a favor by performing voluntary good deeds. This foolish mentality clearly contradicts servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. It is amazing how this type of person finds time to do all their other leisurely activities, such as spending time with family and friends, watching TV, and attending social functions, yet finds no time to dedicate to pleasing Allah, the Exalted. They cannot seem to find time to recite and adopt the teachings of the Holy Quran. They do not seem to find time to study and act on the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. These people somehow find wealth to spend on their unnecessary luxuries, yet seem to find no wealth to donate in voluntary charity. It is important to understand that a Muslim will be treated according to how they behave. Meaning, if a Muslim dedicates extra time to please Allah, the Exalted, then they will find the support they need to journey through all difficulties safely. But if they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties or only fulfill them without dedicating any other time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, then they will find a similar response from Allah, the Exalted. Put simply, the more one gives the more they shall receive. If one does not give much they should not expect much in return. Leading others astray. In the second year after the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, the direction of the prayer, the Qibla, was changed from Masjid Aqsa in Jerusalem, to the Kaaba in Mecca. The Jews found this change in the prayer direction difficult, as the previous prayer direction coincided with their prayer direction, and they therefore used it as evidence that they were rightly guided. One of the Jewish leaders, Kaib bin Ashraf, advised some of his followers to initially believe in Islam and pray towards Mecca with the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and then disbelieve in Islam and the prayer direction of the Muslims by the end of the day. He aimed to confuse the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and hoped they would follow them as they were learned and educated people of Medina. Meaning, if the educated people rejected Islam after learning about it, it must therefore be wrong. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 72. And a faction of the people of the scripture say to each other, Believe in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day, 
and reject it at its end that perhaps they will return i.e. abandon their religion. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al-Nuzal 3 to 72 page 35. A part of hypocrisy is that a person not only commits evil deeds themselves and abstains from righteous deeds, but they encourage others to do the same. They want others to be in the same boat as them, so that they find some comfort in their evil character. They not only drown themselves but take others down with them. Muslims must know that a person will be held accountable for every other person who commits a sin because of their invitation. This person will be treated as if they committed the sin even though they only invited others towards it. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 203. This is why some have said that blessed is the person whose evil dies with them, because their sins will increase if others act on their evil advice, even though they are no longer alive. A unique deed. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, Fasting in Ramadan became obligatory for all adult Muslims unless they were, are exempt by Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 250. In a divine narration found in Sunan an nasr number 2219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that all righteous deeds people perform are for themselves except for fasting, as this is for Allah, the Exalted, and he shall reward it directly. This narration indicates the uniqueness of fasting. One of the reasons it is described in this manner is because all other righteous deeds are visible to people, such as the prayer, or they are between people, such as secret charity. Whereas, fasting is a unique righteous deed, as others cannot know someone is fasting by only observing them. In addition, fasting is a righteous deed which puts a lock on every aspect of oneself. Meaning, a person who fasts correctly will be prevented from committing verbal and physical sins, such as looking at and hearing unlawful things. This is also achieved through the prayer, but the prayer is only performed for a short time and is visible to others whereas, fasting occurs throughout the day and is invisible to others. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 45 Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing. It is clear from the following verse a person who does not complete the obligatory fasts without a valid reason will not be a true believer, as the two have been directly connected. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah verse 183 O you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 723, that if a Muslim does not complete a single obligatory fast without a valid reason, they cannot make up for the reward and blessings lost even if they fasted every day for their entire life. In addition, as indicated by the verse quoted earlier, fasting correctly leads to piety. Meaning, simply starving during the day does not lead to piety, but paying extra attention to abstaining from sins and performing righteous deeds during the fast will lead to piety. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 707, warns that a fast will not be significant if one does not abstain from speaking and acting on falsehood. A similar narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 1690, warns that some fasting people obtain nothing except hunger. When one becomes more aware and careful in obeying Allah, the exalted, while they are fasting this habit, will eventually affect them, so they behave in a similar way, even when they are not fasting. This is in fact, true piety. The righteousness mentioned in the verse quoted earlier, is connected to fasting, as fasting reduces one's evil desires and passions. It prevents pride and the encouragement of sins. This is because fasting hinders the appetite of the stomach and one's carnal desires. These two things lead to many sins. In addition, the desire for these two things is greater than the desire for other unlawful things. So whoever controls them through fasting will find it easier to control the weaker evil desires. This leads to true righteousness. As briefly indicated earlier, there are different levels of fasting. The first and lowest level of fasting is when one abstains from the things which will break their fast, such as food. 
The next level is abstaining from sins which damages one's fast, thereby reducing the reward of their fast, such as lying. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 2235. Fasting which involves each member of the body is the next level. This is when each body part fasts from sins for example, the eyes from looking at the unlawful, the ears from listening to the unlawful, and so on. The next level is when one behaves in this manner, even when they are not fasting. Finally, the highest level of fasting is abstaining from all things which are not connected to Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should also fast inwardly as their body fasts outwardly by abstaining from sinful or vain thoughts. They should fast from persisting on their own plans in respect to their desires and try to concentrate on fulfilling their duties and responsibilities. In addition, they should fast from inwardly challenging the decree of Allah, the Exalted, and instead accept destiny and whatever it brings, knowing Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants, even if they do not understand the wisdom behind these choices. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Finally, a Muslim should aim for the highest reward by keeping their fast a secret and not informing others if it is avoidable, as informing others unnecessarily leads to a loss of reward, as it is an aspect of showing off. Obligatory Charity In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the obligatory charity was commanded. Muslims would give charity prior to this, but the exact quantity and finer details were not revealed and commanded until this year. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 933 to 934. Severe warnings over failing to donate the obligatory charity have been given in the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1403, warns that the person who does not donate their obligatory charity will encounter a large poisonous snake which will continuously bite them on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 180 And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of His bounty ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the Day of Resurrection. According to a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4019, when the members of a society withhold the obligatory charity Allah, the Exalted will withhold rain, and if it was not for the animals he would not let it rain at all. This major sin is therefore one potential cause of the long periods of drought some nations face. Not offering the obligatory charity is a sign of extreme greed, as it is only an extremely tiny portion of one's wealth, namely 2.5%. It is clear that the miser is far from Allah, the exalted, the people, and close to hell. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961. Muslims must understand that donating the obligatory charity does not only protect them from punishment, but it leads to blessings in one's life which far outweigh the wealth they donated. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6592, that charity does not decrease one's wealth. This means that when one donates Allah, the Exalted, compensates them. For example, he provides them with business opportunities which cause them to gain more wealth than they donated. This repayment is confirmed in many places of the Holy Quran, for example, chapter 57 Al-Hadid, verse 11. Who is it that would loan Allah a goodly loan, so he will multiply it for him and he will have a noble reward? In addition, this narration could indicate that as each person's provision is pre-recorded whatever wealth which is destined to be spent on them will never change irrespective of how much wealth a person donates. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. A Muslim must therefore avoid the wrath of Allah, the Exalted, by donating a very small fraction of their wealth in the form of the obligatory charity, while hoping for a reward which is much greater both in this world and the next. A bad intention. 
A man named Thalaba, who claimed to be a Muslim, once asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to supplicate for Allah, the Exalted, to bless him with wealth so that like the other Muslims, he too can give charity in abundance. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned Thalaba that it was better for him to have less and be grateful than have too much and be unable to show his gratitude to Allah, the Exalted. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, also stated that would it not be better that he lived like him and have little and be satisfied. After Thalabar persistently insisted the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, prayed for him. Shortly after Thalabar's business began to grow so much that he had to move outside the city of Medina. During this period, Thalabar was only seen at the mosque at the Friday prayer. During this period, giving a certain amount of charity became obligatory for those who could afford it. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sent the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to the different Islamic areas to collect this charity, including to where Thalabar resided. When the companion, may Allah be pleased with him, requested the obligatory charity from Thalabar, it was at this moment that Thalabar revealed his hypocrisy. Greed consumed him, and he uttered some disrespectful words by saying that Allah, the Exalted, had now put tax on him. After saying this, Thalabar told the companion, may Allah be pleased with him, to move on and collect the obligatory charity from the others, and he would use this time to ponder whether to give it or not. When this companion, may Allah be pleased with him, eventually returned to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he stated that Thalabar had been destroyed. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed chapter 9 at Torba, verses 75 to 77. And among them, hypocrites are those who made a covenant with Allah, saying, If he should give us from his bounty, we will surely spend in charity, and we will surely be among the righteous. But when he gave them from his bounty, they were stingy with it and turned away while they refused. So he penalized them with hypocrisy in their hearts until the day they will meet him, because they failed Allah in what they promised him, and because they habitually used to lie. When Thalabar was informed of this, he immediately visited the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to offer his obligatory charity. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, informed Thalabar that Allah, the Exalted, had now forbidden him to take his charity. Here the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, reminded Thalabar of his initial intentions. Thalabar tried over many years, but each time the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, stated that it was too late, and he could never go against the command of Allah, the Exalted. After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed from this world, Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, became the Caliph of the Islamic nation. Thalabar once again tried to restore his status by donating his obligatory charity. But the leader simply replied that if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not take the charity, then how could he? Thalabar attempted this with the following two caliphs of the Islamic nation, but again they too rejected Thalabar's attempts. This has been discussed in Imam al-Wahidi's Asbab al-Nuzal, 9-75 pages 90-91. As his only desire was to restore his status within the community, his offerings were rejected. This has been indicated under the verses quoted earlier. If he sincerely repented from his hypocrisy in order to please Allah, the Exalted, he would have been forgiven. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4251, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that people commit sins but the best person who commits sins is the one who sincerely repents. As people are not angels, they are bound to commit sins. The thing that makes these people special is when they sincerely repent from their sins. Sincere repentance includes feeling remorse, seeking the forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, and anyone who has been wronged, making a firm promise not to commit the sin or a similar sin again, and making up for any rights which have been violated in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. It is important to note, minor sins can be erased through righteous deeds which has been advised in many narrations, such as the one found in Sahih Muslim, number 550. It advises that the five daily obligatory prayers, 
and two consecutive Friday congregational prayers, erase the minor sins committed in between them as long as major sins are avoided. Major sins are only erased through sincere repentance. Therefore, a Muslim should strive to avoid all sins, minor and major, and if they happen to occur to immediately sincerely repent, as the time of death is unknown. And they should continue obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Stopping Corruption As the non-Muslims of Mecca made it clear that as long as Medina was an established Islamic state, there would be nothing but war between the two cities. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, attempted to weaken the resolve of the non-Muslims of Mecca by attacking their financial infrastructure. The non-Muslims of Mecca would pass by Medina when traveling for trade. Therefore, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would target these traveling caravans with the aim of disrupting the finances of the non-Muslims of Mecca and seeking compensation for the property and wealth the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were forced to leave behind in Mecca when they migrated to Medina. On one occasion, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dispatched a unit of companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to Nakla in order to spy on the non-Muslims of Mecca and bring back information regarding their activities. He did not command them to engage in fighting. But during this expedition, these companions, may Allah be pleased with them, seized an opportunity and attacked one of their caravans and seized their wealth and in the process a non-muslim was killed and two non-muslims were taken back to medina as prisoners the holy prophet muhammad peace and blessings be upon him criticized the companions may allah be pleased with them as he did not order them to fight only to gather intelligence the companions may allah be pleased with them also did not realize that they had attacked the caravan during one of the four sacred months during which fighting was unanimously prohibited for the Arabs, even though the non-Muslims would not even adhere to this rule and often changed the order of the months in the calendar year in order to allow themselves to fight. Chapter 9 at Torba, verses 36 to 37. Indeed, the number of months with Allah is 12 lunar months in the register of Allah from the day he created the heavens and the earth. Of these four are sacred. That is the correct religion, i.e. way, so do not wrong yourselves during them. And fight against the disbelievers collectively, as they fight against you collectively. And know that Allah is with the righteous who fear him. Indeed, the postponing of restriction within sacred months is an increase in disbelief by which those who have disbelieved are led further astray. They make it lawful one year and unlawful another year to correspond to the number made unlawful by Allah and thus make lawful what Allah has made unlawful. Made pleasing to them is the evil of their deeds, and Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Initially, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not make a decision regarding the prisoners of war or the spoils of war, but then Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 217, thereby granting the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, relief. They ask you about the sacred month, about fighting therein. Say, fighting therein is great sin, but averting people from the way of Allah and disbelief in him and preventing access to al-Masjid al-Haram and the expulsion of its people therefrom are greater evil in the sight of Allah. And fitna corruption is greater than killing. And they will continue to fight you until they turn you back from your religion if they are able. And whoever of you reverts from his religion to disbelief and dies while he is a disbeliever, for those, their deeds have become worthless in this world and the hereafter, and those are the companions of the fire, they will abide therein eternally. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then accepted the prisoners of war and the spoils of war. One of the prisoners of war accepted Islam and the other was ransomed by the non-Muslims of Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 879 to 881 and 890. Doing battle during the four holy months in the year was forbidden even before the coming of Islam, Dhul al-Qaeda, Dhul al-Hijjah, Muharram and Rajab. 
But Allah, the Exalted, made it clear that the widespread corruption caused by the non-Muslims of Mecca, mentioned in this verse, was worse than fighting during the sacred months. The non-Muslims of Mecca had continuously subjected their Muslim relatives to untold wrong for 13 years, prior to the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, merely because they believed in Allah, the Exalted. They therefore were not competent to object to fighting during the sacred months. Not only had the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, been driven from their homes, they also had the way to Masjid al-Haram closed to them, a bar which had not been imposed by anyone for thousands of years. With this record of corruption, it was not for them or anyone else to raise an objection to fighting during the sacred months if the need arose. The corruption in the quoted verse refers to the wide negative effects of the oppression caused by the enemies of Islam, meaning the non-Muslims of Mecca. The heart of this corruption was their misguided faith and loyalties to their tribes, love for wealth, culture and false gods. This verse further proves that fighting was commanded against a specific group of non-Muslims in Mecca, and therefore these verses cannot be applied to others. Therefore, the corruption in these verses refers to the persecution of innocent people. It refers to a situation whereby either a person or a group is subjected to harassment and intimidation for having accepted, as true, a set of ideas contrary to those currently held, and for striving to effect reforms in the existing order of society by preaching what is good and forbidding what is wrong. Therefore, the only way to prevent this specific harming of innocent people by this corruption was to fight the enemy until Islam was allowed to be practiced openly without opposition and the negative harms to society caused by the non-Muslims was stopped. In addition, the widespread oppression caused by oppressive rulers such as the Romans and Persians during the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was widely known. They would constantly oppress the people of the land they had control over. Fighting these people might have led to the killing of soldiers, soldiers which signed up to fight and die, but in the long run it removed the oppression the innocent citizens were subjected to. And if Islamic rule was established correctly, like it was during the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the rightly guided caliphs after him, then justice would prevail in the land. Therefore, from this one can understand that long-standing oppression to the people is worse than the killing of soldiers if it leads to justice being established. Greatness is in humility. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. On the way to raiding a caravan, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, took turns riding their camels as they had so few. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, shared one camel with Ali ibn Abu Talib and Abu Lubaba, may Allah be pleased with them. When it was the Holy Prophet Muhammad's, peace and blessings be upon him, turned to walk, his two companions, may Allah be pleased with them, offered to take his place so he could ride on the camel. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that they were not stronger than him, meaning he was not injured or sick that he could use that as an excuse not to walk and he added that he desired the reward of walking. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 258. Unlike the leaders of today who refuse to face the same difficulties their followers undertake, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, shared in the difficulties faced by his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. This was an indication of his great humility. Chapter 25 al furqan verse 63 And the servants of the Most Merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. The servants of Allah, the Exalted, have understood that anything good they possess is solely because Allah, the Exalted, granted it to them. And any evil they are saved from is because Allah, the Exalted, protected them. Is it not foolish to be proud of something that does not belong to someone? Just like a person does not boast about a sports car, which does not belong to them, Muslims must realize nothing in reality belongs to them. This attitude ensures one remains humble at all times. The humble servants of Allah, the Exalted, fully believe in the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5673, which declares that the righteous deeds of a person will not take them to paradise. 
Only the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, can cause this to occur. This is because every righteous deed is only possible when Allah, the Exalted, provides one with the knowledge, strength, opportunity and inspiration to perform it. Even the acceptance of the deed is dependent on the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. When one bears this in mind, it saves them from pride and inspires them to adopt humility. One should always remember that being humble is not a sign of weakness, as Islam has encouraged one to defend themselves if necessary. In other words, Islam teaches Muslims to be humble without weakness. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029, that whoever humbles themselves before Allah, the Exalted, will be raised by him. So in reality, humility leads to honor in both worlds. One only needs to reflect on the most humble of the creation to understand this fact, namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah, the Exalted, has clearly ordered people by ordering the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to adopt this important quality. Chapter 26 Ash Shu'ara, verse 215 And lower your wing, i.e., show kindness to those who follow you of the believers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, led a humble life. For example, he happily carried out the domestic duties at home, thereby proving these chores are gender neutral. This is confirmed in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 538. Chapter 25 Al-Furqan, verse 63, shows that humility is an inner characteristic that manifests outwards, such as the way one walks. This is discussed in another verse, chapter 31 Luke Man, verse 18. And do not turn your cheek in contempt toward people, and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear that paradise is for the humble servants who possess no trace of pride. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 83. That home of the hereafter we assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon the earth or corruption. And the best outcome is for the righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1998, that whoever possesses an atom's worth of pride will not enter paradise. Only Allah, the Exalted, has the right to be proud, as He is the Creator, Sustainer, and Owner of the entire universe. It is important to note, pride is when one believes they are superior to others and rejects the truth when it is presented to them, as they dislike accepting the truth when it comes from other than them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4092. Respecting Parents Abu Umama, may Allah be pleased with him, desired to leave with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to raid the caravan of the non-Muslims of Mecca, but was commanded to remain behind to take care of his sick mother, who later died. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1011 to 1012. Even though leaving with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was a highly important task and virtue, yet he was commanded to remain behind and nurse his sick mother. This indicates the importance of respecting and honoring parents. Being kind to parents is widely known characteristic amongst Muslims, yet unfortunately many fail to fulfill this important duty. Allah, the Exalted, has placed being kind to parents next to solely worshipping him in many places of the Holy Quran, such as Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 23 And your Lord has decreed that you worship not except him, and to parents, good treatment. Whether one or both of them reach old age while with you, say not to them so much as, UFF one and do not repel them but speak to them a noble word. In fact, this same verse prohibits Muslims to even utter a single word out of annoyance towards their parents. In another place of the Holy Quran, Allah, the Exalted, has combined being grateful to him with being grateful to parents. Chapter 31 Luke Man, verse 14. Be grateful to me and to your parents. Even though there are countless narrations commanding treating parents kindly, a single narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3662, is enough to understand its importance. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
answered someone who questioned what the rights of one's parents are by declaring that they are a child's paradise or hell. Meaning, if one treats their parents kindly for the sake of Allah, the exalted, they may well be admitted into paradise because of it. But those who mistreat their parents may well be hurled into hell because of it. Even though, being obedient to parents, as long as it does not involve the disobedience of Allah, the exalted, is very difficult. Especially, in this day and age, Muslims should try to remain patient and not argue with their parents. If a Muslim disagrees with them, they can and should still maintain respect for them at all times. Nobility lies in piety. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina to raid a caravan of the non-Muslims of Mecca, he appointed Ibn Am Maktam, may Allah be pleased with him, in charge of leading the congregational prayers in his absence. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 257. Ibn Am Maktam, may Allah be pleased with him, was a blind and poor man, and even though there were other people who were considered the leaders of their tribes, yet the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, appointed him to lead the congregational prayers. This indicates the importance of equality in Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead, he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed, as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this narration indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though, many Muslims have erected these barriers, such as social castes and sects thereby believing some are better than others, Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. Seeking Counsel In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. On the way to raiding a caravan of the non-Muslims of Mecca, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca had organized an army to confront the Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, for their opinions on what to do. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 259 to 260. Some Muslims have adopted a strange mentality where they counsel many people about their affairs. The issue with this attitude is that when one tells too many people, then sharing their problems and seeking advice becomes a means of complaining about their difficulties, which is a clear sign of their impatience. In addition, this attitude will only cause one to become confused as the advice they receive will be varied, which will cause them to become more and more uncertain of the correct path. Whereas, consulting a few wise people will only cause one's certainty to increase. 
Repeating one's problems over and over again to many people also causes them to focus too much on their problem, which makes it appear bigger and more significant than it really is, even to the point that it causes them to neglect their other duties, which only leads to more impatience. Therefore Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Standing firm. In the second year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the battle of Badr, took place. On the way to raiding a caravan of the non-Muslims of Mecca, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca had organized an army to confront the Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, for their opinions on what to do. At this time, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, rose up and comforted the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by pledging his support to him under all circumstances and encouraged the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to do the same. Then Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, rose up and did the same thing. He pledged his support to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and encouraged the others to do the same. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 93-94. Al Miqtad bin Amra, may Allah be pleased with him, also stated that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would not abandon him by following in the footsteps of the nation of the Holy Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, when they disrespectfully declared that the Holy Prophet Musa, peace and be upon him, and his Lord could go and fight, as they were not going to aid him. Chapter 5 Al Maida, verse 24. They said, O Moses, indeed, we will not enter it ever as long as they are within it, so go, you and your Lord, and fight. Indeed, we are remaining right here. Instead, Mikdid, may Allah be pleased with him, declared that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would fight with him under all situations. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 250 to 260. As the majority of this Muslim army were from the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, desired them to give their input. One of their leaders, Sa'd bin Mu'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, realized this and stated on behalf of all the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, that they would obey him in whatever he commanded them to do. He added that if they were ordered to plunge into the sea to fight, they would do so, and none of them would hold back. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 212 to 213. This incident reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil, and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. 
The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for his sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 and those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. In addition, an aspect of hypocrisy is when one verbally shows support for others and their good projects such as, building a mosque, but when the time comes to take part in the project such as, donating wealth, they seem to disappear. Similarly, when people are facing good times, they verbally support them, reminding others of their loyalty to them. But the moment the people face difficulties, these hypocrites offer no emotional or physical support. Instead, they criticize them. This was the attitude of the hypocrites in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 62. So how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth, and then they come to you swearing by Allah, we intended nothing but good conduct and accommodation. End of evil plots. The non-Muslim caravan, headed by Abu Sufyan, decided to take an alternate route which took them safely away from the Muslims. Abu Sufyan then sent word to the non-Muslims of Mecca, who had mobilized a large army to confront the Muslims, to return back to Mecca as their caravan was safe. But Abu Jahl, who was one of leaders of the non-Muslim army, insisted they should continue marching towards Badr, confront and destroy the Muslims once and for all. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 211 to 212. One should never plot to do an evil thing, as it will always, one way or another, backfire on them. Even if these consequences are delayed to the next world, they will face them eventually. For example, the brothers of the Holy Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, desired to harm him as they desired the love, respect and affection of their father, the Holy Prophet Yaqub, peace be upon him. But it is clear that their scheming only put them further away from their desire. Chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 18 And they brought upon his shirt false blood. Jacob said, Rather your souls have enticed you to something, so patience is most fitting. The more one plots evil, the more Allah, the Exalted, will put them further from their goal. Even if they outwardly achieve their desire, Allah, the Exalted, will cause the very thing they desire to become a curse for them in both worlds unless they sincerely repent. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they await except the way, i.e., fate of the former peoples. Accepting good counsel. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, reached Badr, he stopped at a certain place. Qubab bin Mundir, may Allah be pleased him, inquired whether stopping at that place was a divine command or a choice made by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. When he replied that it was his choice and not a divine command, Hubab, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to set up camp at a different location, as it was tactically more advantageous. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, accepted and acted on his advice. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 267. Rejecting good advice given by anyone can be considered a sign of pride. 
In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a person who possesses even an atom's worth of pride in their heart will not enter paradise. He clarified that pride is when a person rejects the truth and looks down on others. No amount of good deeds will benefit someone who possesses pride. This is quite obvious when one observes the devil and how his countless years of worship did not benefit him when he became proud. In fact, the following verse clearly connects pride with disbelief, so a Muslim must avoid this evil characteristic at all costs. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 34 And mention when we said to the angels prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. The proud is the one who rejects the truth when it is presented to them, simply because it did not come from them, and as it challenges their desires and mentality. The proud person also believes they are superior to others, even though they are unaware of their own ultimate end and the ultimate end of others. This is plain ignorance. In reality, it is foolish to be proud of anything, seeing as Allah, the Exalted, created and granted everything a person owns. Even the righteous deeds one performs are only due to the inspiration, knowledge and strength granted by Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, being proud of something which does not innately belong to them is plain foolishness. This is just like a person who becomes proud over a mansion they do not even own or live in. This is the reason why pride belongs to Allah, the Exalted, as He alone is the Creator and innate owner of all things. The one who challenges Allah, the Exalted, in pride will be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4090. A Muslim should instead follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and adopt humility. The humble truly recognize that all the good they possess and all the evil they are protected from comes from no one except Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, humility is more fitting for a person than pride. A person should not be fooled into believing humility leads to disgrace, as no one has been more honored than the humble servants of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has guaranteed an increase in status for the one who adopts humility for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029. Sincerity to Leaders in the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. When the Muslim army reached the battlefield, a companion, Sa'd bin Mu'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that a temporary shelter should be built for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If the Muslim army lost the battle, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could then retreat and rejoin the rest of his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in Medina. He added that these companions, may Allah be pleased with them, only stayed behind in Medina, as they were unaware a battle was going to take place, and they would always strive to protect the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and give him good counsel. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, agreed with his idea, but still participated in the battle more than anyone else did. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 268. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. 
Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Goodness in Destiny In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. As the non-Muslim army reached Badr first, they set up camp at what appeared to be the superior location, while the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were left with what appeared to be the inferior location. But after it rained, this situation reversed, and the camp of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, became the superior location. The rain made the land they were camped at firmer. The rain also allowed them to easily capture rainwater for ablution and other needs. Chapter 8 Al Anval, verse 11. Remember when he overwhelmed you with drowsiness, giving security from him, and sent down upon you from the sky, rain by which to purify you and remove from you the evil suggestions of Satan, and to make steadfast your hearts and plant firmly thereby your feet. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, Volume 4, pages 271 to 272. The drowsiness they were granted was due to a sense of security which Allah, the Exalted, placed in their hearts which protected them from the whisperings of the devil. If they were terrified, they would not have slept. This sleep also allowed them to be fully rested before the battle. The only one who did not sleep was the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He spent the night praying and supplicating to Allah, the Exalted, for victory. This has been discussed in a narration found in Musnad Ahmad, number 1161. The quoted verse also indicates that when things do not seem to be optimal, one should remain firm on the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, as blessings and success will be granted to them irrespective of how the situation appears. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4168, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims not to question destiny as this opens the door to the devil. He encourages Muslims to challenge the choice of Allah, the Exalted, as they do not observe the wisdom behind it because of their short-sightedness. This in turn leads to impatience and the loss of reward. One should reflect on their past experiences where they believed something was good when it in fact was bad, and vice versa, in order to inspire them to remain patient, as they will be shown these benefits sooner or later. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Divine Blessings and Support In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. Allah, the Exalted, initially showed the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to be few in the sight of the non-Muslims and vice versa, so that the battle would take place, and so that the truth could prevail over falsehood. One of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, judged the enemy number to be 70, and the companion, may Allah be pleased with him, by his side, judged the enemy to be 100. But once the battle commenced, Allah, the Exalted, showed the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to be twice the number of the non-Muslims in order to strike fear in their hearts, thereby giving aid to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. The actual numbers were around 310 Muslims against 1,000 non-Muslims. Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verse 44. And remember when he showed them to you, when you met, as few in your eyes, and he made you appear as few in their eyes so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined. And chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 13. Already there has been for you a sign in the two armies which met in combat at Badr, one fighting in the cause of Allah and another of disbelievers. They saw them to be twice their own number by their eyesight. But Allah supports with his victory whom he wills. 
Indeed, in that is a lesson for those of vision. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 269. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 1081, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims how to gain blessings in their provision, divine support and an improvement in their condition and state. The first thing is to sincerely repent to Allah, the Exalted, before one dies. As the time of death is unknown, this narration actually indicates sincerely repenting whenever one commits a sin meaning, repenting without delay. This consists of seeking forgiveness from Allah, the Exalted, and whoever else has been wronged, feeling regret, making a firm promise not to commit the same or a similar sin again. And finally, if possible, to make up for any rights which have been violated in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. The next thing advised in the main narration is that a Muslim must make use of their time before they become preoccupied with responsibilities, an illness or a difficulty. A Muslim can achieve this by obeying Allah, the Exalted, through fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must hasten to perform righteous deeds within their means as much as possible, without delay, as the tomorrow they hope for may never come. It is hoped that the one who behaves in this manner will be supported by Allah, the Exalted, when they are no longer in a position to perform extra righteous deeds due to a change in circumstances. The next thing mentioned in the main narration is that a Muslim must strengthen their bond with Allah, the Exalted, by remembering Him much. True remembrance of Allah, the Exalted, consists of three levels. The first is internal remembrance meaning sincerity to Him. The second level consists of remembering Allah, the Exalted, by speaking good words and avoiding vain and sinful speech. And the highest level is to sincerely obey Allah, the Exalted, through one's actions as outlined earlier. The final thing mentioned in the main narration is giving much charity, both hidden and open. This includes both the obligatory and voluntary charity. It is important to note, this means giving charity according to one's means whether it is much or little. Allah, the Exalted, does not observe quantity, He observes and judges actions based on quality meaning, one's sincerity. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. This leaves Muslims with no excuses but to give charity according to their means. In addition, it is important to give charity regularly instead of once in a while, as regular deeds are more beloved to Allah, the Exalted, even if they are little. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6465. Finally, those who desire to encourage others to give charity can give it publicly. This will lead to them gaining the same reward as those who donate because of their inspiration. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. But those who are fearful of showing off, which cancels their reward, should do so privately. Islam has provided many options and opportunities for Muslims to gain much reward, which lead to the removal of their burdens in both worlds. True Hope In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. Before the battle commenced, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, persistently and ardently supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, to grant victory to them. His pleas to Allah, the Exalted, were so intense that his cloak would slip down off his shoulders when he raised his hands in supplication. Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, was with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and would reposition his cloak for him, and out of sympathy, he requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to lessen his intensity as Allah, the Exalted, would fulfill his promise and grant him victory. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 273. As the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the perfect servant of Allah, the Exalted, he did not stop turning and supplicating to his Lord and Master. Whereas Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, during this event was at the station of true hope in Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
Describe the difference between true hope in the mercy of Allah, the exalted, and wishful thinking. True hope is when one controls their soul by avoiding the disobedience of Allah, the exalted, and actively struggles for preparing for the hereafter. Whereas, the foolish wishful thinker follows their desires and then expects Allah, the exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. It is important for Muslims not to confuse these two attitudes so that they avoid living and dying as a wishful thinker, as this person is highly unlikely to succeed in this world or the next. Wishful thinking is like a farmer who fails to prepare the land for planting, fails to plant seeds, fails to water the land, and then expects to harvest a huge crop. This is plain foolishness, and this farmer is highly unlikely to succeed. Whereas, true hope is like a farmer who prepares the land, plants seeds, waters the land, and then hopes Allah, the exalted, will bless them with a huge harvest. The key difference is that the one who possesses true hope will actively strive to obey Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And whenever they slip up, they sincerely repent. Whereas, the wishful thinker will not actively strive in obeying Allah, the exalted, and instead follow their desires and still expect Allah, the exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. Muslims must therefore learn the key difference so that they can abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope in Allah, the exalted, which always leads to nothing except good and success in both worlds. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405. The help of Allah, the exalted. In the second year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the battle of Badr, took place. On that day, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, not to kill certain people who were on the side of the non-Muslims as they had come to the battlefield reluctantly. In addition, he forbade the killing of a man, Abu al-Baktari, as he protected the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, from the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca, and annulled the document boycotting the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, before he migrated to Medina. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 290. As Abu al-Baktari helped the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, Allah, the Exalted, aided him. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, will continue helping a Muslim as long as they are helping others. A Muslim must understand that when they strive for something or are aided by another person to complete a particular task, the outcome may be successful or end in failure. But when Allah, the Exalted, helps someone with anything, a successful outcome is guaranteed. Therefore, Muslims should, for their own sake, strive to help others in all good things so that they receive the help of Allah, the Exalted, in both worldly and religious matters. In addition, this incident also warns against bad companionship, as these people were coerced to joining the non-Muslims of Mecca during this battle out of their loyalty to them. Muslims should note that a major sign of true love is when one directs their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is because obedience leads to success and safety in both this world and in the hereafter. A person who does not desire safety and success for a person can never truly love them irrespective of what they claim or how they treat the other person. The same way a person becomes happy when their beloved obtains worldly success, like a job, they will also desire their beloved to obtain success in the hereafter. If a person does not care about another obtaining safety and success especially in the next world, then they do not love them. A true lover could not bear knowing and seeing their beloved facing difficulties and punishment in this world or in the next. This is only avoidable through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, they would always direct their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. If a person directs another towards their own selfish interest or the interest of others instead of the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. 
This applies to all relationships, such as friendships and relatives. Therefore, a Muslim should assess whether those in their life direct them towards Allah, the Exalted, or not. If they do, then it is a clear sign of their love for them. If they do not, then it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Advising sincerely. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. Before the battle commenced, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, observed one of the non-Muslims leaders, Atbar ibn Rabia, amongst the non-Muslim army. He then commented that if anyone amongst the non-Muslim army had goodness in them, it was him, and if the army obeyed him, they would act rightly. Meanwhile, Akbar urged the non-Muslims to return home and not engage in battle. He reminded them that many of the Muslims were their relatives and if they were killed, then the Meccans might win the battle. But when they return home, they would have enmity for each other, as they killed each other's relatives. Abu Jahl desired the destruction of Islam at all costs and accused of him being a coward only to urge him and others to fight. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, page 962. Though Akbar was a non-Muslim, nonetheless he showed some sincerity to his fellow people, while on the other hand, Abu Jahl showed insincerity to everyone by advising them to fight and kill their own relatives, all for the sake of worldly gain. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim No. 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance, as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people, that one is pleased when they are happy and sad, whenever they are grieved, as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53. Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others, so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence, for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77. And do good as Allah has done good to you. Honoring Promises In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. Hadifa bin Yaman and his father, may Allah be pleased with them, were both migrating from Mecca to join the Holy Prophet Muhammad,
Peace and blessings be upon him for the Battle of Badr. On the way they were captured by the non-Muslims of Mecca, but they managed to convince them that their intention was to go to Medina and not join the army of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him at Badr. They took a pledge to this effect with the non-Muslims. When they eventually reached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, close to Badr and informed him of what occurred. He told them to fulfill their promise and continue to Medina instead of joining their heavily outnumbered army, a ratio of three to one. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1055 to 1056. Even in such a dire situation, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised them not to break their promise. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that breaking promises is an aspect of hypocrisy. The greatest of promises a Muslim has made is with Allah, the Exalted, which is to obey him sincerely. This involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. All other promises made with people must also be kept unless one has a valid excuse especially, the ones a parent makes with children. Breaking promises only teaches children bad character and encourages them to believe being deceitful is an acceptable characteristic to possess. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2227, Allah, the Exalted, declares that he will be against the one who makes a promise in his name and then breaks it without a valid excuse. How can the one who has Allah, the Exalted, against them on Judgment Day, possibly succeed? The Jewel In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. Before the fighting commenced, three non-Muslims challenged three Muslims to single combat. Ali ibn Abu Talib, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and Ubaidah bin Harith, may Allah be pleased with them, took part in this duel against three non-Muslim leaders. Ali and Hamza, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame their opponents and killed them. Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, mortally wounded his opponent, but was also mortally wounded himself. When he was carried to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the latter confirmed that he was a martyr. Before he died, Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, commented that the following poem said by Abu Talib, the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was more applicable to him. We shall protect him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, until we are wounded and fall dead around him. Being totally oblivious of our own children and wives. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad Kandlawi's Hayatus Sahaba, Volume 1, pages 500 to 501, and in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 219. In this regard, Allah the Exalted revealed Chapter 22 Al Hajj, verse 19. These are two adversaries who have disputed over their Lord. But those who disbelieved will have cut out for them garments of fire. Poured upon their heads will be scalding water. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2835. This reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil, and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward.
Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for his sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. Bravery In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. During the battle the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was nearest to the enemy than anyone else and he was the bravest man that day. This has been recorded in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 282. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was the bravest of men. During the Battle of Badr, he remained with and defended the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, from every attack. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti, Tariq al-Kulafa, page 13. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2511, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned Muslims to avoid being cowardly. This attitude prevents trust in Allah, the Exalted, and in what he has promised, such as one's guaranteed provision. It can cause one to seek their provision in doubtful and unlawful means which will destroy a person in both worlds. Allah, the Exalted, does not accept any deed which has a foundation in the unlawful. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2342. In addition, being a coward prevents one from striving against the devil and one's inner devil which requires genuine struggle. This will lead one to fail in obeying Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And it will therefore prevent them from fulfilling the rights of people. Both worldly and religious success requires effort and time. A coward will be too afraid to undertake this struggle, and will instead be lazy, which leads to failure in both worldly and religious matters. Help from the heavens. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. During the battle Allah, the Exalted, sent thousands of angels to help the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verse 12 Remember when your Lord inspired to the angels, I am with you, so strengthen those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieved, so strike them upon the necks and strike from them every fingertip. On one occasion a companion, may Allah be pleased with him, pursued a non-Muslim soldier and heard the noise of a whip and someone speaking even though no one else was present. He found the non-Muslim dead. When he informed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, what had occurred, he confirmed that was an angel from the third heaven. This has been mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4588. On another occasion, an angel helped a companion, may Allah be pleased with him, capture the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, who was coerced by the non-Muslims of Mecca to join them during this battle. This has been discussed in a narration found in Musnad Ahmad, number 948. During the battle, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, threw a handful of sand and pebbles in the direction of the non-Muslim army, which reached the eyes of every non-Muslim soldier and distracted them from fighting. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verse 17. And you threw not when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 977 to 978, and in Imam Wahidi's, 
Asbab al nuzal 817, page 82. Allah, the Exalted, safeguards and preserves the creation and takes care of them with special care. He protects the obedient from the plots and traps of the devil, and he safeguards the disobedient from his immediate punishment, in order to give them an opportunity to sincerely repent. A Muslim should act on this divine name by using the means provided to them by Allah, the Exalted, but always trust in his divine care and choices in every situation and outcome they face, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind some choices. This inspires patience and even contentment with the choice of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 65 at Talak verse 3 And whoever relies upon Allah, then he is sufficient for him. A Muslim should also understand that they will only be protected from misguidance and punishment by the guardian namely, Allah, the Exalted. This removes any signs of pride and ensures they seek his protection through sincere obedience to him. A Muslim must act on this divine name by safeguarding every trust they possess, such as their blessings, by using them according to the teachings of Islam. They should safeguard their actions and speech from the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. This will ensure they receive more blessings from Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. A bad companion In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. The devil in the form of a human, joined the army of the non-Muslims and encouraged them to battle while promising to protect and aid them. But after the devil witnessed the angels descending from the heavens to aid the Muslim army, he withdrew and retreated from the battlefield with his minions. When he was criticized by the non-Muslims, he replied that he witnessed what they could not see and feared Allah, the Exalted, and his punishment. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 288. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5534, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the difference between a good and bad companion. The good companion is like a person who sells perfume. Their companion will either obtain some perfume or at least be affected by the pleasant smell. Whereas a bad companion is like a blacksmith. If their companion does not burn their clothes, they will certainly be affected by the smoke. Muslims must understand that the people they accompany will have an effect on them, whether this affect is positive or negative, obvious or subtle. It is not possible to accompany someone and not be affected by it. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4833, confirms that a person is on their companion's religion. Meaning, a person adopts the characteristics of their companion. It is therefore important for Muslims to always accompany the righteous, as they will undoubtedly affect them in a positive way, meaning they will inspire them to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Whereas, bad companions will either inspire one to disobey Allah, the Exalted, or they will encourage a Muslim to concentrate on the material world over preparing for the hereafter. This attitude will become a great regret for them on Judgment Day, even if the things they strive for are lawful but beyond their needs. Finally, as a person will end up with those they love in the hereafter, according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, a Muslim must practically show they love for the righteous by accompanying them in this world. But if they accompany bad or heedless people, then it proves and indicates their love for them and their ultimate destination in the hereafter. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Perceiving the hereafter. During the Battle of Badr, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, encouraged the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to fight the non-Muslims and promise them paradise in return. When Umayyad bin Hamar, may Allah be pleased with him, heard this promise, he threw down some dates he was eating, took up his sword and fought until he was martyred. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad Kandlawi's Hayatus Sahaba, Volume 1, pages 409 to 410. Umayyad, 
May Allah be pleased with him, responded in this way, as he adopted the correct perception and understanding in respect to this material world and the hereafter. It is important for Muslims to develop the correct perception so that they can increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is what the righteous predecessors possessed, and it encouraged them to avoid the excess luxuries of the material world and instead prepare for the hereafter. This is an important characteristic to possess, and it can be explained with a worldly example. Two people are extremely thirsty and come across a cup of murky water. They both desire to drink it, even though it is not pure, and even if it means they have to argue over it. As their thirst grows the more focused on the cup of murky water they become, to the point they lose focus on everything else. But if one of them shifted their focus and observed a river of pure water which was only a short distance ahead, they would immediately lose focus on the cup of water to the point they would no longer care about it and no longer argue over it. And instead they would endure their thirst patiently knowing a river of pure water is close. The person who is unaware of the river would probably believe the other person is crazy after observing their change in attitude. This is the case of the two types of people in this world. One group greedily focuses on the material world. The other group has shifted their focus to the hereafter and the pure and eternal blessings therein. When one shifts their focus to the bliss of the hereafter, worldly problems do not seem like such a big deal. Therefore, patience becomes easier to adopt. But if one keeps their focus on this world, then it will seem like everything to them. They will argue, fight, love and hate for it. Just like the person in the example mentioned earlier, who only focuses on the cup of murky water. This correct perception is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Uncompromising in faith In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. In this battle, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, confronted and killed his maternal uncle, As ibn Hashim. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 93 to 94. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, did not allow any relationship to overcome his sincerity and loyalty to Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. In addition, during this battle the son of Abu Bakr, Abdur Rahman, may Allah be pleased with them, was fighting on the side of the non-Muslims. Years later, after accepting Islam, he told his father that during the Battle of Badr, he had an opportunity to attack him but withheld his hand out of respect for him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that if he had an opportunity on that day to fight and kill him, he would have. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa page 12. The non-Muslim brother of Musab bin Umayy was captured by another companion, may Allah be pleased with them. Musab told the companion, may Allah be pleased with them, to take a high ransom from the prisoner's mother, as she was wealthy. When his non-Muslim brother mentioned his family tie to him, he replied that the companion, may Allah be pleased with him, was his brother and not him. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 226. During the Battle of Badr, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, may Allah be pleased with him, fought and killed his father. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 58 Al-Mujadila, verse 22. You will not find a people who believe in Allah, and the last day having affection for those who oppose Allah and his messenger, even if they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred. Those, he has decreed within their hearts faith and supported them with spirit one from him. And we will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide eternally. Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with him, those are the party of Allah. Unquestionably, the party of Allah, they are the successful. 
This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al Nuzal, 58 to 22, page 150. Muslims must adopt this uncompromising attitude if they desire success in both worlds. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided Caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. Hating for Allah, the Exalted In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After the battle was over and the non-Muslims were defeated, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered the bodies of the non-Muslims to be placed in an old well. Abu Hudhaifa bin Akbar, may Allah be pleased with him, became visibly sad when he witnessed his dead non-Muslim father. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questioned his reaction, he replied that he did not have doubts about his faith, but was sad as he desired for his father to accept Islam and not die in disbelief. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not rebuke him and instead spoke comforting words to him. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 226. This indicates the importance of not hating non-Muslims, but to instead desire and hope good for them while remaining firm on the teachings of Islam. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the characteristics which perfect a Muslim's faith. One of these characteristics is to hate for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This means one should dislike the things Allah, the Exalted, dislikes such as his disobedience. It is important to note, this does not mean one should hate others as people can sincerely repent to Allah, the Exalted. Instead, a Muslim should dislike the sin itself, which is proven by them avoiding it and warning others against it also. Muslims should continue to advise others instead of breaking ties with them, as this act of kindness may well cause them to sincerely repent. This includes not disliking things based on one's own feelings, such as an action which is lawful. Finally, the proof of one disliking for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is that when they show their dislike through their words and actions, it will never be in a way which contradicts the teachings of Islam. Meaning, their dislike for something will never cause them to commit a sin, as this would prove that their dislike for something is for their own sake. Consequences of Actions 
In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. The archenemy of Islam, Abu Jahl, was killed by two young companions, may Allah be pleased with them. When he was pointed out to them, they charged at him, until they mortally wounded him. Then, Abdullah bin Masazud, may Allah be pleased with him, found Abu Jahl in his last breath and finished him off. This has been discussed in narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 3988 and 4020. After the battle was over and the non-Muslims were defeated, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered the bodies of the non-Muslims to be placed in an old well. After this was done he called out to them, enumerating those in the well, and asked if they had found what Allah, the Exalted, promised them, as he was given exactly what Allah, the Exalted, promised him. When he was questioned about calling out to the dead, he replied that they could hear his words, but they could not reply. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 300. It is important to learn that no matter how much physical or social strength a person has, a day will certainly come when they face the consequences of their actions. In most cases, this occurs during their life where the actions of a person leads them to trouble, such as prison, and eventually they will face the consequences of their actions in the hereafter, as well. This applies to all people not just leaders. A Muslim should therefore never mistreat others, such as their relatives. They should learn a lesson from the tyrannical leaders of history who were greater in strength than them yet. A day certainly came when their strength did not benefit them, and they faced the consequences of their evil deeds. Social influence and strength are fickle things as they quickly pass from person to person thereby, never remaining with anyone for long. Therefore, a Muslim who possesses such strength should use it in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, by benefiting themselves and others. But if they abuse their authority, then they will eventually face a punishment which no one can protect them from. In addition, it is important not to abuse one's authority, as it may cause them to be hurled into hell on Judgment Day. Every oppressor will have to give their righteous deeds to their victims, and if necessary, take the sins of their victims until justice is established. This will cause many oppressors to be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should never forget to hold themselves accountable for their deeds. Those who do will avoid disobeying Allah, the Exalted, and harming others. But those who do not judge themselves will continue disobeying Allah, the Exalted, and harming others heedlessly, not knowing that in actual fact, they are only harming themselves. But when they realize this fact, it will be too late for them to escape punishment. Seeking the Hereafter after the Battle of Badr, some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, disputed over the spoils of war. As some of them collected it, others pursued the non-Muslim soldiers to ensure they did not return, and others remained guarding the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, from a surprise attack. This dispute led to Allah, the Exalted, entrusting all of it to his Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 8 Al-Anval, Verse 1 They ask you, Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, about the bounties of war. Say, the bounties is for Allah and the Messenger. So fear Allah, and amend that which is between you and obey Allah and his Messenger, if you should be believers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in turn, divided it up equally between the soldiers. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, Volume 4 page 253 and in Sirat ibn Hisham, page 134. Generally speaking, this verse encouraged the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to focus on sincerely obeying Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, instead of focusing on worldly gain. Though it is important to note, gaining spoils was always seen as a bonus for them, something they were not bothered about if they gained or lost it. Their intention was always to fight in order to please Allah, the Exalted. If they were only interested in spoils of war, it did not make sense to fight on the side of the Muslim army in any of their battles, as they were often outnumbered and outmatched in terms of power and weaponry. The dispute that arose was after the battle was concluded, and the bonus of gaining spoils was granted to them. 
It is important for Muslims to recognize why they worship Allah, the Exalted, as this reason can be a cause for an increase in obedience to Allah, the Exalted, or in some cases it can lead to disobedience. When one worships Allah, the Exalted, in order to gain lawful worldly things from him, they run the risk of becoming disobedient to him. This type of person has been mentioned in the Holy Quran. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11. And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good, he is reassured by it. But if he is struck by trial, he turns on his face to disobedience. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. As they obey Allah, the exalted, in order to receive worldly blessings the moment they fail to receive them or encounter a difficulty, they often become angered which turns them away from the obedience of Allah, the exalted. These people often obey and disobey Allah, the exalted, according to the situation they are facing, which in reality contradicts true servanthood to Allah, the exalted. Even though desiring lawful worldly things from Allah, the exalted, is acceptable in Islam yet, if one persists with this attitude, they may become like those mentioned in this verse. It is far better to worship Allah, the Exalted, in order to be saved in the hereafter and obtain paradise. This person is unlikely to alter their behavior when encountering difficulties. But the highest and best reason is to obey Allah, the Exalted, simply because He is their Lord and the Lord of the universe. This Muslim, if sincere, will remain steadfast in all situations, and through this obedience, they will be granted both worldly and religious blessings, which outstrip the worldly blessings the first type of person would ever receive. To conclude, it is important for Muslims to reflect on their intention, and if necessary, correct it, so that it encourages them to remain firm on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience in all situations. The Divine Decision Prior to leaving Mecca for the Battle of Badr, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca held onto the drapes of the House of Allah, the Exalted, the Kaaba, and pleaded to Allah, the Exalted, to grant victory to the group he favored. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verse 19. If you, disbelievers, seek the decision, i.e. victory, the decision, i.e. defeat, has come to you. And if you desist from hostilities, it is best for you. But if you return to war, we will return, and never will you be availed by your large company at all, even if it should increase, and that is, because Allah is with the believers. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, Volume 4, pages 281 to 282, and in Imam Wahidi's, Asbab al nuzal 819, page 82. Allah, the Exalted, fulfilled their plea and granted victory to the Muslims. Therefore, the non-Muslims of Mecca should have paid attention to this clear sign and sincerely repented to Allah, the Exalted. It is important for a Muslim to be observant in their daily life and avoid being too self-absorbed in their own worldly matters so that they become heedless over the things which are occurring around them and the things which have already occurred. This is an important quality to possess, as it is an excellent way to strengthen one's faith, which in turn helps one to remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted, at all times. For example, when a Muslim observes a sick person, they should not only aid them by whatever means they possess, even if it is only a supplication, but they should reflect on their own health, and understand that they too will eventually lose their good health, either by an illness, aging or even death. This should inspire them to be grateful for their good health, and show this through their actions by taking advantage of their good health in both worldly and religious matters which are pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. When they observe the death of a rich person, they should not only feel sad for the deceased and their family, but realize that one day, which is unknown to them, they will die also. They should understand that just like the rich person was abandoned by their wealth, fame and family at their grave, so will they too be left only with their deeds in their grave. This will encourage them to prepare for their grave and the hereafter. This attitude can and should be applied to all things one observes. A Muslim should learn a lesson from everything around them, which has been advised in the Holy Quran. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 191 And give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly, Exalted are you above such a thing, 
then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Those who behave in this manner will strengthen their faith on a daily basis, whereas those who are too self-absorbed in their worldly life will remain heedless, which may lead them to their destruction. A Merciful Act In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, consulted his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, on what to do with their prisoners of war. Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, advised to execute them for their many crimes and ACTS of war. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, disliked this suggestion. Then, Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, suggested to pardon them from execution and instead allow them to purchase their own freedom. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was pleased with this advice and acted on it. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 305. Throughout the Holy Quran and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Muslims have been advised to be merciful to others. For example, a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1924, advises that those who show mercy to the creation will be shown mercy by Allah, the Exalted. It is important to note that showing mercy is not only through one's actions, such as donating wealth to the poor. It in fact encompasses every aspect of one's life and interaction with others, such as one's words. This is why Allah, the Exalted, warns those who show mercy to others by donating charity that failing to show mercy through their speech, such as counting their favors done to others, only cancels their reward. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. True mercy is shown in everything, one's facial expression, one's glance and the tone of their speech. This was the full mercy shown by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and is therefore how Muslims must act. In addition, showing mercy is so important that Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear in the Holy Quran that even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, possessed countless beautiful and noble characteristics yet, the one which attracted the hearts of people towards him and Islam was mercy. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 159 so by mercy from Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. It clearly warns that without mercy, people would have fled from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If this was the case in respect to him, even though he possessed countless other beautiful characteristics, how can Muslims, who do not possess such noble characteristics, expect to have a positive impact on others, such as their children, without showing true mercy. Simply put, Muslims should treat others how they wish to be treated by Allah, the Exalted, and others, which is undoubtedly with true and full mercy. A just punishment. As Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, strive to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hiliyat al awliya number 64. In the second year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, consulted his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, on what to do with their prisoners of war. Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, advised to execute them for their many crimes and ACTS of war. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, disliked this suggestion. Then, Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, suggested to pardon them from execution and instead allow them to purchase their own freedom. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was pleased with this advice and acted on it. The next day, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, found the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, weeping. 
When he questioned their behavior, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commented that Allah, the Exalted, had shown him the punishment that would have afflicted them for taking ransom for the prisoners instead of executing them. Then Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verses 67 to 68. It is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. You, i.e., some Muslims desire the commodities of this world, but Allah desires for you the hereafter. And Allah is exalted in might and wise. If not for a decree from Allah that proceeded, you would have been touched for what you took by a great punishment. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 305 and in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4588. Executing the prisoners was a just punishment for their crimes and would have acted as a strong deterrent against the violent behavior of the non-Muslims of Mecca. This deterrent in the long run might have prevented further battles thereby saving lives. Showing gentleness. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, some prisoners of war were taken, including Suhail bin Amra, a non-Muslim leader. He was very vocal in opposing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his life in Mecca, and as a result Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, asked permission to punish him, so that it would prevent him from speaking against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that if he allowed the torturing of people, then Allah, the Exalted, would allow him to be tortured, even though he was his holy prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. He added that perhaps Suhail would one day stand up to do something which would prevent him, and others, from criticizing him. Suhail, may Allah be pleased with him, eventually accepted Islam, and after the death of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. When some Muslim tribes apostatized from Islam, he stood up in Mecca and urged them to hold fast to Islam and threatened them all if they apostatized. This was one of the main reasons why Mecca remained firm on Islam at that time. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1026 to 1027. The gentleness shown to Suhail, may Allah be pleased with him encouraged him to accept the truthfulness of Islam and remain firm on it. The beauty of Islam is found in gentleness. This has been advised by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in many narrations such as the one found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3689. The Holy Quran even mentions that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, constantly lovingly accompanied the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, because of his gentleness and soft nature. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 159 So by mercy from Allah you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. The Arabs were infamous for being harsh-hearted, but due to the Holy Prophet Muhammad's, peace and blessings be upon him, soft temperament their tough hearts melted, and thus they adopted this quality, and became beacons to guide the rest of mankind. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4809, that the one who is deprived of gentleness is deprived of good. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 103. And remember the favor of Allah upon you, when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became, by his favor, brothers. This is a clear message to those who desire to spread the word of Islam. They must possess a gentle constructive mindset, rather than a harsh destructive one. They should unite people and strive to benefit others, rather than spreading controversy within society. A good example of this is seen in one's attitude towards their children. The parents that showed a gentle nature towards their children had a greater positive impact on them than the parents who adopted a harsh temperament. Often some push people further away from Islam with their harsh attitude and this completely challenges the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. For example, once an uneducated Bedouin urinated in the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. 
When the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, desired to punish him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, forbade them, and gently explained to the Bedouin the etiquettes of being in a mosque. This incident is mentioned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 529. This soft approach affected the man in a positive way. This important characteristic is also mentioned in many places of the Holy Quran. For example, even though Pharaoh claimed to be the highest Lord yet Allah, the Exalted, commanded the Holy Prophet Mosa and the Holy Prophet Harun, peace be upon them both, to invite Pharaoh towards guidance using gentle and kind speech. Chapter 79 and Nazir, verse 24. And said, I am your most exalted Lord. And chapter 20 Taha, verses 43 to 44. Go both of you to Pharaoh. Indeed he has transgressed. And speak to him with gentle speech that perhaps he may be reminded or fear Allah. Children and even animals understand the language of gentleness. So how can an adult not be guided correctly? if one adopts this characteristic when inviting them towards Islam and good. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6601, that Allah, the Exalted, is kind and gentle according to his infinite dignity and likes the creation to act softly with each other. Unfortunately, many who spread the word of Islam have adopted the incorrect belief that being gentle is a sign of weakness. This is nothing but a ploy of the devil, as he desires to lead mankind away from Islam. Legacy of the Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, some prisoners of war were taken, including the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. The companions, including Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with them, criticized Abbas for his unbelief and addressed him in a harsh way. Abbas questioned why they all mentioned his bad deeds and not his good deeds. Then he went on to enumerate some of them, which included tending to the house of Allah, the exalted, the Kaaba, serving as the gatekeepers to it, and providing water for the pilgrims during the pilgrimage season. In this regard, Allah the Exalted revealed chapter 9 at Torba, verses 17 to 18. It is not for the polytheists to maintain the mosques of Allah while witnessing against themselves with disbelief. For those, their deeds have become worthless, and in the fire they will abide eternally. The mosques of Allah are only to be maintained by those who believe in Allah and the last day, and establish prayer and give zakah, and do not fear except Allah, for it is expected that those will be of the rightly guided. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al nuzul 917 pages 85 to 86. The leaders of the non-Muslims of Mecca would often boast that they were superior to all others, such as the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, as they, prior to the conquest of Mecca, were the custodians of the house of Allah, the exalted, in Mecca, the Kaaba. They would only serve the pilgrims to the house of Allah, the Exalted, in order to show off and gain the respect of people. This claim was rooted in the fact that they were the descendants of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, the one who built the house of Allah, the Exalted, and to whom the ACTS of the Holy Pilgrimage are originally attributed to. So in their eyes their custodianship was the legacy of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. But in these verses Allah, the Exalted, reminded the non-Muslim Arabs that as they chose to reject the clear truth of Islam, they were no longer fit to carry the legacy of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and it would instead be given to those who practically followed his way namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. If the non-Muslim Arabs remained firm on their disobedience, then they would not benefit from the legacy of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, in this world or the next. This therefore reminds Muslims of the very important position they have been appointed to by Allah, the Exalted, namely, the Ambassadors of Islam. It is extremely important for Muslims to fulfill this duty according to their potential. The best way to achieve this is by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, 
refraining from his prohibitions and being patient with his choices. Islam spread across the entire globe because the righteous predecessors took this duty very seriously. When they gained and acted on beneficial knowledge, the outside world recognized the truthfulness of Islam through their behavior. This caused countless people to enter the fold of Islam. Unfortunately, many Muslims today believe that showing others about Islam is merely in one's appearance, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf. This is only an aspect of representing Islam. The greatest part is by adopting the characteristics of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed in the Holy Quran and his traditions. Only with this attitude will the outside world observe the true nature of Islam. A Muslim should always remember that adopting an Islamic appearance while possessing characteristics which oppose the teachings of Islam only causes the outside world to disrespect Islam. They will be held accountable for this disrespect as they are the cause of it. A Muslim should therefore behave as a true ambassador of Islam by adopting the inward teachings of Islam as well as the outer appearance of Islam. In addition, this important position should remind Muslims that they will be held accountable and questioned whether they fulfilled this role or not on Judgment Day. The same way a king would become angry at their diplomat and representative if they failed to fulfill their duty, so will Allah, the Exalted, become angry with the Muslim who fails to fulfill their duty as an ambassador of Islam. Love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, some prisoners of war were taken, including the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, who later became Muslim. Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, encouraged Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, to accept Islam and commented, that him accepting Islam would please him more than if his own father accepted Islam, as this would greatly please the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 307 to 308. This was an indication of the sincerity Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, had for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 and indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 Al-Hash, verse 7. And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31. Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. Best Conduct In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina, in order to raid a caravan belonging to the non-Muslims of Mecca, which eventually unintentionally led to the Battle of Badr, he ordered his son-in-law Uthman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, to stay in Medina and nurse his wife, the daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Rukhaya, may Allah be pleased with her, as she was severely sick and eventually passed away from this sickness. On his return to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, a share of the war booty thereby, clearly indicating that he was considered a participant of the Battle of Badr. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 315. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2612, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who possesses complete faith is the one who is best in conduct and most kind to their family. Unfortunately, some have adopted the bad habit of treating non-relatives in a kind manner while mistreating their own family. They behave in this manner, as they do not understand the importance of treating one's own family kindly and as they fail to appreciate their family. A Muslim will never achieve success until they fulfill both aspects of faith. The first is fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The second is to fulfill the rights of people, which includes treating them kindly. None have more right to this kind treatment than one's own family. A Muslim must aid their family in all matters which are good, and warn them against bad things and practices in a gentle way, according to the teachings of Islam. They should not blindly support them in bad things simply because they are their relatives, neither should they fail to help them in good matters, because of some ill feelings towards them, as this contradicts Islamic teachings. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. The best way to guide others is through a practical example, as this is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, and is much more effective than just verbal guidance. Finally, one should generally choose gentleness in all matters especially when dealing with their family. Even if they commit sins they should be warned in a gentle manner and still be aided in matters which are good, as this kindness is more effective in bringing them back to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, than treating them harshly. Spreading News In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. He sent ahead two of his companions, Zayd bin Haritha and Abdullah bin Rawaha, may Allah be pleased with them, into Medina, in order to give the city the good news of victory. When they arrived in Medina, they began telling everyone what had occurred at Badr. Some hypocrites began to spread rumors in Medina that the Muslim army was defeated and the two companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were confused. This caused confusion and fear to spread within the city. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 316. It is important for Muslims to act on the following verse of the Holy Quran and not spread information to others, even if they believe they are benefiting others by doing so without verifying the information first. Meaning, they should ensure it comes from a reliable source and is accurate. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 6. O you who have believed, if there comes to you a disobedient one with information, investigate, lest you harm a people out of ignorance and become over what you have done regretful. Even though, this verse indicates a wicked person spreading news it can still apply to all people which share information with others. As mentioned in this verse a person may believe they are helping others, but by spreading unverified information they might harm others instead, such as emotional harm. Unfortunately, many Muslims are heedless to this and have a habit of simply forwarding information through text messages and social media applications without verifying it. In cases where the information is connected to religious matters, it is even more important to verify the information before spreading it. 
as one may get punished for the actions of others based on the incorrect information they provided them. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. In addition, with everything that is going on in the world and how it is affecting Muslims, it is even more important to verify information, as warning others over things which did not happen only creates distress in society and furthers the rift between Muslims and other communities. This contradicts Islamic teachings. A Muslim needs to understand that Allah, the Exalted, will not question why they did not share unverified information with others on Judgment Day. But he will certainly question them if they do share information with others, whether it is verified or not. Therefore, an intelligent Muslim will only share verified information and anything which is not verified, they will leave, knowing they will not be held accountable for it. Sublime Character in the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. He entrusted the prisoners of Badr to the companions, may Allah be pleased them, and commanded them to behave well towards them. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would give their best food to the prisoners namely, bread, and consume the lowest quality of food themselves namely, dates. They would also allow the prisoners to ride their mounts, while they themselves walked. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 319, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, page 1020. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2003, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the heaviest thing in the scales of Judgment Day will be good character. This includes showing good character towards Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. It also includes showing good character towards people. Unfortunately, many Muslims strive to fulfill the obligatory duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, but neglect the second aspect by mistreating others. They fail to understand its importance. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515, clearly advises that a person will not be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. Meaning, the same way a person desires to be treated kindly, they must also treat others with good character. Otherwise, they will not succeed, as the only truly successful people are the believers. In addition, a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their verbal and physical harm away from others and their possessions, irrespective of their faith. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3318, that a woman will enter hell because she mistreated a cat which led to its death. And another narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2550, advises that a man was forgiven because he fed a thirsty dog. If this is the outcome of showing good character and the consequences of showing evil character to animals, can one imagine the importance of showing good character towards Allah, the Exalted, and people? In fact, the main narration under discussion concludes by advising that the one who possesses good character will be rewarded like the Muslim who persistently worships Allah, the Exalted, and regularly fasts. Soft and Merciful Nature In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. One of the prisoners of Badr claimed he was very poor and did not have enough wealth to ransom himself. He appealed to the soft nature of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and asked him to set him free. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, showed mercy to him and fulfilled his request on the condition that he would not fight against Islam again. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 326 to 327. 
In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that Allah, the Exalted, will not show mercy to the one who does not show mercy to others. Islam is a very simple religion. One of its fundamental teachings is so simple that even uneducated people can understand and act on them namely, how people treat others is how they will be treated by Allah, the Exalted. For example, those who learn to overlook and forgive the mistakes of others will be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Those who support others in beneficial worldly and religious matters such as emotional or financial aid will be supported by Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4893. This same narration advises that the one who conceals the faults of others will have their faults concealed by Allah, the Exalted. Simply put, if one treats others with kindness and respect according to the teachings of Islam, they will be treated similarly by Allah, the Exalted. And those who mistreat others will be treated similarly by Allah, the Exalted, even if they fulfill the obligatory duties which are connected to him, such as the obligatory prayers. This is because a Muslim must fulfill both duties in order to achieve success, namely, the duties towards Allah, the Exalted, and people. Finally, it is important to note a Muslim will only be treated kindly by Allah, the Exalted, if they treat others kindly for his sake. If they do it for any other reason, then they will undoubtedly forfeit the reward mentioned in these teachings. The foundation of all ACTS and Islam itself is one's intention. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. Never trick twice. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. One of the prisoners of Badr claimed he was very poor and did not have enough wealth to ransom himself. He appealed to the soft nature of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and asked him to set him free. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, showed mercy to him and fulfilled his request on condition that he would not fight against Islam again. But after being released, he broke his promise and fought against Islam with the non-Muslims. He was captured again by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in another battle, the Battle of Ard. He requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to release him again, but he replied that a believer is not bitten from the same hole twice. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 326 to 327. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6133, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a believer does not get stung from the same hole twice. This means that a believer does not get fooled by something or someone twice. This includes committing sins. A true believer is not immune to committing sins. But when they happen to commit them, they do not repeat their mistake, and instead learn and change for the better by sincerely repenting to Allah, the Exalted. A true believer does not blindly trust people, thereby increasing the chances of being wronged by them. But if they are fooled by anyone, they should overlook and pardon, as this leads to their forgiveness. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? But they should also change their behavior by treading cautiously when dealing with this person, thereby ensuring they do not get fooled again. There is a vast difference between forgiving others and blindly trusting them especially after they have wronged someone. This narration applies to every aspect of one's life, as a true believer is the one who constantly learns from their experiences and knowledge in order to change for the better, so that they increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. No preferential treatment. 
In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, released some of the prisoners of Badr without a ransom, he however made sure the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, took a ransom for his own uncle, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. Even though the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, offered to release him for free, as he was the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In fact, Abbas had to pay more than anyone else for his freedom. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 345. Abul As, the non-Muslim son-in-law of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was also captured during the Battle of Badr. Abul Az's wife, Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her, sent her necklace to her father, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as ransom for her husband. The necklace belonged to her mother, and the first wife of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Khadija bint Kuwailid, may Allah be pleased with her. On seeing the necklace, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, became extremely emotional. Even in this state, he did not use his position of authority to influence the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, into releasing his son-in-law. They chose to release Abul Az and return the necklace back to Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 231. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this narration, that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better, and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, will act justly whether they desire to or not. Gaining better. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the Exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina. The uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, who was a prisoner of war, was forced to purchase his freedom. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed Chapter 8 Al-Anval, verses 70 to 71. O Prophet, say to whoever is in your hands of the captives, if Allah knows any good in your hearts, he will give you something better than what was taken from you, and he will forgive you, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. But if they intend to betray you, then they have already betrayed Allah before, and he empowered you over them. And Allah is knowing and wise. Later on Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, accepted Islam and was compensated for what he lost during the Battle of Badr with 20 or 40 according to another reference, servants, and he always hoped Allah, the Exalted, would also forgive him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1021 to 1022. Generally speaking, this incident indicates the importance of sincerely obeying and submitting to Allah, the Exalted, as this leads to good in both worlds, even if this is not obvious to a person. Those who disbelieve or avoid acting on their faith in Islam, do so out of love for the material world and the things within it. They believe that believing or acting on their faith 
will prevent them from enjoying worldly blessings meaning, for them, faith is something that restricts their desires, and therefore they turn away from it, either literally or practically. Instead they turn towards the material world and strive to fulfill their desires without restrictions believing that true peace lies in this. They look down at those who accept and actualize their faith by controlling their actions and using their worldly blessings in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. They believe that these pious Muslims are lowly slaves who been restricted from enjoying themselves, whereas they, the disbelievers and the misguided, are free. But in actual fact, this could not be further from the truth, as the real slaves are those who fail to accept and submit to Allah, the exalted, and the superior ones, are those who have done this, as they become free of slavery to the world. This can be understood by an example. A good parent will restrict the type of food their child eats meaning, they will only let them eat junk and unhealthy food once in a while, and instead force them to follow a healthy diet. This child therefore believes that their parent has placed undesirable restrictions on them, and that they have become slaves to their parent and their healthy diet. On the other hand, another child has been given permission from their parent to eat whatever they desire, whenever they desire, and how much they desire. So this child believes that they are completely free of all restrictions. When these children come together, the child who has been given complete freedom criticizes and looks down on the child who has been restricted by their parent. The latter child will also feel sorry for themselves when they observe the other child has been given free reign to behave however they wish. Outwardly it appears the child who has been granted freed has obtained happiness, whereas the other child is too tied up with restrictions to enjoy life. But years down the line the truth will become manifest. The child who had no restrictions grows up to become extremely unhealthy e.g. obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. As a result of this, they even become mentally unhealthy as they lose confidence in their body and the way they look. Because of this they become a slave of medications, diseases, mental and social problems. All these things restrict their happiness and life. Whereas, the child who was restricted by their parent grows up healthy in mind and body. As a result they become confident in their body and ability, which aids them to succeed in life. They become free of any slavery to medications, diseases, mental and social problems as they grew up with the correct balance and guidance. So the child who had no restrictions grew up becoming a slave to many things, whereas the child who had restrictions grew up independent of all restrictions. To conclude, the real slave is the one who becomes a slave to all other things except Allah, the exalted, such as social media, society, fashion and culture. And this leads to mental, physical and social problems, whereas the real free person is the one who submits only to Allah, the exalted, thereby achieving peace of mind and body. Importance of Education In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After Allah, the exalted, granted victory to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, headed back to Medina with some prisoners of war. Some of these prisoners had no ransom money available to free themselves, so the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had some of them work off their ransom by teaching the children of Medina how to write. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 345. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could have made these prisoners work off their ransom in different ways, such as physical labor e.g. farming, but he chose to use them in a more important way. This indicates the importance of education and knowledge. A great distraction which prevents one from submitting to the obedience of Allah, the exalted, is ignorance. It can be argued that it is the origin of every sin, as the one who truly knows the consequences of sins would never commit them. This refers to true beneficial knowledge, which is knowledge that is acted upon. In reality, all knowledge which is not acted on is not beneficial knowledge. The example of the one who behaves in this manner is described in the Holy Quran as a donkey which carries books of knowledge which do not benefit it. Chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act upon knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. A person who ACTS on their knowledge rarely slips up and commits sins intentionally. In fact, 
When this occurs, it is only caused by a moment of ignorance where a person forgets to act on their knowledge, which results in them sinning. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once highlighted the seriousness of ignorance in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2322. He declared that everything in the material world is cursed except for the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted, whatever is connected to this remembrance, the scholar and the student of knowledge. This means that all the blessings in the material world will become a curse for the one who is ignorant, as they will misuse them thereby committing sins. In fact, ignorance can be considered a person's worst enemy as it prevents them from protecting themselves from harm and gaining benefit, all of which can only be achieved through acting on knowledge. The ignorant commits sins without being aware of them. How can one avoid a sin if they do not know what is considered a sin? Ignorance causes one to neglect their obligatory duties. How can one fulfill their duties if they are unaware of what their duties are? It is therefore a duty on all Muslims to gain enough knowledge to fulfill all their obligatory duties and avoid sins. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224. How to win the non-Muslims of Mecca fell into great anxiety when they received news of the great loss they sustained and how many of their chiefs had been killed during the Battle of Badr. Abu Lahab excused himself from the battle and sent someone in his place and therefore escaped the massacre. After the defeated non-Muslim army returned to Mecca, Abu Lahab questioned one of the men about the events which took place during the battle. The man recounted how he saw strange men on horses who were destroying their army. Abu Ravai, the servant of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with them, was a Muslim at the time but concealed his faith. He overheard this conversation and exclaimed that these were angels. Abu Lahab then struck and beat Abu Ravai, may Allah be pleased with him. Um Fadl, the wife of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with them, was also a Muslim, struck Abu Lahab in the head with a tent pole. Abu Lahab then left the gathering. A few days later, he died of a grotesque illness where his body became covered with ulcers. No one approached his corpse for days out of fear of being infected with what he had. After his sons were criticized for leaving their father's corpse, they hired some men to drag his corpse to his gravesite and hurled stones on him from a distance until he was buried. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 227 and in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1032 to 1033. Two prisoners from the Battle of Badr, Nadab bin Harith and Uqbar ibn Abu Mu'ayt, were executed on the orders of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is because they went to great lengths to inflict severe harm on the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, while they were living in Mecca and were key influences within the Meccan society who encouraged the spread of corruption and evil. On one occasion, prior to the migration to Medina, Uqbar would have strangled the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to death if Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had not intervened. Their execution was also a strong deterrent and clear message to the enemies of Islam, that the Muslims were not afraid to defend themselves. This deterrent prevented many potential fights and attacks, which would have led to many lives being lost. Finally, it was clear from their past and present conduct that if they were ransomed, they would have continued to spread corruption and evil on a large scale. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 229. It is important for Muslims to understand a simple yet profound lesson, namely, they will never succeed in this world or the next in worldly or religious matters through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Since the dawn of time to this age and till the end of time no person has ever achieved true success, nor will they ever through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious when one turns the pages of history. Therefore, when a Muslim is in a situation which they desire to achieve a positive and successful outcome from, they should never choose to disobey Allah, the Exalted, irrespective of how tempting or easy it may seem to be. Even if one is advised by their close friends and relatives to do so, as there is no obedience to the creation if it means disobedience to the Creator. And in truth, 
they will never be able to protect them from Allah, the Exalted, and His punishment in either this world or the next. The same way Allah, the Exalted, grants success to those who obey Him, He removes a successful outcome from those who disobey Him, even if this removal takes time to witness. A Muslim should not be fooled, as this will occur sooner or later. The Holy Quran has made it extremely clear that an evil plan or action only encompasses the doer, even if this punishment is delayed. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Therefore, no matter how difficult the situation and choice, Muslims should always choose the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in both worldly and religious matters, as this alone will lead to true success in both worlds, even if this success is not obvious immediately. Second Chances After the Battle of Badr, Umayyah bin Wa'ab was sitting with Safwan bin Umayyah in the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. Umayyah was especially angry about the Battle of Badr, as his son was taken captive by the Muslims. Umayyah told Safwan that if it was not for his family in Mecca, who had no one to take care of them, he would go to Medina on a suicide mission to assassinate the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Safwan encouraged him to fulfill his evil plan and promised him that he would take of his family. Umayyah prepared his sword by dipping it into poison and headed for Medina. When he arrived in Medina, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, spotted him and was very familiar with his evil and foul nature. He physically escorted Umayyah to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to ensure no harm came to the latter. When they reached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he told Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to let Umayyah go and questioned him about his trip. Umayyah tried to be evasive and commented that he only came to ensure the prisoners of war were being treated with respect. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then informed him of his plan and the secret conversation he had with Safwan in Mecca. As no one else was listening to their conversation, Umayyah realized the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and accepted Islam, may Allah be pleased with him. Then he sought permission to return to Mecca in order to spread Islam and oppose polytheism, just like he opposed Islam prior to accepting it. When he was granted permission, he returned to Mecca and openly encouraged people to accept Islam and because of him many people accepted it. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 327 to 329. Umayyah, may Allah be pleased with him, took his second chance at accepting Islam instead of behaving stubbornly. Then he strived hard to spread Islam for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This indicates the importance of avoiding stubbornness in all aspects of life. Some adopt stubbornness in worldly matters, and as a result they do not change their character for the better. Instead, they remain steadfast on their attitude, believing this is somehow a sign of their great strength and wisdom. Steadfastness in matters of faith is a praiseworthy attitude, but in most worldly matters it is only called stubbornness, which is blameworthy. Unfortunately, some believe if they change their attitude it demonstrates weakness or it shows that they are admitting their fault and because of this they stubbornly fail to change for the better. Adults behave like immature children by believing that if they change their behavior it means they have lost while others who remain steadfast on their attitude have won. This is simply childish. In reality, an intelligent person will remain steadfast on matters of faith but in worldly matters they will change their attitude as long as it is not sinful in order to make their life easier. So changing to improve one's life is not a sign of weakness, it is in fact a sign of intelligence. In many cases, a person refuses to change their attitude and expects others in their life to change theirs, such as their relatives. But what often occurs is that due to stubbornness, all remain in the same state, which only leads to regular disagreements and arguments. A wise person understands that if the people around them do not change for the better than they should, this change will improve the quality of their life and their relationship with others, which is much better than going around in circular arguments with people. This positive attitude will eventually cause others to respect them, as it takes real strength to change one's character for the better. 
Those who remain stubborn will always find something to be annoyed about which will remove peace from their life. This will cause further difficulties in all aspects of their life, such as their mental health. But those who adapt and change for the better will always move from one station of peace to another. If one achieves this peace, does it really matter if others believe they only changed because they were wrong? To conclude, to remain steadfast on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is praiseworthy. But in worldly matters and in cases where no sin is committed, a person should learn to adapt and change their attitude so that they find some peace in this world. Two-Face Behavior The non-Muslim chief, Abu Sufyan, vowed to take revenge for the Battle of Badr. He headed to the outskirts of Medina with 200 men. He spent the night with Salam ibn Mishkam, the chief of the Jewish tribe, the Banu and Nadir. Salam hosted Abu Sufyan and reported all the information he had about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In the morning, Abu Sufyan and his men attacked the outskirts of Medina and managed to kill a companion from Medina, may Allah be pleased with him. When the news reached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he pursued Abu Sufyan with an army, but Abu Sufyan managed to escape. This has been discussed in Sirat ibn Hisham, page 138. The chief of the Jewish tribe, Salam, broke the agreement of peace he had with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by hosting Abu Sufyan and divulging the information he had gathered about the Muslims. Many of these non-Muslim tribes in and around Medina behaved in this manner out of enmity for Islam. A sign of hypocrisy is being two-faced. This is the one who changes their behavior in order to please different groups of people, intending thereby to gain some worldly things. They speak with many different tongues, showing their support to different people, while harboring dislike for them. They fail to be sincere towards people, which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. If they fail to repent, they will find themselves in the hereafter with two tongues of fire. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4873. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 14. When they meet the believers, they say, we believe. But when they meet their evil companions in privacy, they say, surely we are with you, we were merely jesting. Being upright. After the battle of Badr was over Zainab, may Allah be pleased with him. The daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in the face of great difficulties, migrated to her father in Medina. At the time her husband, Abul Az, was still a non-Muslim who allowed her to migrate, as this was one of the conditions stipulated in his release when he was captured as a prisoner of war during the Battle of Badr. After her migration, he left for Syria on a trading journey. On his way back, he was ambushed and robbed of all the wealth he had, most of it belonging to the non-Muslims of Mecca, who sent him to trade on their behalf. He managed to escape and reach Medina, where he sought protection from his wife, Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her. She granted him protection, and in turn, so did the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, also requested the people who raided his trading caravan to return the goods, as they had a peace pact between them, and they agreed. Abul Az returned to Mecca with his trading goods and returned all the wealth to their owners. Once he finished doing this, he declared his Islam and commented that he waited until he returned the goods of the non-Muslims of Mecca, before declaring his Islam, as he did not desire them to believe that he only accepted Islam in order to keep their wealth. Then he migrated to Medina and lived with his wife, may Allah be pleased with both of them. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 350. Abul Az, may Allah be pleased with him, could have kept the wealth he was entrusted with and remained in Medina, but he instead remained upright and concluded his business deal as agreed. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2146, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that merchants will be raised as a moral people on judgment day, except those who fear Allah, the exalted, act righteously and speak the truth. This narration applies to all those who take part in business transactions. It is extremely important to fear Allah, the exalted, 
by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This includes treating others kindly according to the teachings of Islam. In respect to business dealings, a Muslim should be honest in their speech by disclosing all the details of the transaction to all who are involved. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2079, warns that when Muslims hide things in financial transactions, such as defects in their goods, it will lead to a loss in blessings. Acting righteously includes not striving to con others by making them pay excessively for goods. A Muslim should simply treat others how they desire to be treated meaning, with honesty and full disclosure. The same way, a Muslim would not like to be mistreated in financial matters, they should not mistreat others. Those conducting business should always avoid lying, as it leads to immorality, and immortality leads to hell. In fact, a person will keep telling and acting on lies until they are recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971. Breaking Bonds Shahs bin Qais, a jealous elderly non-Muslim living in Medina, once passed a gathering of the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them. The companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, were originally from two main tribes, the Oz and Khazraj. These two tribes had been warring with each other for generations, and only became united when they accepted Islam. When Shahs observed the great love and affection the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, had for each other, even though a few years earlier to that they were sworn enemies, his hatred for Islam intensified. He encouraged a young poet to speak some words about an old battle that occurred between the two tribes of Oz and Khazraj, where many of their prominent leaders were killed. This poetry incited the ancient old negative feelings that had been buried away by Islam, thereby causing some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to argue with each other. Before any fighting took place, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed of what occurred and he made his way to them and reminded them of the new era they had moved into. A new era away from ignorant practices and senseless violence in the name of tribal loyalty. These negative feelings were quickly extinguished by these prophetic words until the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, corrected their attitude and behavior towards each other and returned to their brotherly love for one another. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 236 to 237. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 100. O oh, you who have believed, if you obey a party of those who were given the scripture, they would turn you back after your belief to being unbelievers. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al-Nuzal 3 to 100 page 38. Generally speaking, a Muslim must avoid speaking negatively about others as this creates negative feelings in the hearts of people. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood number 4860, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned people against speaking negatively about others as this causes ill feelings towards them in people's hearts. It is often observed that families especially, from the Asian community, become broken over time. This is one of the biggest complaints family members, such as parents often have. They wonder why their children have become separated, even though they were once firmly together. One of the main reasons the relationships between relatives become fractured is because someone has spoken negatively about a person's relative to them. This is often done by a family member. For example, a mother will speak negatively about her son to her other child. This leads to enmity between the two relatives and over time it builds up and creates a wedge between the two. Those who were once like one person become like strangers to one another. It is important to understand that people are not angels. Except for a very few, when a negative thing is said to a person about another, they will get affected by it, even if they do not desire this to occur. This enmity still occurs, even if the initial person who spoke negatively about someone's relative does not intend to create a wedge between relatives. Some often act in this way out of habit and are not trying to damage relationships. For example, Parents often adopt this habit, and there is no doubt they do not desire the relationships of their children to become fractured or broken. 
This attitude has such a serious impact on people's mentality that it also affects relatives that very rarely see or converse with each other. For example, a person will mention negative things about a person's relative to them, even though their relative may not even live in the same country as them. This behavior implants enmity within their heart, and with the passing of time, they will find that they dislike their distant relative, even though they barely know them. This issue often occurs when two people discuss negative things about others in front of other people. For example, parents may discuss negative things about their relatives in front of their children. Even though they are not telling their children directly, nonetheless, it still affects their hearts. If one truly reflected for a moment, they will realize that the majority of the ill feelings they have towards others were not caused by what that person did or said to them directly. In most cases, it occurred because of a third party who mentioned something negative about that person to them. In cases where one is trying to warn another of some danger, then it is perfectly acceptable to mention another person in a negative way. If one is trying to teach another person a lesson, for example, if a mother desires to teach one of her children not to behave as their sibling did, they then should follow the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and mention the negative thing without naming the person. An example of this beautiful mentality is discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6979. Mentioning a negative thing without naming the person is good enough to teach someone a lesson. To conclude, Muslims should ponder deeply before speaking negatively about their relatives or others, privately or publicly. Otherwise, they may well find as time passes, their family becomes separated and emotionally distant from one another. A wise proposal. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, proposed marriage to the daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her. This was agreed and the marriage took place. Her dowry was a chain mail armor worth a paltry sum of four silver coins. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 368. The first thing to note is that the dowry was a paltry sum. This indicates the importance of keeping marriages simple and cost-effective, something which many Muslims today easily overlook. In addition, Muslims must strive to acquire the correct spouse by choosing one based on the teachings of Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5090, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person is married for four reasons, their wealth, lineage, beauty, or for their piety. He concluded by warning that a person should marry for the sake of piety, otherwise they will be loser. It is important to understand that the first three things mentioned in this narration are very transient and imperfect. They may give someone temporary happiness, but ultimately these things will become a burden for them as they are linked to the material world and not to the thing which grants ultimate and permanent success, namely, faith. One only needs to observe the rich and famous in order to understand that wealth does not bring happiness. In fact, the rich are the most unsatisfied and unhappy people on earth. Marrying someone for the sake of their lineage is foolish, as it does not guarantee the person will make a good spouse. In fact, if the marriage does not work out it destroys the family bond the two families possessed before the marriage. Marrying only for the sake of beauty meaning, love is not wise, as this is a fickle emotion which changes with the passing of time and with one's mood. How many couples, supposedly drowned in love, ended up hating each other? But it is important to note, that this narration does not mean one should find a spouse who is poor, as it is important to get married to someone who can financially support a family. Neither does it mean one should not be attracted to their spouse, as this is an important aspect of a healthy marriage. But this narration means that these things should not be the main or ultimate reason someone gets married. The main and ultimate quality a Muslim should look for in a spouse is piety. This is when a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience. Put simply, the one who fears Allah, the Exalted, will treat their spouse well in both times of happiness and difficulty. On the other hand, 
Those who are irreligious will mistreat their spouse whenever they are upset. This is one of the main reasons why domestic violence has increased amongst Muslims in recent years. Finally, if a Muslim desires to get married, they should firstly obtain the knowledge associated with it, such as the rights they owe their spouse, the rights they are owed from their spouse, and how to correctly deal with one's spouse in different situations. Unfortunately, ignorance of this leads to many arguments and divorces as people demand things which their spouse is not obliged to fulfill. Knowledge is the foundation of a healthy and successful marriage. Simple Living Ali ibn Abu Talib and his wife Fatima, may Allah pleased with them, led an extremely simple life, just like the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. They gave priority to preparing for the hereafter and helping others over enjoying worldly luxuries. For example, he once said that he possessed no furniture in his home except for a ram skin on which they slept. Both of them worked for a living and struggled to fulfill the basic necessities of life. Once, when some prisoners of war were brought to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they requested him to give them a servant to help them with their chores. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, refused as he desired to sell the prisoners and spend the price on the poor of Medina. He gave priority to others over his own family. Later that night, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, taught both of them a spiritual exercise to read before going to bed and commented that this spiritual exercise was better than obtaining a servant. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 147 to 149. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4118, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that simplicity is a part of faith. Islam does not teach Muslims to give up all their wealth and lawful desires, but it instead teaches them to adopt a simple lifestyle in all aspects of their life, such as their food, clothing, housing and business, so that it provides them free time to prepare for the hereafter adequately. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This simple life includes striving in this world in order to fulfill one's needs and the needs of their dependents without excessiveness, waste or extravagance. A Muslim should understand that the simpler life they lead, the less they will stress over worldly things and therefore the more they will be able to strive for the hereafter thereby, obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. But the more complicated a person's life is, the more they will stress, encounter difficulties and strive less for their hereafter as their preoccupations with worldly things will never seem to end. This attitude will prevent them from obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. Simplicity leads to a life of ease in this world and a straightforward accounting on the day of judgment. Whereas, a complicated and indulgent life will only lead to a stressful life and a severe and difficult accounting on the day of judgment. The third year after migration. Being trustworthy. Whenever the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed from Medina, he always appointed someone trustworthy in charge to manage its affairs until he returned. For example, in the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he left for an expedition known as Du Amar and appointed Uthman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, in charge of Medina. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, Page 1. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that betraying trusts is an aspect of hypocrisy. This includes all the trusts one possesses from Allah, the Exalted, and people. Every blessing one possesses has been entrusted to them by Allah, the Exalted. The only way to fulfill these trusts is by using the blessings in the way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This will ensure they gain further blessings, as this is true gratitude. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. The trusts between people are important to fulfill also. The one who has been entrusted with someone else's belongings, should not misuse them and only use them according to the wishes of the owner. 
One of the greatest trusts between people is keeping conversations secret unless there is some obvious benefit in informing others. Unfortunately, this is often overlooked amongst Muslims. Taking Revenge In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he left for an expedition. During this expedition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, took a nap under a tree. The non-Muslim army took this opportunity by stealthily sending a soldier to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with the intention to assassinate him. He startled the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and while brandishing his sword asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who would protect him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, confidently replied that Allah, the exalted, would. The angel Jibril, peace be upon him, then pushed the man to the ground. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, picked up his sword and asked the same question the Solida asked him. The Solida pleaded with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to release him and he did so without punishing him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 1 to 2. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself, but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190. Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the Exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. Nobility in Islam Whenever the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed from Medina, he always appointed someone trustworthy in charge to manage its affairs until he returned. For example, in the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he left for an expedition to a place called Buran and appointed a blind and poor companion, Ibn Am Maktam, may Allah be pleased with him, in charge of Medina. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, Page 2. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others based on these groups, Islam, declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the Exalted, and following in their footsteps. 
Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. True Loyalty in the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a Jewish tribe, the Banu Kanuka, who were living in Medina, persistently broke their pact of peace and fought against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. They behaved in this manner, even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, repeatedly reminded them of the fact that they recognized him as the last Prophet of Allah, the Exalted, as he was described in their divine scriptures. But they stubbornly rejected Islam and instead threatened and fought against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Due to worldly benefits, the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, who had allied with the Banu Kenuka before the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to Medina, insisted that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, avoid harming them and he stayed loyal to them, even though they broke their pact with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Whereas a companion, Ubada bin Samad, may Allah be pleased with him, who also had an old alliance with Banu Kenuka, openly renounced his alliance with them, and instead reaffirmed his alliance with Allah, the Exalted, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed Chapter 5 al maidah verse 51. O you who have believed, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are, in fact, allies of one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. Indeed, Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. And chapter 5 al maidah verse 56. And whoever is an ally of Allah and his messenger and those who have believed, indeed the party of Allah, they will be the predominant. As a result of the intercession of Abdullah bin Ubay, the chief of the hypocrites, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, allowed the non-Muslim tribe, the Banu Kenuka, to leave Medina peacefully after he besieged them, and they surrendered without fighting, even after they repeatedly betrayed their pact of peace with the Muslims. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 3 to 4. One must follow in the footsteps of Ubada bin Samad, May Allah be pleased with him, by maintaining their loyalty to Islam and the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, under all occasions. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away, and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. 
those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. Bad advice. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a Jewish scholar and an aggressive enemy of Islam, Qayb bin Ashraf, visited Mecca in order to incite them further against Islam. A non-Muslim leader of Mecca asked him who was more rightly guided and favored by Allah, the exalted, the idol worshippers of Mecca or the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and Islam. Qayb replied that the idol worshippers of Mecca were more rightly guided. This was a foolish answer as being a Jewish scholar, he very well knew that idol worshipping was far from right guidance. On this occasion Allah the Exalted revealed chapter 4 and Nisa verse 51. Have you not seen those who were given a portion of the scripture, who believe in JIBT superstition and Taghut, false objects of worship, and say about the disbelievers, these are better guided than the believers as to the way? This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, Page 7. Muslims should note that a major sign of true love is when one directs their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is because obedience leads to success and safety in both this world and in the hereafter. A person who does not desire safety and success for a person can never truly love them irrespective of what they claim or how they treat the other person. The same way a person becomes happy when their beloved obtains worldly success, like a job, they will also desire their beloved to obtain success in the hereafter. If a person does not care about another obtaining safety and success especially in the next world, then they do not love them. A true lover could not bear knowing and seeing their beloved facing difficulties and punishment in this world or in the next. This is only avoidable through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, they would always direct their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. If a person directs another towards their own selfish interest or the interest of others instead of the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. This applies to all relationships such as friendships and relatives. Therefore, a Muslim should assess whether those in their life direct them towards Allah, the Exalted or not. If they do, then it is a clear sign of their love for them. If they do not, then it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Punishment for treason. In the third year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a Jewish scholar and an aggressive enemy of Islam, Qayb bin Ashraf repeatedly broke his pact of peace with the head of state, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He continued to incite the non-Muslims of Mecca, Medina and surrounding areas against the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. As a result of his many ACTS of treason, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave the order for his execution. Muhammad bin Maslama, may Allah be pleased with him, held a secret meeting with Kaib during the night and killed him. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 5 to 6, and in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4037. It is important to learn that no matter how much physical or social strength a person has, a day will certainly come when they face the consequences of their actions. In most cases, 
This occurs during their life where the actions of a person leads them to trouble, such as prison, and eventually they will face the consequences of their actions in the hereafter as well. This applies to all people, not just leaders. A Muslim should therefore never mistreat others, such as their relatives. They should learn a lesson from the tyrannical leaders of history who were greater in strength than them yet. A day certainly came when their strength did not benefit them and they faced the consequences of their evil deeds. Social influence and strength are fickle things as they quickly pass from person to person thereby, never remaining with anyone for long. Therefore, a Muslim who possesses such strength should use it in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the exalted, by benefiting themselves and others. But if they abuse their authority, then they will eventually face a punishment which no one can protect them from. In addition, it is important not to abuse one's authority as it may cause them to be hurled into hell on judgment day. Every oppressor will have to give their righteous deeds to their victims and if necessary take the sins of their victims until justice is established. This will cause many oppressors to be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should never forget to hold themselves accountable for their deeds. Those who do will avoid disobeying Allah, the exalted, and harming others. But those who do not judge themselves will continue disobeying Allah, the exalted, and harming others heedlessly, not knowing that in actual fact they are only harming themselves. But when they realize this fact, it will be too late for them to escape punishment. Keeping conversations private. When the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab, Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with them, became a widow, he discussed a possible marriage proposal with Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. The latter respectively declined the offer, as he was not in the right position to get married. Umar then discussed a marriage proposal with Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, who did not give an immediate response. Later on, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, proposed to and married Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her. Abu Bakr then explained to Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, that he did not initially reply, as he was aware that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated a desire to marry her. Instead of divulging this information, he decided to guard their private conversation and therefore did not reply to him immediately. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3261. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1959, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated that private conversations are a trust which must be protected. Unfortunately, many have the bad habit of divulging the private conversations of people to others. This is an incredibly bad characteristic to possess as it contradicts the attitude of a true Muslim. Many do this with their close relatives believing it is acceptable when it is clearly not. A Muslim should always keep the words spoken in a conversation secret unless they are fully sure the person they conversed with would not mind the information being mentioned to a third party. If they would, then doing this betrays them which contradicts being sincere to them. Being sincere to others has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. It is important to act on the main narration, as it prevents sins such as backbiting and gossiping, and prevents negative feelings being developed for each other. These all only lead to fractured and broken relationships. If one honestly reflects on their life, they will realize that the majority of the people they have felt negative feelings towards occurred because of what they were told about them, not what they directly witnessed about them. Divulging private conversations prevents unity amongst people, especially relatives. And unity has been commanded in many teachings of Islam, such as the one declared in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6065. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 58. Indeed, Allah commands you to render trusts to whom they are due. What goes around comes around. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca sent a trading caravan with 100,000 silver coins towards Syria. But as the Muslims were ambushing their trade caravans, they decided to go through a different route, across Najd to Iraq. 
But this information was leaked to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who dispatched Zayed bin Haritha with 100 horsemen, may Allah be pleased with them, to capture the caravan. They managed to overpower the men escorting the trading caravan, and as a result the non-Muslims fled, and the Muslims captured the wealth, and three prisoners of war, one of which ended up accepting Islam a short while after. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 243 to 244. The same way, years earlier, prior to migrating to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were subjected to a social boycott in Mecca, whereby their wealth and food supplies were completely cut off. Allah, the Exalted, subjected the non-Muslims of Mecca to a similar situation whereby their trading routes were cut off by the Muslims. One should never plot to do an evil thing, as it will always, one way or another, backfire on them. Even if these consequences are delayed to the next world, they will face them eventually. For example, the brothers of the Holy Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, desired to harm him as they desired the love, respect and affection of their father, the Holy Prophet Yaqub, peace be upon him. But it is clear that their scheming only put them further away from their desire. Chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 18 And they brought upon his shirt false blood. Jacob said, Rather your souls have enticed you to something, so patience is most fitting. The more one plots evil, the more Allah, the exalted, will put them further from their goal. Even if they outwardly achieve their desire, Allah, the exalted, will cause the very thing they desire to become a curse for them in both worlds unless they sincerely repent. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they await except the way, i.e., fate of the former peoples. An evil conversation. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca gathered with the non-Muslims who had lost their relatives at the Battle of Badr. They declared that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had caused them great harm and killed their elite and relatives. They urged them to financially and physically support them in taking revenge. The thirst for revenge and their ongoing financial troubles caused by the Muslims raiding their trading caravans urged them to fight when it should have urged them to become humble and accept the truth. They all pledged their allegiance to this evil campaign which eventually led to the Battle of Ard. On this occasion Allah the Exalted revealed Chapter 8 Al-Anval verse 36. Indeed, those who disbelieve spend their wealth to avert people from the way of Allah. So they will spend it then it will be for them a source of regret, then they will be overcome. And those who have disbelieved, unto hell they will be gathered. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 12. This incident is connected to Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 114. No good is there in much of their private conversation, except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right or conciliation between people. And whoever does that seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. In this verse Allah, the Exalted, explains how people should conduct themselves when conversing with others, so that they derive benefit for themselves and others. The first is that when Muslims gather, they should discuss how to benefit others, which encompasses charity in the form of wealth and physical aid. If a Muslim is not in a position to help a needy person, then this is an excellent way of gaining reward equal to actually helping them. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6800, advises that the one who inspires someone else towards good will be rewarded as if they performed the good action themselves. If one cannot aid someone in difficulty or inspire another to fulfill this task, they can at least encourage others to supplicate for the one in need. Supplication for an absent person causes the angels to pray for the supplicator. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1534. This mentality can inspire the group to visit the needy person which provides them with emotional support. This has a powerful psychological impact and provides them with a new mode of strength when dealing with their hardship. The important thing to note is that when one mentions the situation of a needy person, their intention must be to aid them in their hour of need.
It should never be for the sake of passing time and making them a target of ridicule. The second way to gain blessings is when one converses about anything lawful that will provide benefit to someone in this world or the next. This aspect includes advising others to do good and refrain from evil in every aspect of their life. The third aspect mentioned in this verse involves conversing with others with a constructive mindset which brings people together in a positive way instead of possessing a destructive mindset which causes divisions within society. If a person cannot bring people together in a loving way, then the minimum they can do is not cause divisions amongst them. Even this is recorded as a good deed when done for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2518. In fact, a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4919, advises that reconciling between two opposing Muslims for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, is superior to voluntary prayer and fasting. Every good thing found within society was the outcome of this pious attitude, such as the construction of schools, hospitals and mosques. But it is important to note that a Muslim will only obtain the great reward mentioned in this verse when they perform the righteous deeds for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. Each person will be rewarded based on their intention, not just their physical action. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The insincere Muslim will find that on judgment day, they will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for, which will not be possible. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. Being grateful to people. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, released a non-Muslim prisoner of war after the Battle of Badr, Abu Azza al-Jumahi, as he was poor and could not afford his ransom. A non-Muslim leader urged Abu Azza to aid them by encouraging a non-Muslim tribe to join their campaign. Even though he admitted that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was kind to him, and he did not desire to oppose him, eventually, he was convinced to join the campaign against Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 12 to 13. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1954, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever is not grateful to people cannot be grateful to Allah, the Exalted. Even though there is no doubt that the source of all blessings is none other than Allah, the Exalted, nonetheless showing gratitude to people is an important aspect of Islam. This is because Allah, the Exalted, sometimes uses a person as a means to help others such as one's parents. As the means has been created and used by Allah, the Exalted, being grateful to them is in fact being grateful to Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, Muslims must show good character and always show appreciation for any aid or support they receive from others irrespective of its size. They should show gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, by using the blessing according to His commands, as He is the source of the blessing, and show gratitude to the person, as they are the means which was created and chosen by Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should show gratitude verbally to people and practically by repaying their act of kindness according to their means, even if it is only a supplication on their behalf. This has been advised in a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 216. The person who does not show gratitude to people cannot show true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, and therefore they will not be given an increase in blessings. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. If a Muslim desires an increase in blessings, they must fulfill both aspects of gratitude, namely, to Allah, the Exalted, and to people. Guarding Conversations In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. The news reached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through his uncle, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, who was in Mecca at the time. 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, held a secret meeting with the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and sought their advice. Before the meeting ended, he told them to keep the information secret, lest the enemies of Islam within Medina find out and tip off the non-Muslims of Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1098 to 1100. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1959, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated that private conversations are a trust which must be protected. Unfortunately, many have the bad habit of divulging the private conversations of people to others. This is an incredibly bad characteristic to possess, as it contradicts the attitude of a true Muslim. Many do this with their close relatives believing it is acceptable, when it is clearly not. A Muslim should always keep the words spoken in a conversation secret, unless they are fully sure the person they conversed with would not mind the information being mentioned to a third party. If they would, then doing this betrays them, which contradicts being sincere to them. Being sincere to others has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. It is important to act on the main narration, as it prevents sins such as backbiting and gossiping, and prevents negative feelings being developed for each other. These all only lead to fractured and broken relationships. If one honestly reflects on their life, they will realize that the majority of the people they have felt negative feelings towards occurred because of what they were told about them, not what they directly witnessed about them. Divulging private conversations prevents unity amongst people, especially relatives. And unity has been commanded in many teachings of Islam, such as the one declared in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6065. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 58. Indeed, Allah commands you to render trusts to whom they are due. Asking for advice. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. When the non-Muslim army reached close to Ard, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had a dream which suggested that the Muslim army should remain in Medina and confront the enemy within the city. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, informed his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, about his dream and asked for their advice. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 14. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the most knowledgeable and was divinely guided, yet he sought counsel from others in order to establish a good practice for others. Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Desiring Peace In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr which occurred in the previous year. When the non-Muslim army reached close to Ard, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had a dream which suggested that the Muslim army should remain in Medina and confront the enemy within the city. The leader of the hypocrites, 
Abdullah bin Ubay, agreed with this plan as he did not desire to confront the army. But the young companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who had not witnessed the Battle of Badr, kept urging him to march forward and meet the non-Muslim army in Ard, which he eventually agreed to. After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, put on his battle armor, the young companions, may Allah be pleased with them, realized their error and advised the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to revert back to his initial suggestion meaning, confront the non-Muslim army within Medina. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that it was not proper for a Holy Prophet, peace be upon them, to take off his battle armor without confronting the enemies of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 14. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not change the decision, even though his dream indicated that staying in Medina was preferred, as he wanted to set a good example for all leaders till the end of time. A good leader does not behave in a fickle manner by changing their commands without a valid reason, such as obtaining new information regarding the enemy. Behaving in this manner would only cause the soldiers to lose confidence in their leader, something extremely dangerous during a time of war. Therefore, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, remained firm on his command to march out to Ard. In addition, even though a Muslim should always be ready to defend Islam, themselves, their relatives, the innocent and their properties, yet, they should not be so eager for confrontation. Instead, they should prefer peace and safety. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2346, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever wakes up in the morning safe from danger, healthy and having food for the day, is as if the world was gathered for them. In this day and age where many people around the world are living in unsafe countries, a Muslim who has been blessed with safety should make use of it by using their freedom to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. For example, they should take advantage of journeying to the mosques for the congregational prayers and religious gatherings of knowledge. In addition, Muslims should extend this sense of security to others irrespective of their faith so that the whole society becomes secure from danger. In fact, according to a narration found in Sunan and nasai number 4998, a person cannot be a true Muslim or believer until they keep their verbal and physical harm away from the self and possessions of others. Simply put, a Muslim should treat others in the same way they desire to be treated by people. A Muslim must take advantage of their good health by obeying Allah, the Exalted, as it is a blessing which is often only truly appreciated until it is lost. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6412. Those who make good use of their good health by obeying Allah, the Exalted, will find that they will receive His support when they eventually lose their good health. But those who fail to make use of this blessing are unlikely to receive this support. It is important to note, making use of one's health includes striving in this material world in order to fulfill one's needs and the needs of their dependents. One of the major concerns of a person is their provision. A Muslim should remember that it was allocated to them over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. The one who obtains their daily provision should concern themselves with their other duties and plan for tomorrow without stressing as their provision is guaranteed. Using means and trusting in Allah, the Exalted. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, wore two sets of armor during this battle, one suit of chainmail armor above the other. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 19. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, adopted both aspects of trusting in Allah, the Exalted. The first is using the means one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. 
The other is believing that the outcome, which Allah, the Exalted, alone decides, will be best for everyone involved. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2344, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that if people truly trusted Allah, the Exalted, he would provide for them just like he provides for birds. They leave their nests hungry in the morning and return in the evening satisfied. Truly trusting in Allah, the Exalted, is something which is felt in the heart but is proven through the limbs meaning, when one sincerely obeys Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Chapter 65 at Talak verse 3 And whoever relies upon Allah, then he is sufficient for him. The aspect of trust which is internal involves firmly believing that only Allah, the Exalted, can provide one with beneficial things and protect them from harmful things both in worldly and religious matters. A Muslim understands that no one except Allah, the Exalted, can give, withhold, harm or benefit someone. It is important to note that truly trusting in Allah, the Exalted, does not mean one should abandon using the means which Allah, the Exalted, has provided, such as medicine. As the main narration under discussion clearly mentions that the birds leave their nests actively searching for provision. When one uses the strength and means provided by Allah, the Exalted, according to the teachings of Islam, they are undoubtedly obeying Him. This is in fact, the outward element of trusting in Allah, the Exalted. This has been made clear in many verses and narrations. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 71. O oh, you who have believed, take your precaution. In reality, the outward activity is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and trusting Allah, the Exalted, inwardly is the inward state of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One should not abandon the outward tradition, even if they possess the inward state of trust. Actions and using the means provided by Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of trusting him. In this respect, actions can be split into three categories. The first are those actions of obedience which Allah, the Exalted, commands Muslims to do so that they can avoid hell and obtain paradise. Abandoning these while claiming trust that Allah, the Exalted, will forgive them is simply wishful thinking and is therefore blameworthy. The second type of actions are those means which Allah, the Exalted, has created in this world in order for people to live in it safely, such as eating when hungry, drinking when thirsty and wearing warm clothes in cold weather. A person who abandons these and causes harm to themselves is blameworthy. However, there are some people who have been provided special strength by Allah, the Exalted, so that they can avoid these means without harming themselves. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, used to fast for days on end uninterrupted but forbade others from doing the same as Allah, the Exalted, provided for him directly without the need for food. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1922. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, prayed for the fourth rightly guided Caliph Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, so that he would not feel excess cold or heat. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 117. Therefore, if a person turns away from these means but is provided with the strength to endure without failing in their duties to Allah, the Exalted, and people, then it is acceptable otherwise it is blameworthy. The third type of actions in respect to trusting in Allah, the Exalted, are those things which have been set as a customary practice which Allah, the Exalted, sometimes breaks for certain people. An example of this are the people who become cured of illnesses without the need of medicine. This is quite common, especially in poorer countries where medicine is difficult to obtain. This is linked to a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2144, which advises that no person will die until they utilize every ounce of their provision which was allocated to them which according to another narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748, was over 50,000 years before Allah, the Exalted, created the heavens and the earth. So the one who truly realizes this narration might not seek provision actively, knowing that what was allocated to them so long ago cannot miss them. So for this person, the customary means of obtaining provision, such as obtaining it through a job, is broken by Allah, the Exalted. This is a high and rare rank. 
Only the one who can behave in such a manner, without complaining or panicking, nor expecting things from people, is free of blame if they choose this path. It is important to note that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1692, that it is a sin for a person to fail in providing for their dependents, even though they may be on this high rank. Having real trust in Allah, the Exalted, leads to being content with destiny. Meaning, whatever Allah, the Exalted, chooses for them, they accept without complaint and without desiring things to change, as they firmly trust that Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. To conclude, it is best to follow the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by using the lawful means one has been granted firmly believing they are from Allah, the Exalted, and trust internally that only what Allah, the Exalted, decides will occur, which is undoubtedly the best choice for each person whether they observe this or not. Choosing Suitable Companions In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina in order to confront the enemies at Ard, he encountered a battalion who were marching to join the Muslims in battle. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed that they were non-Muslims from Medina, who were allies of the companions of Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, and had come to support the Muslims in this battle, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questioned whether they had accepted Islam. When he was told they remained firm on their faith, he rejected their assistance and stated that he would not take the aid of disbelievers against the polytheists of Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 249. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was heavily outnumbered, an initial ratio of 3 to 1 which became 4 to 1 before the battle commenced, he still refused to seek aid from disbelievers as he fulfilled the two aspects of trusting in Allah, the Exalted. The first is to use the means Allah, the Exalted, provided, which he did by organizing the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to fight. And the second was to believe that whatever Allah, the Exalted, decides is best for everyone involved, a belief he always possessed to the highest level. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was well aware of the constant plotting and scheming of the non-Muslims of Medina against Islam. Even though they had signed peace treaties with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If he then allowed them to join his army, they may have turned on the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, during the battle, which would have led to a major disaster for them. Therefore, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, refused to accept their assistance during the battle. Generally speaking, this indicates the importance of avoiding bad companionship. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5534, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the difference between a good and bad companion. The good companion is like a person who sells perfume. Their companion will either obtain some perfume or at least be affected by the pleasant smell. Whereas a bad companion is like a blacksmith. If their companion does not burn their clothes, they will certainly be affected by the smoke. Muslims must understand that the people they accompany will have an effect on them, whether this affect is positive or negative, obvious or subtle. It is not possible to accompany someone and not be affected by it. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4833, confirms that a person is on their companion's religion. Meaning, a person adopts the characteristics of their companion. It is therefore important for Muslims to always accompany the righteous, as they will undoubtedly affect them in a positive way, meaning they will inspire them to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Whereas, bad companions will either inspire one to disobey Allah, the Exalted, or they will encourage a Muslim to concentrate on the material world over preparing for the hereafter.
This attitude will become a great regret for them on judgment day, even if the things they strive for are lawful but beyond their needs. Finally, as a person will end up with those they love in the hereafter, according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, a Muslim must practically show they love for the righteous by accompanying them in this world. But if they accompany bad or heedless people, then it proves and indicates they love for them and their ultimate destination in the hereafter. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. All talk, no action. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina in order to confront the enemies at Ard, initially the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, agreed to take part in the battle with his people. As they approached Ard, Abdullah bin Ubay retreated with his 300 men and the Muslim army was left with 700 men against a non-Muslim army of 3,000. He used the fact that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not follow his suggestion of fighting within Medina as an excuse to retreat with his cronies. A poor excuse for someone who claimed to be a Muslim, someone who must obey the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him at all times. Besides, if he opposed the plan he could have remained in Medina, but instead he chose to accompany the army up to Ard, and while the enemy could observe them, he desired to leave the Muslim army in order to weaken the resolve of the Muslims and strengthen the resolve of the non-Muslim army. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 16 to 17, and in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 250 to 251. An aspect of hypocrisy is when one verbally shows support for others and their good projects such as building a mosque, but when the time comes to take part in the project such as donating wealth, they seem to disappear. Similarly, when people are facing good times, they verbally support them, reminding others of their loyalty to them. But the moment the people face difficulties, these hypocrites offer no emotional or physical support. Instead, they criticize them. This was the attitude of the hypocrites in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 62. So how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth, and then they come to you swearing by Allah, we intended nothing but good conduct and accommodation? Certain faith. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina in order to confront the enemies at Ard, initially the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, agreed to take part in the battle with his people. As they approached Ard Abdullah bin Ubay retreated with his 300 men, and the Muslim army was left with 700 men against a non-Muslim army of 3,000. He desired to leave the Muslim army at a critical point in order to weaken the resolve of the Muslims and strengthen the resolve of the non-Muslim army. His plan almost worked as the resolve of a few of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, weakened, but their strong faith in Allah, the Exalted, overcame the whisperings of the devil and they remained firm. Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 122, regarding this critical moment. When two parties among you were about to lose courage, but Allah was their ally, and upon Allah the believers should rely. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 250-251. The strength of their faith prevented them from disobeying Allah, the exalted. Therefore, Muslims must strive to learn and act on Islamic knowledge in order to obtain certainty of faith, so that they too remain steadfast on the sincere obedience of Allah, the exalted, in all occasions. All Muslims have faith in Islam, but the strength of their faith varies from person to person. For example, 
The one who follows the teachings of Islam because their family told them to is not the same as the one who believes in it through evidence. A person who has heard about something will not believe in it in the same way as the one who has witnessed the thing with their own eyes. As confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224, gaining useful knowledge is a duty on all Muslims. One of the reasons for this is that it is the best way a Muslim can strengthen their faith in Islam. This is important to pursue, as the stronger one's certainty of faith, the greater the chance they will remain steadfast on the correct path, especially when facing difficulties. In addition, having certainty of faith has been described as one of the best things one can possess in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3849. This knowledge should be obtained by studying the Holy Quran and the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through a reliable source. Allah, the Exalted, did not only declare a truth in the Holy Quran, but he also provided evidence for it through examples. Not only examples which are to be found in the past nations, but examples which have been placed in one's very own life. For example, in the Holy Quran Allah, the Exalted, advises that sometimes a person loves a thing, even though it will cause them trouble if they obtained it. Similarly, they might hate a thing while there is much hidden good in it for them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. There are many examples of this truth in history, such as the Pact of Hudaybah. Some Muslims believe this pact, which was made with the non-Muslims of Mecca, would completely favor the latter group. Yet, history clearly shows that it favored Islam and the Muslims. This event is discussed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 2731 and 2732. If one reflects on their own life, they will find many examples when they believed something was good, when it was actually bad for them, and vice versa. These examples prove the authenticity of this verse and help one's faith strengthen. Another example is found in chapter 79 and Nazir, verse 46. It will be, on the day they see it, judgment day, as though they had not remained in the world, except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. If one turns the pages of history, they will clearly observe how great empires came and went. But when they left they passed away, in such a way, as if they were only on earth for a moment. All but a few of their signs have faded away, as if they were never present on earth in the first place. Similarly, when one reflects on their own life, they will realize that no matter how old they are, and no matter how slow certain days might have felt overall their life so far has passed in a flash. Understanding the truthfulness of this verse strengthens one's certainty of faith, and this inspires them to prepare for the hereafter, before their time runs out. The Holy Quran and the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, are full of such examples. Therefore, one should strive to learn and act on these divine teachings, so that they adopt certainty of faith. The one who achieves this will not be shaken by any difficulty they face, and will remain steadfast on the path which leads to the gates of paradise. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Remaining firm on faith In the third year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed Medina in order to confront the enemies at Ard, initially the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, agreed to take part in the battle with his people. As they approached Ard, Abdullah bin Ubay retreated with his 300 men, and the Muslim army was left with 700 men against a non-Muslim army of 3,000. He desired to leave the Muslim army at a critical point, in order to weaken the resolve of the Muslims and strengthen the resolve of the non-Muslim army. Abdullah bin Haram, may Allah be pleased with him, urged the hypocrites to at least defend Medina, even if they were not interested in fighting for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. But this did not affect the cowards, who continued leaving the battlefield. 
He then criticized them and told them that Allah, the Exalted, would suffice his holy prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. And the army did not need the help of the hypocrites. Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 167, regarding this moment. And that he might make evident those who are hypocrites. For it was said to them, Come, fight in the way of Allah or at least defend. They said, If we had known there would be battle we would have followed you. They were nearer to disbelief that day than to faith, saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts. And Allah is most knowing of what they conceal. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 250 to 252. Generally speaking, a Muslim must not adopt the mindset of a hypocrite and abandon the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, when they face difficult times. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 159, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave a short but far-reaching piece of advice. He advised people to sincerely declare their belief in Allah, the Exalted, and then remain steadfast on it. Remaining steadfast on one's faith means that they must strive in the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in all aspects of their life. It consists of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, which relate to Him, such as the obligatory fasts and those which relate to people, such as treating others kindly. It includes refraining from all the prohibitions of Islam which are between a person and Allah, the Exalted, and those involving others. A Muslim must also face destiny with patience truly believing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for his servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Steadfastness can include refraining from both types of polytheism. The major type is when one worships something other than Allah, the Exalted. The minor type is when one shows off their good deeds to others. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3989. Therefore, an aspect of steadfastness is to always act for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. It includes obeying Allah, the Exalted, at all times instead of obeying and pleasing oneself or others. If a Muslim disobeys Allah, the Exalted, by pleasing themselves or others, they should know neither their desires nor people will protect them from Allah, the Exalted. On the other hand, the one who is sincerely obedient to Allah, the Exalted, will be protected from all things by him, even if this protection is not apparent to them. Remaining steadfast on one's faith includes following the path set out by the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and not adopting a path which deviates from this. The one who strives to adopt this path will not need anything else, as this is enough to keep them steadfast on their faith. As people are not perfect, they will undoubtedly make mistakes and commit sins. So being steadfast in matters of faith does not mean one has to be perfect, but it means they must strive to adhere strictly to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, as outlined earlier, and to sincerely repent if they commit a sin. This has been indicated in chapter 41 Fusila, verse 6. So take a straight course to him and seek his forgiveness. This is further supported by a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1987, which advises to fear Allah, the exalted, and to erase a minor sin which has occurred by performing a righteous deed. In another narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book 2, narration number 37, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims to try their best to remain steadfast on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, even though they will not be able to do it perfectly. Therefore, a Muslim's duty is to fulfill the potential they have been given through their intention and physical actions in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted. They have not been commanded to achieve perfection, as this is not possible. It is important to note that one cannot remain steadfast in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, through their physical actions without purifying their heart first. As indicated in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3984, the limbs of the body will only act in a pure way if the spiritual heart is pure. Purity of heart is only achieved by gaining and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. 
Peace and blessings be upon him. Steadfast obedience requires one to control their tongue as it expresses the heart. Without controlling the tongue, steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, is not possible. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2407. Finally, if any deficiency in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted, occurs, one must make sincere repentance to Allah, the Exalted, and seek the forgiveness of people if it involves their rights. Chapter 46 Al-Akaf, verse 13. Indeed those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on a right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. An Inspirational Speech In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. Before the battle commenced, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave the following speech which has been recorded in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1113 to 1114. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, what Allah, the Exalted, commanded me to do in his book, I command you to do. This indicates the importance of leading by example. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached, had a much more positive effect on others, compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3. Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. The holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, work in his obedience and desist from the matters that he forbade, Allah is with those who obey him, and the devil is with those who disobey Allah. True obedience involves sincerity. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted. Sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, includes fulfilling all the duties given by him in the form of commands and prohibitions solely for his pleasure. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one, all will be judged by their intention. So if one is not sincere towards Allah, the exalted, when performing good deeds they will gain no reward in this world or in the next. In fact, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154, those who performed insincere deeds will be told on Judgment Day to seek their reward from those who they acted for, which will not be possible. Chapter 98 al bayyinah verse 5 And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to him in religion. If one is lax in fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, it proves a lack of sincerity. Therefore, they should sincerely repent and struggle to fulfill them all. It is important to bear in mind Allah, the Exalted, never burdens one with duties they cannot perform or handle. 
Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286. Allah does not charge a soul, except with that within its capacity. Being sincere towards Allah, the exalted, means that one should always choose his pleasure over the pleasure of themselves and others. A Muslim should always give priority to those actions which are for the sake of Allah, the exalted, over all else. One should love others and dislike their sins for the sake of Allah, the exalted, and not for the sake of their own desires. When they help others or refuse to take part in sins, it should be for the sake of Allah, the exalted. The one who adopts this mentality has perfected their faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, today you are in a place of reward and savings, at least for those among you who know their responsibilities. If a person was hired for a specific job, such as painting a house, they are highly unlikely to receive their wages if they decide to do another duty, such as hovering the house. Even though what they decided to do is not bad, but as they have chosen to do a job they were not hired for, they will undoubtedly displease their employer. This is simple to understand and accept. Similarly, a Muslim has been commanded to fulfill the commands set out in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But if they decide to do something else and neglect this duty irrespective of if the thing they decide to do is lawful, such as pursuing the excess of this material world beyond their needs, doing actions which are different from what have been prescribed in the two divine sources or simply unlawful, they should not expect to please Allah, the Exalted, as He has made it clear, what Muslims should be doing. The same way an employee who decides to do something different, should not expect to receive their wages, neither should a Muslim who decides to strive for anything other than what they have been told to strive for by Allah, the Exalted. The wages in the case of the Muslim include blessings, mercy and the forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. Simply put, if a Muslim desires to obtain these wages, they must do their job and not busy themselves with other things which either contradicts their duty or things which are different from their duty. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, today you are in a place of reward and savings, at least for those among you who know their responsibilities, and then prepare themselves to fulfill them, upon patience, certainty of faith, seriousness and activeness. This is connected to chapter 47 Muhammad, verse 7. O you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. This verse means that if one aids Islam, then Allah, the Exalted, will help them in both worlds. It is strange how countless people desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet do not fulfill the first part of this verse through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. The excuse most people give is that they do not have time to perform righteous deeds. They desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet will not make time to do the things which please him. Does this make sense? Those who do not fulfill the obligatory duties and then expect the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need are quite foolish. And those who do fulfill the obligatory duties, yet refuse to go beyond them, will find that the aid they receive is limited. How one behaves is how they are treated. The more time and energy dedicated to Allah, the Exalted, the more support they will receive. It really is that simple. A Muslim needs to understand that the majority of the obligatory duties, such as the five daily prayers, only takes a small amount of time in one's day. A Muslim cannot expect to barely dedicate an hour a day to offering the obligatory prayers, and then neglect Allah, the Exalted, for the rest of the day, and still expect his continuous support through all difficulties. A person would dislike a friend who treated them in such a manner. How then can one treat Allah, the Exalted, the Lord of the Worlds like this then? Some only dedicate extra time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, when they encounter a worldly problem, then demand Him to fix it as if they done Allah, the Exalted, a favor by performing voluntary good deeds. This foolish mentality clearly contradicts servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. It is amazing how this type of person finds time to do all their other leisurely activities, 
such as spending time with family and friends, watching TV, and attending social functions, yet finds no time to dedicate to pleasing Allah, the Exalted. They cannot seem to find time to recite and adopt the teachings of the Holy Quran. They do not seem to find time to study and act on the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. These people somehow find wealth to spend on their unnecessary luxuries, yet seem to find no wealth to donate in voluntary charity. It is important to understand that a Muslim will be treated according to how they behave. Meaning, if a Muslim dedicates extra time to please Allah, the Exalted, then they will find the support they need to journey through all difficulties safely. But if they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties or only fulfill them without dedicating any other time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, then they will find a similar response from Allah, the Exalted. Put simply, the more one gives the more they shall receive. If one does not give much they should not expect much in return. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, so begin your deeds with patience upon fighting in the path of Allah and in doing so, search out for what Allah promised you. This reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for His sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O people, you must follow what I command you to do, for indeed, I ardently want you to what is right. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship, and His blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept His commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 al hash verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, Take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31. Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. 
Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O oh people, indeed discord, disagreement and losing heart are part of what it means to be incapable and weak, which Allah does not love, and for which Allah grants neither help nor victory. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 159, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave a short but far-reaching piece of advice. He advised people to sincerely declare their belief in Allah, the Exalted, and then remain steadfast on it. Remaining steadfast on one's faith means that they must strive in the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in all aspects of their life. It consists of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, which relate to Him, such as the obligatory fasts and those which relate to people, such as treating others kindly. It includes refraining from all the prohibitions of Islam, which are between a person and Allah, the Exalted, and those involving others. A Muslim must also face destiny with patience truly believing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for his servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Steadfastness can include refraining from both types of polytheism. The major type is when one worships something other than Allah, the Exalted. The minor type is when one shows off their good deeds to others. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3989. Therefore, an aspect of steadfastness is to always act for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. It includes obeying Allah, the Exalted, at all times instead of obeying and pleasing oneself or others. If a Muslim disobeys Allah, the Exalted, by pleasing themselves or others, they should know neither their desires nor people will protect them from Allah, the Exalted. On the other hand, the one who is sincerely obedient to Allah, the Exalted, will be protected from all things by Him, even if this protection is not apparent to them. Remaining steadfast on one's faith includes following the path set out by the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and not adopting a path which deviates from this. The one who strives to adopt this path will not need anything else, as this is enough to keep them steadfast on their faith. As people are not perfect, they will undoubtedly make mistakes and commit sins. So being steadfast in matters of faith does not mean one has to be perfect, but it means they must strive to adhere strictly to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, as outlined earlier, and to sincerely repent if they commit a sin. This has been indicated in chapter 41 Fusila, verse 6. So take a straight course to him and seek his forgiveness. This is further supported by a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1987, which advises to fear Allah, the Exalted, and to erase a minor sin which has occurred by performing a righteous deed. In another narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book 2, narration number 37, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims to try their best to remain steadfast on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, even though they will not be able to do it perfectly. Therefore, a Muslim's duty is to fulfill the potential they have been given through their intention and physical actions in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted. They have not been commanded to achieve perfection, as this is not possible. It is important to note that one cannot remain steadfast in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, through their physical actions without purifying their heart first. As indicated in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3984, the limbs of the body will only act in a pure way if the spiritual heart is pure. Purity of heart is only achieved by gaining and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him.
Steadfast obedience requires one to control their tongue as it expresses the heart. Without controlling the tongue, steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, is not possible. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2407. Finally, if any deficiency in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted, occurs, one must make sincere repentance to Allah, the Exalted, and seek the forgiveness of people if it involves their rights. Chapter 46 Al-Akaf, verse 13. Indeed those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on a right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Avoiding Cowardice In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. Before the battle commenced, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, brandished a sword and asked his soldiers if anyone would take it from him and fulfill its rights. Many of them raised their hands to take it but Abu Dujana Samak bin Kasha, may Allah be pleased with him, questioned what the rights of the sword were. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told him that it involved to fight with it against the enemy until it was damaged, broken. Abu Dujana, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he would take it and fulfill its rights, and thus it was given to him. He then put on his red headband, which was known as the headband of death. Whenever he fought to the death, he would put this red headband on. He then began to strut in between the Muslim soldiers, in order to provoke the non-Muslim soldiers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, observed his gait and commented that this was a walking style hated by Allah, the Exalted, except in situations like this i.e. battle. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 254 to 255. During the battle, Abu Dujana, may Allah be pleased with him, killed many non-Muslims. He rushed towards a non-Muslim who was inciting the non-Muslim army to kill the Muslims. When Abu Dujana, may Allah be pleased with him, was about to kill the person with the sword that was given to him, the person shrieked, and he then realized that the person was a woman, Hind bint Akbar. He withheld his hand and did not harm her, as he did not want to dishonor the sword of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by killing a woman with it. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 260. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2511, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against behaving cowardly. This attitude prevents trust in Allah, the Exalted, and in what he has promised, such as one's guaranteed provision. It can cause one to seek their provision in doubtful and unlawful means which will destroy a person in both worlds. Allah, the Exalted, does not accept any deed which has a foundation in the unlawful. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2342. In addition, being a coward prevents one from striving against the devil and one's inner devil, which requires genuine struggle. This will lead one to fail in obeying Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and it will therefore prevent them from fulfilling the rights of people. Both worldly and religious success requires effort and time. A coward will be too afraid to undertake this struggle, and will instead be lazy, which leads to failure in both worldly and religious matters. Stronger than blood In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. Before the battle commenced, the non-Muslim leader, Abu Sufyan, sent a message to the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, urging them to step aside and leave the battlefield, as the non-Muslims only desired to fight the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the companions from Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them. He desired to turn the situation into one about brotherhood and tribes, instead of the truth against falsehood. The companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, rejected his request as their loyalty to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
Peace and blessings be upon him. And the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were much deeper and stronger than tribal and blood ties. In addition, a non-Muslim, Abu Emir al-Fasik, who was once a prominent leader of the people of Medina, before the coming of Islam, was also on the side of the non-Muslims. He lost his status when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, and as a result of his envy, he fled to Mecca and urged the non-Muslims to fight against Islam. Before the Battle of Ard commenced, he called out to the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, hoping he could persuade them to join him, but they insulted him in return. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 256. With the passing of time, people often become divided and lose the strong connection they once had with one another. There are many causes of this, but a major cause is the foundation on which their connection was formed by their parents and relatives. It is commonly known that when the foundation of a building is weak, the building will either get damaged over time or even collapse. Similarly, when the foundation of bonds connecting people are not correct, the bonds between them will eventually weaken or even break. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, brought the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, together he formed the bonds between them for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, most Muslims today bring people together for the sake of tribalism, brotherhood and to show off to other families. Even though the majority of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not related, but as the foundation of the bonds connecting them was correct namely, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, their bonds grew from strength to strength. Whereas, many Muslims nowadays are related by blood yet, with the passing of time, become separated, as the foundation of their bonds was based on falsehood namely, tribalism and similar things. Muslims must understand that if desire for their bonds to endure and to earn reward for fulfilling the important duty of upholding the ties of kinship and the rights of non-relatives, then they must only forge bonds for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The foundation of this is that people only connect with one another and act together in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This has been commanded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 5 al maidah verse 2 and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Hereafter over world. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah to collect the spoils of war, this exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 29-30. Even though the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did not commit a sin as they believed the order no longer applied, as the battle seemed to be over. Yet their good and pious desire for collecting the spoils of war, to use them in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, led to trouble. Remaining stationed where they were, was connected directly to the hereafter whereas, collecting the spoils of war, to use in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, was connected to the hereafter, through the material world. In this instance, the action directly connected to the hereafter, was better. One must adopt the correct perception in respect to this material world and the hereafter, in order to avoid prioritizing worldly things over the hereafter. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4108, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the material world compared to the hereafter is like a drop of water compared to an ocean. In reality, this parable was given in order for people to understand how small the material world is compared to the hereafter. But in reality, they cannot be compared as the material world is temporal, whereas the hereafter is eternal.
Meaning, the limited cannot be compared to the unlimited. The material world can be split into four categories, fame, fortune, authority, and one's social life, such as their family and friends. No matter what worldly blessing one obtains which falls within these groups, it will always be imperfect, transient, and death will cut a person off from the blessing. On the other hand, the blessings in the hereafter are lasting and perfect. So in this respect, the material world is no more than a drop compared to an endless ocean. In addition, a person is not guaranteed to experience a long life in this world, as the time of death is unknown. Whereas, everyone is guaranteed to experience death and reach the hereafter. So it is foolish to strive for a day, such as one's retirement, which they may never reach over striving for the hereafter which they are guaranteed to reach. This does not mean one should abandon the world, as it is a bridge which must be crossed in order to reach the hereafter safely. Instead, a Muslim should take from this material world enough to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents, according to the teachings of Islam, without waste, excessiveness or extravagance. And then dedicate the rest of their efforts in preparing for the eternal hereafter by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the teachings of Islam. An intelligent person will not prioritize the drop of water over an endless ocean, and an intelligent Muslim would not prioritize the temporal material world over the eternal hereafter. Always sincere. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al ruma which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended, this exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who was positioned at the rear of the Muslim army, observed how the non-Muslims managed to circle around and reach the back of the Muslim army. Many of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did not realize what occurred and were therefore defenseless. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could have remained quiet and allowed his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to be slaughtered, as the non-Muslims were not aware of the exact position of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Instead, he shouted and warned his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, thereby giving his position away to the non-Muslims, who rallied together to attack him. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 263 to 264. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, showed great sincerity to his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, while putting his own life in danger. In a narration found in Sahih, Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance, as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people, that one is pleased when they are happy and sad, whenever they are grieved, as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, 
one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53 Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77 And do good as Allah has done good to you. Blessed in all situations. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. The confusion and chaos increased when voices were heard claiming that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had been martyred. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 29-30. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7500, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that every situation is blessed for a believer. The only condition is that they need to respond to each situation they encounter while obeying Allah, the Exalted, specifically, patience in difficulties and gratitude in times of ease. There are two aspects of life. One aspect are the situations people find themselves in, whether they are times of ease or difficulties. The control of what situation a person faces is out of their hands. Allah, the Exalted, has decided this and there is no escaping them. Therefore, stressing over the situations one faces does not make sense, as they are destined and therefore inevitable. The other aspect is a person's reaction to each situation. This is in each person's control and this is what they are judged on for example, showing patience or impatience in a difficult situation. Therefore, a Muslim must concentrate on their behavior and reaction in each situation, instead of stressing over being in a situation, as this is unavoidable. If a Muslim desires to succeed in both worlds, they should assess each situation and always act in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. For example, in times of ease they must use the blessings they possess as prescribed by Islam, which is true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. And in times of difficulty, they must show patience, knowing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for His servants, even if they do not understand the wisdom behind the choices. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Continuing the mission. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, 
The non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. The confusion and chaos increased when voices were heard claiming that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had been martyred. This caused some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to lose hope as their strength and inspiration had supposedly been martyred. But a companion, Anas bin Nadir, may Allah be pleased with him, declared that even if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had been martyred, Allah, the Exalted, is ever living and cannot die. They should therefore continue fighting for what the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, stood for. Anas bin Nadir, may Allah be pleased with him, continued fighting until he was martyred. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 29 to 31. Similarly, Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, believed there was no reason to live on without the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So he broke the sheath of his sword and continued fighting until he saw the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He continued to protect him until they retreated. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 163 to 164. Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 144, in connection to this event. Muhammad is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or be killed, would you turn back on your heels to unbelief? And he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. Allah, the Exalted, was preparing them for his eventual death and the attitude they must show when that happened. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, eventually died, years later, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, remained grateful and steadfast on their faith, even though some Muslim Arab tribes apostatized. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1196 to 1199. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is not physically amongst Muslims today, nonetheless, they must continue to strive for what he stood for by becoming the true ambassadors of Islam. The best way to achieve this is by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and being patient with his choices. Islam spread across the entire globe because the righteous predecessors took this duty very seriously. When they gained and acted on beneficial knowledge, the outside world recognized the truthfulness of Islam through their behavior. This caused countless people to enter the fold of Islam. Unfortunately, many Muslims today believe that showing others about Islam is merely in one's appearance, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf. This is only an aspect of representing Islam. The greatest part is by adopting the characteristics of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed in the Holy Quran and his traditions. Only with this attitude will the outside world observe the true nature of Islam. A Muslim should always remember that adopting an Islamic appearance while possessing characteristics which oppose the teachings of Islam only causes the outside world to disrespect Islam. They will be held accountable for this disrespect as they are the cause of it. A Muslim should therefore behave as a true ambassador of Islam by adopting the inward teachings of Islam as well as the outer appearance of Islam. In addition, this important position should remind Muslims that they will be held accountable and questioned whether they fulfilled this role or not on Judgment Day. The same way a king would become angry at their diplomat and representative if they failed to fulfill their duty, so will Allah, the Exalted, 
become angry with the Muslim who fails to fulfill their duty as an ambassador of Islam. All difficulties. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. During the battle the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was heavily wounded. His teeth were broken and his face and lips were cut. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 30. During the battle, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was retreating up Mount Ard with his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, while being pursued by the non-Muslims intent on killing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, sacrificed their lives in defense of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Talha bin Ubaidullah, may Allah be pleased with him, defended him to such an extent that he was inflicted with over 30 wounds and as a result his hand became paralyzed. This has been discussed in Imam Safiyur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 269 to 270. Even though the holy prophets, peace be upon them, are protected from committing sins none the less Muslims can learn a benefit from physical and emotional injuries. In a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 492, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a Muslim does not face any type of physical difficulty, irrespective of its size, such as a prick of a thorn, or any emotional difficulty, such as stress, except Allah, the Exalted, erases their sins because of it. This refers to minor sins, as major sins require sincere repentance. This outcome occurs when a Muslim remains patient from the onset of the difficulty until the end of their life. This is important to understand as many people believe they can complain initially and then show patience after. This is not true patience, instead it is only acceptance which occurs with the passing of time. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1870. In addition, Patience needs to be shown throughout one's life, as a person can destroy their reward by showing impatience down the line. A Muslim should remember that it is far better to have their minor sins erased through these difficulties, than to reach the day of judgment while still possessing them. A Muslim should constantly repent and strive to perform righteous deeds in order to erase their minor sins. And if they encounter any physical or emotional difficulties, they should remain patient, hoping for their minor sins to be erased, and to obtain an uncountable reward. Chapter 39 as Zuma, verse 10. Indeed, the patient will be given their reward without account, i.e., limit. Concern for people. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. During the battle the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was heavily wounded. His teeth were broken and his face and lips were cut. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 30. During the battle, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was retreating up Mount Ard with his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, while being pursued by the non-Muslims intent on killing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, sacrificed their lives in defense of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Talha bin Ubaidullah, may Allah be pleased with him, defended him to such an extent that he was inflicted with over 30 wounds and as a result his hand became paralyzed. When the other companions, such as Abu Bakr Sidqiwe and Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, may Allah be pleased with them, managed to reach the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they immediately tended to his wounds, but the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told them to first treat the wounds of Tala bin Ubaidullah, may Allah be pleased with him. They both insisted on treating the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him first. With his teeth, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, pulled out the two rings of the iron-ringed helmet of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which had been lodged into his face. 
Then he pulled out an arrow, which struck the face of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with his teeth as well, in order to avoid harming him. As a result, his front tooth fell out. Then the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, again advised them to find and aid Talah, may Allah be pleased with him, which they did. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 269 to 271. Even in such dire circumstances, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was concerned for others over himself. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that the Muslim nation is like one body. If any part of the body suffers pain, the rest of the body shares in its pain. This narration, like many others, indicates the importance of not becoming so self-absorbed into one's own life, thereby behaving as if the universe revolves around them and their problems. The devil inspires a Muslim to focus so much on their own life and their problems, that they lose focus on the bigger picture, which leads to impatience and causes them to become heedless of others, thereby failing their duty in supporting others according to their means. A Muslim should always bear this in mind and strive to aid others as much as they can. This extends to beyond financial help and includes all verbal and physical help such as good and sincere advice. Muslims should regularly observe the news and those who are in difficult situations all over the world. This will inspire them to avoid becoming self-centered and instead aid others. In reality, the one who only cares about themselves is lower in rank than an animal as even they care about their offspring. In fact, a Muslim should be better than animals by practically caring for others beyond their own family. Even though a Muslim cannot remove all the problems of the world, but they can play their part and help others according to their means, as this is what Allah, the Exalted, commands and expects. Desiring Guidance for All In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. During the battle the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was heavily wounded. His teeth were broken and his face and lips were cut. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 30. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was so worried and aggrieved for his people that while wiping his blood from his face he asked himself that how could Allah, the exalted, forgive the people which harmed their holy prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in this manner. Then Allah, the exalted, revealed the following and reassured the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that the door of forgiveness was still open for them. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 128. Not for you is the decision whether he should cut them down or forgive them or punish them, for indeed they are wrongdoers. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4027. While facing this harm from the non-Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was supplicating to Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them, as they did not possess knowledge and full understanding of what they were doing. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 268 to 269. Generally speaking, this incident indicates the merciful and forgiving nature of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. All Muslims hope that on Judgment Day Allah, the Exalted, will put aside, overlook and forgive their past mistakes and sins. But the strange thing is that most of these same Muslims who hope and pray for this do not treat others in the same way. Meaning, they often latch on to the past mistakes of others and use them as weapons against them. This is not referring to those mistakes which have an effect on the present or future. For example, a car accident caused by a driver which physically disables another person is a mistake which will affect the victim in the present and future. This type of mistake is understandably difficult to let go and overlook. But many Muslims often latch on to the mistakes of others which do not influence the future in any way, such as a verbal insult. Even though the mistake has faded away, yet these people insist on reviving and using it against others when the opportunity presents itself. 
It is a very sad mentality to possess, as one should understand that people are not angels. At the very least a Muslim who hopes for Allah, the exalted, to overlook their past mistakes should overlook the past mistakes of others. Those who refuse to behave in this manner, will find that the majority of their relationships are fractured, as no relationship is perfect. They will always be a disagreement, which can lead to a mistake in every relationship. Therefore, the one who behaves in this manner, will end up lonely, as their bad mentality causes them to destroy their relationships with others. It is strange that these very people hate to be lonely, yet adopt an attitude which drives others away from them. This defies logic and common sense. All people want to be loved and respected while they are alive and after they pass away, but this attitude causes the very opposite to occur. While they are alive, people become fed up with them and when they die, people do not remember them with true affection and love. If they do remember them, it is merely out of custom. Letting the past go does not mean one needs to be overly nice to others, but the least one can do is be respectful according to the teachings of Islam. This does not cost anything and requires little effort. One should therefore learn to overlook and let the past mistakes of people go. Perhaps then Allah, the exalted, will overlook their past mistakes on the day of judgment. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Accepting and adhering to the truth. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al-Rumah, which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al-Rumah, it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. While the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was retreating up Mount Ard with his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they were being pursued by the non-Muslims. One of the leaders of the non-Muslims, Ubay bin Khalaf, began to shout and threaten the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, while he was pursuing him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to allow him to approach. He then took a spear and stabbed Yubay in the neck through a gap in his armor. Yubay fell off his horse and screamed in pain. When the other non-Muslims carried him off and assessed his wound, they found that the neck wound was barely a scratch, even though Yubay was moaning as if he was being physically tortured. He then told them that he would die from this wound, as years earlier, prior to the migration to Medina, he threatened to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and in turn the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned him that he in fact would kill him. Yubay then commented that even if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, spat at him, he would die because he believed in his promise of killing him with certainty. Yubay died shortly after, while the non-Muslims were returning to Mecca. This has been discussed in Sirat ibn Hisham, page 148. It is strange how Yubay was so certain in the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, regarding his threat, yet did not believe in him as a Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. This indicates that deep inside he knew the truth as he knew the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, his whole life, and therefore knew he was no liar. Muslims must avoid this attitude and instead accept and adhere to the truth at all times. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. 
It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive, such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cherry-picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Overlooking and Goodwill In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army, which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. During this confusion, some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, mistakenly martyred another companion, Al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him. His son Hadifa bin Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him, who was also present at Ard, witnessed what occurred but never held it against the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and never took the blood money for his father's accidental death which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, offered him, and instead he distributed it to the poor Muslims. He kept up this goodwill until he left this world years later. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 46, in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3824, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1148 to 1149. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself, but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190 Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the Exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, 
and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. Gaining Reward from Allah, the Exalted In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. There was a man who was on fighting on the side of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, named Kuzman. When his bravery was mentioned to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he declared that he would go to hell. During the battle, he fought fiercely against the non-Muslims and showed great courage. Eventually his wounds disabled him, and he was carried off the battlefield. He was praised by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, but replied that he only fought for the sake of his tribe's honor and social status, meaning he did not fight for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. When the pain from his wounds became extreme, he used an arrow to kill himself. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 50. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that those who perform deeds for the sake of people, such as showing off, instead of doing them for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, will be told to gain their reward on Judgment Day from the people they acted for, which in reality is not possible to do. It is important to understand that the foundation of all deeds and even Islam itself is one's intention. It is the very thing which Allah, the Exalted, judges people on according to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. A Muslim should ensure they perform all religious and useful worldly actions for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, so that they gain reward from Him in both worlds. A sign of this correct mentality is that this person neither expects nor desires people to appreciate or show gratitude to them for the deeds they perform. If one desires this, then it indicates their incorrect intention. In addition, acting with the correct intention prevents sadness and bitterness, as the one who ACTS for the sake of people will eventually encounter ungrateful people who will make them annoyed and bitter as they feel they wasted their effort and time. Unfortunately, this is seen in parents and relatives as they often fulfill their duties towards their children and relatives for their sake instead of for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. But the one who ACTS for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, will fulfill all their duties towards others, such as their children, and never become bitter or enraged when they fail to show gratitude towards them. This attitude leads to peace of mind and general happiness, as they know Allah, the Exalted, is fully aware of their righteous deed and will reward them for it. This is the way all Muslims must act, otherwise they may well be left empty-handed on the Day of Judgment. Help in Distress in the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al ruma which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al ruma it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. During this difficult moment Allah, the Exalted, Send tranquility down upon the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, which alleviated their stress and anxiety. Abu Talha, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of those who received this blessing. The tranquility came in the form of slumber, which caused him to drop his sword several times while fighting. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 154 Then after distress, he sent down serenity in the form of drowsiness overcoming some of you. 
This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yor Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 277. In a narration found in Musnad Ahmad, number 2803, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the importance of understanding that every difficulty a person faces will be followed by ease. This reality has also been mentioned in the Holy Quran for example, chapter 65 at Talak verse 7. Allah will bring about, after hardship, ease, i.e. relief. It is important for Muslims to understand this reality, as it gives rise to patience and even contentment. Being uncertain over the changes in circumstances, can lead one to impatience, ingratitude, and even towards unlawful things, such as unlawful provision. But the one who firmly believes all difficulties will eventually be replaced with ease, will patiently wait for this change, fully trusting in the teachings of Islam. This patience is much loved by Allah, the Exalted, and greatly rewarded. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 146 And Allah loves the steadfast. This is the reason Allah, the Exalted, has mentioned numerous examples within the Holy Quran when difficult situations were followed by ease and blessings. For example, the following verse of the Holy Quran mentions the great difficulty, the Holy Prophet Nah, peace be upon him, faced from his people, and how Allah, the Exalted, saved him from the great flood. Chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verse 76 And mentioned Noah, when he called to Allah before that time, so we responded to him and saved him and his family from the great affliction, i.e. the flood. Another example is found in chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verse 69. We, i.e. Allah said, O fire be coolness and safety upon Abraham. The holy prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, faced a great difficulty in the form of a great fire, but Allah, the exalted, made it cool and peaceful for him. These examples and many more have been mentioned in the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, so that Muslims understand that a moment of difficulty will eventually be followed by ease for those who obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Therefore, it is important for Muslims to study these Islamic teachings in order to observe the countless cases where Allah, the Exalted, granted ease to his obedient servants after they face difficulties. If Allah, the Exalted, has saved his obedient servants from great difficulties mentioned in the divine teachings, then he can and will save the obedient Muslims facing smaller difficulties also. The Benchmark for Women In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al ruma which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al ruma it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. During this difficulty, some female companions, such as Aisha bint Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with both of them, were also present during the battle and were treating the wounded and providing water to the soldiers. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yor Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 279 to 280. These pious women played their role in supporting Islam. They did not compare themselves to the men, nor try doing what they did. Instead, they understood that achieving goodness was not about copying what men did, it was simply in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling their role and duties. In the following verse of the Holy Quran, Allah, the Exalted, explains an important teaching of Islam, namely, the most honorable and best person is the one who possesses the most piety. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13. O mankind indeed. The most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This is when one strives to fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, 
refrains from his prohibitions, and faces destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Unfortunately, the devil has tricked many women into debating the status of women compared to men. Even though Islam has granted women such honor as no other institution or faith ever has, such as placing paradise, which is the ultimate bliss beneath the feet of a woman, namely one's mother. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3106. In another narration found in Jaimi at Termidi, number 3895, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the best man is the one who treats his wife the best. There are countless other examples. But the point to note is that women should not be bothered about comparing themselves to men, as this is not what Allah, the exalted, desires. Instead, women should strive to adopt piety, and if they achieve it, then they will be superior to every man or woman who possesses less piety than them. This is the benchmark which separates who is superior. And it is clear from this verse that it is not only restricted to men. If one turns the pages of history, they will observe great female Muslims who concentrated on this important task, instead of arguing and debating about the differences between men and women. And as a result, they became better than the vast majority of men and women. Even if Muslim women were granted all the rights they dreamed of even then, it would not make them superior to others until they adopted piety. This is quite evident when one observes the news and those who behave as they please. And this reality will be made crystal clear in the next world. Therefore, if a Muslim desires to be superior to others, they should seek it in piety, not in arguing and debates. Facing difficulties and hardship. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them. After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, safely retreated to Mount Ard, Abu Sufyan, the non-Muslim leader, called out to them, inquiring if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Abu Bakr Sadiq and Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, had been killed or not. Abu Sufyan understood that the continuation of Islam was hinged on these great personalities. Initially, no one replied to him, as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told them to remain silent. But when Abu Sufyan began to boast about what occurred, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, could not remain silent and rebuked him. Abu Sufyan then told them that his soldiers had mutilated the bodies of the fallen companions, may Allah be pleased with them, even though he did not order them to do so, but their actions did not displease him. Abu Sufyan boasted how this battle was revenge for the Battle of Badr, but Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he was mistaken, as the non-Muslims who were killed were in hell, whereas the fallen companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were in paradise. Before leaving, Abu Sufyan challenged the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to meet the following year at Badr to fight again, which the latter accepted. After the non-Muslim army left, Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, was dispatched to gather intelligence and assess whether the non-Muslim army was heading home to Mecca or heading to attack Medina. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commented that if they headed for Medina, he would march there and fight them. But after Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, assessed the situation, he realized they were heading home to Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 281 to 282. In life, a Muslim will always face either times of ease or times of difficulty. 
No one only experiences times of ease without experiencing some difficulties. But the thing to note is that even though difficulties by definition are hard to deal with, they are in fact a means to obtain and demonstrate one's true greatness and servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, in the majority of cases people learn more important life lessons when they face difficulties than when they face times of ease. And people often change for the better after experiencing times of difficulty than times of ease. One only needs to reflect on this in order to understand this truth. In fact, if one studies the Holy Quran, they will realize the majority of the events discussed involve difficulties. This indicates that true greatness does not lie in always experiencing times of ease. It in fact lies in experiencing difficulties while remaining obedient to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is proven by the fact that each of the great difficulties discussed in Islamic teachings end with ultimate success for those who obeyed Allah, the Exalted. So a Muslim should not be bothered about facing difficulties as these are just moments for them to shine while acknowledging their true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, through sincere obedience. This is the key to ultimate success in both worlds. Sacrificing it all In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al ruma which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al ruma it exposed the rear of the Muslim army, the non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the non-Muslim army left, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, descended to check on their fallen comrades. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told Zayed bin Thabit to find and ask about the well-being of Sa'd bin Arabi, may Allah be pleased with them. He eventually found him in amongst the soldiers, in his last breath, covered with over 70 wounds. Zayed, may Allah be pleased with him, passed on the greetings of peace from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and asked about his state. Sa'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, returned the greeting of peace to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and commented that he could smell the scent of paradise. His final words were a warning message given to the companions of Medina, May Allah be pleased with them. He told them that they would have no excuse before Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day, if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was harmed while they were still alive. Then he passed away, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 282 to 283. Allah, the Exalted, does not expect nor demand such sacrifices from the Muslims of today. Instead, he expects them to make smaller sacrifices in respect to the worldly blessings they possess. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92 Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And whatever you spend, indeed Allah is knowing of it. This verse makes it clear that a person cannot be a true believer, meaning they will possess a defect in their faith until they are willing to dedicate the things they love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Even though many believe this verse applies to wealth, but it in fact means much more. It includes every blessing which a Muslim likes and loves. For example, Muslims are happy to dedicate their precious time on the things which please them. But they refuse to dedicate time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, beyond the obligatory duties which barely takes an hour or two in one's day. Countless Muslims are happy to dedicate their physical strength in different pleasurable activities, yet, many of them refuse to dedicate it to the things which please Allah, the Exalted, such as voluntary fasting. More commonly, 
People are happy to strive in things which they desire, like obtaining excess wealth which they do not need, even if it means they have to do overtime and give up their sleep. Yet how many strive in this way in the obedience of Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience? How many give up their precious sleep in order to offer voluntary prayers? It is strange that Muslims desire lawful, worldly and religious blessings yet overlook a simple fact that they will only gain these things when they dedicate the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. How can they dedicate minimal things to Him and still expect to achieve all their dreams? This attitude is truly strange. Responding to the Call of Faith In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al-Rumah, which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al-Rumah, it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the non-Muslim army left, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, descended to check on their fallen comrades. The companions could not find the body of Hanzala ibn Abu Emir, may Allah be pleased with them, and were told by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, of his location and the fact that his body had been washed by the angels. Normally, the body of a martyr is not washed before burial. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told them to ask his wife about his situation. After returning to Medina, they asked his wife, who told them that Hanzala, may Allah be pleased with him, had just married her and been intimidated with her before the call of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, summoning the soldiers to the Battle of Ard. Even though it was obligatory for him to bathe himself, yet doing this would have ensured he missed out on joining the soldiers and answering the call straight away. So he delayed his bath and instead joined the soldiers and marched to Ard where he was martyred. As a result of his obedience to the call of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the angels washed his body before his burial. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 284 to 285. Generally speaking, one must respond to the call of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, towards the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, before their time runs out. The trumpet blast will lead to the death of the creation. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7381. The important thing to learn is that this is a call which no one can or will reject responding to. It will lead to the resurrection and final judgment. Therefore, Muslims should respond to the call of Allah, the Exalted, through the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through sincere obedience by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 8 and Anval, verse 24. O you who have believed, respond to Allah and to the Messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life. Whoever responds to this call in this world will find the final call easy to endure and respond to. Whereas, the one who lives heedless to the call of Allah, the Exalted, in this world will not find peace in it, and they will be forced to answer the call of the trumpet which will be a great burden for them to endure and respond to. A person can only ignore the call of Allah, the Exalted, for so long as the final call will occur, sooner or later, and no one will be able to avoid or ignore it. If this is inevitable, it makes sense that one respond to it now, today, instead of living in heedlessness. If one hears the trumpet blast while heedless, no action or regret will benefit them, and what comes after for this person will be even more terrifying. A lot for a little. 
In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the non-Muslim army left, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, descended to check on their fallen comrades. They found Yuzaram Amra ibn Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him, in his last breath. They were surprised to see him, as he was one of the few polytheists who lived in Medina that refused to accept Islam. In fact, when he returned from a journey to Medina, he found it quite empty. When he questioned the people there, he was told they had marched to Ard to fight against the non-Muslims of Mecca. At this point he accepted Islam and headed for Ard where he fought hard against the non-Muslims until he was fatally wounded. During his last breaths he told the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, he had accepted Islam and then died. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, confirmed he was from the people of paradise and commented that he had obtained a lot for a little amount of work. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, would tell his story and add that he was a man who entered paradise without performing a single prayer. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1150-1151. This is connected to Chapter 47 Muhammad, Verse 7. O oh, you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. This verse means that if one aids Islam, then Allah, the Exalted, will help them in both worlds. It is strange how countless people desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet do not fulfill the first part of this verse through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. The excuse most people give is that they do not have time to perform righteous deeds. They desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet will not make time to do the things which please Him. Does this make sense? Those who do not fulfill the obligatory duties and then expect the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need are quite foolish. And those who do fulfill the obligatory duties yet refuse to go beyond them will find that the aid they receive is limited. How one behaves is how they are treated. The more time and energy dedicated to Allah, the Exalted, the more support they will receive. It really is that simple. A Muslim needs to understand that the majority of the obligatory duties, such as the five daily prayers, only takes a small amount of time in one's day. A Muslim cannot expect to barely dedicate an hour a day to offering the obligatory prayers, and then neglect Allah, the Exalted, for the rest of the day, and still expect his continuous support through all difficulties. A person would dislike a friend who treated them in such a manner. How then can one treat Allah, the Exalted, the Lord of the Worlds like this then? Some only dedicate extra time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, when they encounter a worldly problem, then demand Him to fix it as if they done Allah, the Exalted, a favor by performing voluntary good deeds. This foolish mentality clearly contradicts servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. It is amazing how this type of person finds time to do all their other leisurely activities, such as spending time with family and friends, watching TV, and attending social functions, yet finds no time to dedicate to pleasing Allah, the Exalted. They cannot seem to find time to recite and adopt the teachings of the Holy Quran. They do not seem to find time to study and act on the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. These people somehow find wealth to spend on their unnecessary luxuries, yet seem to find no wealth to donate in voluntary charity. It is important to understand that a Muslim will be treated according to how they behave. 
Meaning, if a Muslim dedicates extra time to please Allah, the Exalted, then they will find the support they need to journey through all difficulties safely. But if they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties or only fulfill them without dedicating any other time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, then they will find a similar response from Allah, the Exalted. Put simply, the more one gives the more they shall receive. If one does not give much they should not expect much in return. Ruling over anger In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the non-Muslim army left, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, descended to check on their fallen comrades. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, observed the mutilated bodies, especially the body of his uncle, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, he became angry and commented that he would take revenge by mutilating the non-Muslims the next time they gained victory over them. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, made similar comments. Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 16 and now, verse 126, in connection to this. If you retaliate, then let it be equivalent to what you have suffered. But if you patiently endure, it is certainly best for those who are patient. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, retracted his comment and always explicitly forbade every army he dispatched from mutilating enemy soldiers. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1160 to 1161. The first thing to note is that the reaction of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, enhances the fact that he is a human and not some angelic being. This characteristic has been highlighted many times in the Holy Quran and throughout the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that people can relate to him, as he felt what they feel, he experienced what they experience, such as anger. Chapter 18 Al-Kaf, verse 110 Say, I am only a man like you to whom has been revealed that your God is one God. A role model, which people cannot relate to, is not a good role model. He is the perfect role model, because he is human, and felt what all other humans feel, yet controlled himself within the bounds of Islam and noble character. Secondly, this incident indicates the importance of controlling one's anger. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised a person not to get angry. In reality, this narration does not mean a person should never get angry, as anger is an innate characteristic which is even found in the Holy Prophets, peace be upon them. In fact, in some rare cases anger can be useful for example, in self-defense. This narration actually means that a person should control their anger, so it does not lead them to sins. In addition, this narration shows that anger can lead to many evils and controlling it leads to much good. Firstly, this advice is a command to adopt all the good characteristics which will encourage one to control their anger, such as patience. This narration also indicates that a person should not act according to their anger. Instead, they should struggle with themselves in order to control it so that it does not lead them to sins. Controlling anger for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is a great deed and leads to divine love. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 134 who restrain anger and who pardon the people, and Allah loves the doers of good. There are many teachings within Islam which encourage Muslims to control their anger. For example, as anger is linked to and inspired by the devil a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, 
Number 3282 advises that an angry person should seek refuge in Allah, the exalted, from the devil. An angered Muslim has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2191, to cling to the ground. This could mean that they should prostrate on the earth until they calm down. In fact, the more one takes an inactive body position, the less chance they will lash out in anger. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4782. Acting on this advice allows one to imprison their anger within themselves until it passes so that it does not negatively affect others. A Muslim who is angered should follow the advice given in the narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4784. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the angry Muslim to perform ablution. This is because water counters the innate characteristic of anger, namely heat. If one then offers prayer, this would help them control their anger further and lead to a great reward. The advice discussed so far helps an angry Muslim to control their physical actions. In order to control one's speech, it is best to refrain from speaking when angered. Unfortunately, words can often have more of a lasting effect on others than physical actions. Countless relationships have been fractured and broken because of words spoken in anger. This behavior often leads to other sins and crimes as well. It is important for a Muslim to note the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3970, which warns that it only takes a single evil word to cause a person to plunge into hell on Judgment Day. Controlling anger is a great virtue and the one who masters this has been described by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a strong person in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6114. In fact, the one who swallows their anger for the sake of Allah, the exalted, meaning they do not commit a sin because of their anger, will have their heart filled with peace and true faith. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4778. This is a characteristic of the sound heart which is mentioned in the Holy Quran. It is the only heart which will be granted safety on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88 and 89. The day when there will not benefit anyone well for children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. As mentioned earlier, anger within limits can be useful. It should be used for repelling harm to oneself, faith and possessions, which if done correctly, according to the teachings of Islam, is counted as anger for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This was the state of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who was never angered for the sake of his own desires. He only became angry for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6050. The character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the Holy Quran, which has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1739. This means he would be pleased with what it was pleased with, and angered with what it was angered with. It is important to note, that becoming angered only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is praiseworthy, but if this anger causes one to exceed the limits, then it becomes blameworthy. It is absolutely vital for one to control their anger according to the teachings of Islam, even when they are angered for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4901, warns of a worshipper who angrily claimed Allah, the Exalted, would not forgive a specific sinful person. As a result, this worshipper will be sent to hell, while the sinner will be forgiven on Judgment Day. The origins of evil consist of four things, failing to control one's desire, fear, evil appetites and anger. Therefore, the one who accepts the advice of this narration will remove a quarter of evil from their character and life. To conclude, it is vital for Muslims to control their anger, so it does not cause them to act or speak in a way which will lead them to a great regret in both this world and the next. A Pledge Fulfilled In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, 
quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the battle was over, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, began burying their fallen comrades. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, passed by a martyred companion, Musab bin Umayyah, may Allah be pleased with him, and recited chapter 33 Al-Azab, verse 23. Among the believers are men true to what they promised Allah. Among them is he who has fulfilled his vow to the death, and among them is he who awaits his chance. And they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 62. This incident is linked to Chapter 7, Al-Araf, verse 172 of the Holy Quran. And mention, when your Lord took from the children of Adam from their loins their descendants and made them testify of themselves, saying to them, Am I not your Lord? They said, Yes, we have testified. This, lest you should say on the day of resurrection, Indeed, we were of this unaware. All humans were brought forth so that they could take this pledge to Allah, the Exalted. The lesson to understand behind this incident is that all people accepted Allah, the Exalted, as their Lord. Meaning, the one who created them, sustains them, and the one who will judge their deeds on the day of judgment. It is important for all Muslims to fulfill this pledge through sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This verse indicates that Allah, the Exalted, did not ask the creation if they were his servants, instead, he asked them if he was their Lord. This is an indication that the will of Allah, the Exalted, should always come before the will and desire of a person. If a Muslim has a choice between pleasing Allah, the Exalted, or someone else, this pledge should remind them that the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, must come first. This question is also an indication of the infinite mercy of Allah, the Exalted, as he hinted the answer to the creation by wording it as he did. This shows Muslims that even though Allah, the Exalted, is the Lord who will judge their deeds yet, he is also infinitely merciful. The effect of this covenant is deeply embedded in the hearts of all mankind. In fact, this is the nature which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6755. From this one can understand that it is important for people not to search for the truth after making their minds up beforehand, and then search for evidence which supports their predetermined belief. Only those who open their minds without making a predetermined decision will unlock this covenant which has been embedded deep in their hearts. In fact, Having an open mind is important in all issues, not just in matters of faith, as it helps one to find the truth and the best path. This attitude strengthens society and always encourages peace between people. But the stubbornness of those who predetermine their choices will always create wedges between members of a society which can affect people on a national level. It is important for Muslims not to always believe they are correct in worldly matters, otherwise they will adopt this stubborn attitude. This will prevent them from accepting the opinions of others, which will lead to arguments, enmity, and fractured relationships. Therefore, this attitude should be avoided at all costs. Finally, the fact that this covenant is deeply embedded in a person's heart indicates that it is a duty on Muslims to uncover it. This will lead one to certainty of faith, which is much stronger than faith based on hearsay meaning, being told by one's family that they are a Muslim. Certainty of faith allows a Muslim to overcome all difficulties successfully in this world while fulfilling their religious and worldly duties. One only fails in tests and their duties because of weakness in their faith. Certainty of faith is only obtained by gaining and acting on the knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him.
Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53. We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Making test small. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. Many companions were martyred and their bodies mutilated by the non-Muslims, including Musab bin Umayy and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. may Allah be pleased with them. Musab bin Umayy, may Allah be pleased with him, possessed nothing except a woolen cloak. During his burial, when his head was covered with the cloak, his feet were uncovered, and when his feet were covered with the woolen cloak, his head was left exposed. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded that his head should be covered with the woolen cloak, and grass should be used to cover his feet. The same thing occurred with Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 46, and in Imam Safiyur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 285. In addition, during this battle, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, was assassinated. Washi bin Harb was a slave of a non-Muslim, Jabir bin Mutin. Jabir promised to free Washi if he killed Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him, at the Battle of Ard. During the battle, Washi sneaked upon Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him, and from a distance threw a spear at him, which pierced his stomach and eventually killed him. This has been discussed in Imam Safiyur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 261. It is important for Muslims to understand that Allah, the Exalted, does not demand Muslims to overcome the difficulties which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, endured. For example, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, sacrificed their families, homes, businesses and even lives for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In comparison, the difficulties Muslims face now are not as difficult as those the righteous predecessors faced. Muslims should therefore be grateful that they are only required to make a few small sacrifices, such as sacrificing some sleep to offer the obligatory dawn prayer and some wealth to donate the obligatory charity. Allah, the Exalted, is not commanding them to leave their homes and families for His sake. This gratitude must be shown practically by using the blessings one possesses in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, when a Muslim faces difficulties, they should remember the difficulties the righteous predecessors faced and how they overcame them through steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This knowledge can provide a Muslim the strength to overcome their difficulties, as they know the righteous predecessors were more beloved to Allah, the Exalted, yet they endured more severe difficulties with patience. In fact, a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4023, advises that the holy prophets, peace be upon them, endured the most difficult of tests, and they are undoubtedly the most beloved to Allah, the Exalted. If a Muslim follows the steadfast attitude of the righteous predecessors, it is hoped they will end up with them in the hereafter. Quranic Knowledge In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al ruma which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al ruma it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After the battle was over, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, began burying their fallen comrades. Due to limited supplies, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would place one piece of clothing over two martyred companions, may Allah be pleased with them. 
He ordered that the one who had better knowledge of the Holy Quran should be placed in the grave first. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 56 to 57, and has been recorded in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1343. This incident highlights the importance of understanding and acting on the Holy Quran. In a narration found in Imam Manzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. But as warned by this narration, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Positive Attitude In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. When the army returned to Medina, a woman was told that her husband, father and brother had been martyred at Ard. Her only reply was about the well-being of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. When she was told he was alive, she insisted that they take her to him so she could see for herself. When they did this, she commented that all misfortunes were nothing so long as he was safe. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yor Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 287. It is important for Muslims to adopt a positive mindset as it is a great tool to aid them when dealing with difficulties, so that they remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted. Whenever a person faces difficulties, they should always understand a truth that the difficulty could have been much worse. If it was a worldly problem, they should be grateful it was not an affliction affecting their faith. Instead of dwelling on the immediate sadness which accompanies the difficulty, they should concentrate on the end and the reward which is waiting for those who demonstrate patience for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. When a person loses a few blessings, they should recount the countless blessings they still possess. In each difficulty, a Muslim should remember the verse of the Holy Quran which reminds Muslims that there are many hidden wisdoms to difficulties and tests which they have not observed. Therefore, the situation they are facing is better than the situation they desired. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. 
To conclude, a Muslim should reflect on these facts and others, so that they adopt a positive mindset which is a key element in dealing with difficulties in a way which leads to countless blessings in both worlds. Remember, the cup is not half empty, it is instead half full. When others depart. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. After observing the sadness of Jabir bin Abdullah, whose father had been martyred during the Battle of Ard, may Allah be pleased with them, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, cheered him up by telling him that Allah, the Exalted, only ever spoke to a person from behind a screen, whereas he spoke to his father face to face. Allah, the Exalted, asked his father to request anything from him. Abdullah, his father, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he desired to return to the world and fight in his path and be killed again. Allah, the Exalted, then reminded him that he had already decreed that none shall return to earth after their death. Allah, the Exalted, instead revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 169, informing the people of his father's state and the state of the other martyrs. And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive with their Lord, receiving provision. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 61. Generally speaking, this incident indicates the importance of dealing positively with the loss of people. Every day people lose their loved ones. It is an inevitable outcome. A Muslim can remember and act on many things which can aid them during this difficulty. One thing is to observe the situation in a positive way. Meaning, instead of being sad over what one has lost, they should concentrate on the good things that they gained through the person who is departed, such as their good advice and guidance. When one reflects on this, they will understand that it was better to know the person before losing them instead of not knowing them at all. It is similar to the statement, it is better to have loved and lost than not loved at all. Though in most cases, this statement is taken out of context and misused, but when used in this way, it is correct and helpful. In addition, a Muslim who undoubtedly believes in the hereafter should always remember that people do not meet in this world only to leave each other. But instead, they only leave this world in order to meet again in the next world. This attitude can aid one in remaining patient during such a difficulty and it should inspire them to increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience so that they can reunite with their loved one in their final resting place in the gardens of refuge forever. Times of Grief In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, returned to Medina, he heard the women lamenting for their fallen relatives. 
He became sad as there was no one mourning for his uncle, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, who was martyred during the battle. One must bear in mind that according to Ibn Masazud, he and the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, never witnessed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, weep so much as he did when he saw the mutilated body of Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him. These women were then told by their male relatives to lament for Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, prayed for them, but replied that he did not desire this, and concluded that he did not like wailing. He forbade wailing after this. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 66 to 67, and in Imam Safi Yor Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, page 285. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3127, warns that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, forbade people from wailing. Unfortunately, some believe it is not permitted to cry in times of difficulty, such as losing a loved one. This is incorrect, as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, cried on many occasions when someone passed away. For example, he wept when his son Ibrahim, may Allah be pleased with him, passed away. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3126. In fact, crying on someone's death is a sign of mercy which Allah, the Exalted, has placed in the hearts of his servants. And only those who show mercy to others will be shown mercy by Allah, the Exalted. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1284. This same narration clearly mentions that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, cried over his grandson who passed away. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2137, advises that a person will not be punished for crying over the death of someone or the grief they feel in their heart. But they may well face punishment if they utter words showing their impatience with the choice of Allah, the Exalted. It is clear that feeling grief in one's heart or shedding tears is not prohibited in Islam. The things which are prohibited are wailing, showing one's impatience through words or actions, such as tearing one's clothes or shaving one's head in grief. They are severe warnings against those who act in this way. Therefore, one should avoid these actions at all costs. Not only may a person face punishment for acting in this way, but if the deceased desired and commanded others to act like this when they passed away, they too will be held accountable. But if the deceased did not desire this, then they are free of any accountability. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1006. It is common sense to understand that Allah, the Exalted, would not punish someone because of the actions of another when the former did not advise them to act in that manner. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 18 And no bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another. Causing divisions In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. The hypocrites unsuccessfully attempted to take advantage of the grieving companions, may Allah be pleased with them, by emotionally cutting them off from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Jewish scholars and hypocrites claimed that if Islam was true, then they would not have been defeated. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 109. Many of the people of the scripture wish they could turn you back to disbelief after you have believed, out of envy from themselves, even after the truth has become clear to them. So pardon and overlook until Allah delivers his command. 
Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 67, and in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al-Nuzal, 2 to 109, page 7. A sign of hypocrisy is that a person spreads corruption in society. This negative characteristic affects all social levels beginning from a family unit and ending at the international level. This type of person dislikes seeing people uniting on good as this may cause the worldly status of others to increase beyond their own. This drives them to backbiting and slander in order to cause people to turn against each other. Their evil attitude destroys their own ties of kinship and when they observe other families who are happy, it drives them to destroy their happiness also. They are fault finders who dedicate their time unveiling the mistakes of others in order to drag their social status down. They are the first people to begin gossiping about others and act deaf whenever good things are spoken about. Peace and quiet disturbs them, so they seek to create problems in order to entertain themselves. They fail to remember the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2546. It advises that whoever covers the faults of others Allah, the Exalted, will cover their faults. But whoever seeks out and unveils the faults of others Allah, the Exalted, will expose their faults to the people. So in realty, this type of person is only unveiling their own faults to society, even though they believe they are exposing the faults of others. In addition, it is clear that all holy prophets, peace be upon them, were tested with different hardships and trials. In fact, according to the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4023, they were tested the most out of all of mankind. Therefore, Muslims should understand that actualizing belief in Islam does not guarantee protection from difficulties. It in fact guarantees a safe journey through the difficulties and a mighty reward in both worlds. Chapter 39 as zuma verse 10 Indeed, the patient will be given their reward without account. Obedience in difficulties In the third year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al-Rumah, which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al-Rumah, it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, returned to Medina, they became aware that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca were considering marching back towards Medina in order to wipe out Islam for good. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave orders for the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, despite their grievous wounds and tired bodies, to move out in pursuit of the non-Muslims. When the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, responded positively Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 172. Those believers who responded to Allah and the Messenger after injury had struck them. For those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 67 to 68. A man named Mabad Ibn Abu Mabad met the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his army, and offered his condolences and services. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told him to reach the non-Muslim army and dissuade them from attacking Medina. He eventually reached the non-Muslim army and warned them not to attack Medina, as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had gathered a formidable army who were prepared to fight to the bitter end. Through this Allah, the Exalted, cast fear into the hearts of the non-Muslims who decided to head back to Mecca, even though their primary goals of killing the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and securing their trade route past Medina, failed. 
Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 151. We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve for what they have associated with Allah, of which he had not sent down any authority. And their refuge will be the fire, and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. Abu Sufyan, the non-Muslim leader, sent a message through a trading caravan to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that the non-Muslim army had rallied more support and were ready to finish of the Muslims. He hoped this false information would put off the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, from pursuing them. His plan failed, as they did pursue them, but the non-Muslims slipped out of their reach. In this context, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verses 173 to 174. Those to whom people said, Indeed the people have gathered against you, so fear them. But it merely increased them in faith, and they said, Sufficient for us is Allah, and he is the best disposer of affairs. So they returned with favor from Allah and bounty, no harm having touched them. And they pursued the pleasure of Allah, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's, The Sealed Nectar, pages 288 to 291, and in Imam Wahidi's, Asbab al nuzal 3 to 151, page 42. The positive response from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, even at a time of stress and difficulty, indicates their great zeal for the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. It is important for Muslims to recognize why they worship Allah, the Exalted, as this reason can be a cause for an increase in obedience to Allah, the Exalted, or in some cases it can lead to disobedience. When one worships Allah, the Exalted, in order to gain lawful worldly things from him, they run the risk of becoming disobedient to him. This type of person has been mentioned in the Holy Quran. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11. And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. As they obey Allah, the Exalted, in order to receive worldly blessings the moment they fail to receive them or encounter a difficulty, they often become angered which turns them away from the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. These people often obey and disobey Allah, the Exalted, according to the situation they are facing which in reality contradicts true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. Even though, desiring lawful worldly things from Allah, the Exalted, is acceptable in Islam yet, if one persists with this attitude, they may become like those mentioned in this verse. It is far better to worship Allah, the Exalted, in order to be saved in the hereafter and obtain paradise. This person is unlikely to alter their behavior when encountering difficulties. But the highest and best reason is to obey Allah, the Exalted, simply because he is their Lord and the Lord of the universe. This Muslim, if sincere, will remain steadfast in all situations, and through this obedience, they will be granted both worldly and religious blessings, which outstrip the worldly blessings the first type of person would ever receive. To conclude, it is important for Muslims to reflect on their intention, and if necessary, correct it, so that it encourages them to remain firm on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience in all situations. Wisdoms from the Battle of Ard In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. 
This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 29 to 30. It is clear that the main reason why the Muslims suffered so many losses was the misjudgment of the archers. They unintentionally disobeyed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as they believed the war was over and his command no longer applied. This indicates that as long as a Muslim sincerely obeys the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they will be granted success, but if they disobey him, this support will be withdrawn. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 80 Whoever obeys the Messenger has truly obeyed Allah. And Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. And chapter 24 and Nur, verse 63. Do not make your calling of the messenger among yourselves as the call of one of you to another. Already Allah knows those of you who slip away, concealed by others. So let those beware who descend from his prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him order, lest disaster strike them or a painful punishment. In addition, it is customary for the holy prophets, peace be upon them, to sometimes gain the upper hand over their enemies, and on some occasions their enemies gain the upper hand, even though the ultimate victory is always in favor of the holy prophets, peace be upon them. The reason for this alternating of circumstances is to separate the true believers from the hypocrites and the opportunists, who always join the successful group in order to reap worldly benefits. If the holy prophets, peace be upon them, always won, then the hypocrites and opportunists would become inextinguishable from the sincere believers. If the holy prophets, peace be upon them, always lost, then this would hinder their mission. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 140 If a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. And these days, of varying conditions, we alternate among the people, so that Allah may make evident those who believe, and may take to himself from among you martyrs. Another reason for this alternating of victory and defeat, is to teach the believers how to adopt both patience and gratitude. If they lost all the time, then they may well become patient, but would find it difficult to be grateful. If they won all the time, then they may well adopt gratitude, but will struggle to adopt real patience. The alternating of situations allows for them to adopt both patience and gratitude, two halves which are vital to obtain success in both worlds. Showing Mercy In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. When the battle commenced the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, quickly overcame the non-Muslim army which caused them to retreat. But some of the archers, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded to stay on a small mountain, Jabal al rumah which is in front of Mount Ard, irrespective of the outcome of the battle, believed that the battle was over and the command no longer applied. When they descended Jabal al rumah it exposed the rear of the Muslim army. The non-Muslim army then rallied together and attacked the Muslims from both sides. This led to the martyrdom of many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never admonished or censured the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who committed the mistake during the Battle of Ard. Allah the Exalted then revealed Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 159. So by mercy from Allah you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. So pardon them, and ask forgiveness for them and consult them in the matter. And when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely upon him. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not even criticize the hypocrites for abandoning the army at such a critical time. This would have only infuriated them, thereby pushing them further away from Islam. He instead continued showing them respect and kindness, hoping they would take this act of mercy positively, thereby sincerely repenting and accepting Islam. 
This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1203 to 1204. Throughout the Holy Quran and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Muslims have been advised to be merciful to others. For example, a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1924, advises that those who show mercy to the creation will be shown mercy by Allah, the Exalted. It is important to note that showing mercy is not only through one's actions, such as donating wealth to the poor. It in fact encompasses every aspect of one's life and interaction with others, such as one's words. This is why Allah, the Exalted, warns those who show mercy to others by donating charity that failing to show mercy through their speech, such as counting their favors done to others, only cancels their reward. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O oh, you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. True mercy is shown in everything, one's facial expression, one's glance and the tone of their speech. This was the full mercy shown by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and is therefore how Muslims must act. In addition, showing mercy is so important that Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear in the Holy Quran that even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, possessed countless beautiful and noble characteristics yet, the one which attracted the hearts of people towards him and Islam was mercy. The verse quoted earlier clearly warns that without mercy, people would have fled from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If this was the case in respect to him, even though he possessed countless other beautiful characteristics, how can Muslims, who do not possess such noble characteristics, expect to have a positive impact on others, such as their children, without showing true mercy? Simply put, Muslims should treat others how they wish to be treated by Allah, the Exalted, and others, which is undoubtedly with true and full mercy. Two tongues. In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca decided to take revenge for the loss at the Battle of Badr, which occurred in the previous year. This led to the Battle of Ard. Many companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were martyred and their bodies were mutilated by the non-Muslims. The leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, retreated from Ard with his followers before the battle had begun. Before the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would give his Friday sermon, Abdullah bin Ubay would rise and declare that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was amongst them and that Allah, the Exalted, gave them honor and glory through him. He would then command the people of Medina to support, listen, and obey the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. After the Battle of Ard and before the Friday sermon, he rose to give his usual insincere speech. But this time he was manhandled by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who told him to sit down and be quiet, as he was no longer worthy of addressing the people in the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 71 to 72. A sign of hypocrisy is being two-faced. This is the one who changes their behavior in order to please different groups of people, intending thereby to gain some worldly things. They speak with many different tongues, showing their support to different people, while harboring dislike for them. They fail to be sincere towards people, which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. If they fail to repent, they will find themselves in the hereafter with two tongues of fire. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4873. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 14. When they meet the believers, they say, We believe. But when they meet their evil companions in privacy, they say, Surely we are with you, we were merely jesting. Abdullah bin Ubay then left the mosque angrily and met some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, at its gate. When he informed them of what occurred, they advised him to seek forgiveness from Allah, the Exalted, and asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to seek forgiveness on his behalf also. He arrogantly turned away from their sincere advice. Allah the Exalted revealed chapter 63 al munafikan verses 5 to 6 in connection to this. And when it is said to them, Come, the Messenger of Allah will ask forgiveness for you, 
They turn their heads aside and you see them evading while they are arrogant. It is all the same for them whether you ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them, never will Allah forgive them. Indeed, Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, Volume 9, pages 653 to 654. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a person who possesses even an atom's worth of pride in their heart will not enter paradise. He clarified that pride is when a person rejects the truth and looks down on others. No amount of good deeds will benefit someone who possesses pride. This is quite obvious when one observes the devil and how his countless years of worship did not benefit him when he became proud. In fact, the following verse clearly connects pride with disbelief, so a Muslim must avoid this evil characteristic at all costs. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 34 And mention when we said to the angels prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. The proud is the one who rejects the truth when it is presented to them simply because it did not come from them and as it challenges their desires and mentality. The proud person also believes they are superior to others even though they are unaware of their own ultimate end and the ultimate end of others. This is plain ignorance. In reality, it is foolish to be proud of anything, seeing as Allah, the Exalted, created and granted everything a person owns. Even the righteous deeds one performs are only due to the inspiration, knowledge and strength granted by Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, being proud of something which does not innately belong to them is plain foolishness. This is just like a person who becomes proud over a mansion they do not even own or live in. This is the reason why pride belongs to Allah, the Exalted, as He alone is the Creator and innate owner of all things. The one who challenges Allah, the Exalted, in pride will be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4090. A Muslim should instead follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and adopt humility. The humble truly recognize that all the good they possess and all the evil they are protected from comes from no one except Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, humility is more fitting for a person than pride. A person should not be fooled into believing humility leads to disgrace, as no one has been more honored than the humble servants of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has guaranteed an increase in status for the one who adopts humility for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029. Search for Piety In the third year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, Uthman bin Affan married Umm Kulthum, may Allah be pleased with them, the daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, following the death of his previous wife Umm Kulthum's sister Rukhaya, may Allah be pleased with them. Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, was the only man to marry two daughters, one after the other, of a holy prophet. Peace be upon them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 82. After the marriage, when the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questioned his daughter about Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him. She referred to him as the best of husbands. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Uthman ibn Affan, Dun Nurain, pages 54 to 55. According to a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 110, it was Allah, the Exalted, who commanded for Uthman to marry Umm Kulthum, may Allah be pleased with them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, only permitted these marriages as Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, was a pious man. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5090, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person is married for four reasons, their wealth, lineage, beauty, or for their piety. He concluded by warning that a person should marry for the sake of piety, otherwise they will be loser. It is important to understand that the first three things mentioned in this narration are very transient and imperfect. They may give someone temporary happiness, 
but ultimately these things will become a burden for them, as they are linked to the material world, and not to the thing which grants ultimate and permanent success, namely, faith. One only needs to observe the rich and famous, in order to understand that wealth does not bring happiness. In fact, the rich are the most unsatisfied and unhappy people on earth. Marrying someone for the sake of their lineage is foolish, as it does not guarantee the person will make a good spouse. In fact, if the marriage does not work out it destroys the family bond the two families possessed before the marriage. Marrying only for the sake of beauty meaning, love is not wise, as this is a fickle emotion which changes with the passing of time and with one's mood. How many couples, supposedly drowned in love, ended up hating each other? But it is important to note, that this narration does not mean one should find a spouse who is poor, as it is important to get married to someone who can financially support a family. Neither does it mean one should not be attracted to their spouse, as this is an important aspect of a healthy marriage. But this narration means that these things should not be the main or ultimate reason someone gets married. The main and ultimate quality a Muslim should look for in a spouse is piety. This is when a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience. Put simply, the one who fears Allah, the Exalted, will treat their spouse well in both times of happiness and difficulty. On the other hand, those who are irreligious will mistreat their spouse whenever they are upset. This is one of the main reasons why domestic violence has increased amongst Muslims in recent years. Finally, if a Muslim desires to get married, they should firstly obtain the knowledge associated with it, such as the rights they owe their spouse, the rights they are owed from their spouse, and how to correctly deal with one spouse in different situations. Unfortunately, ignorance of this leads to many arguments and divorces as people demand things which their spouse is not obliged to fulfill. Knowledge is the foundation of a healthy and successful marriage. Stern on Faith Sometime after the Battle of Ard, some senior non-Muslims from Mecca, including Abu Sufyan and Ikramah ibn Abu Jahl, visited the leader of the hypocrites Abdullah bin Ubay. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, extended protection to them while they visited Medina, perhaps hoping their hearts would soften towards Islam during their stay. During their visit, they approached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and told him not to criticize their idols, and instead declare that their idols possessed the power to intercede in the court of Allah, the Exalted, and in return they would leave him alone. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then commanded Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, to escort them out of Medina. In this regard Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 33 Al-Azab, verse 1. O Prophet, fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and wise. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al nuzul 33 to 1, pages 127 to 128. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away, and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. 
But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. The fourth year after migration. Facing hardship with steadfastness. In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina. The external threats to Medina increased significantly after the losses the Muslims faced at the Battle of Ard. The various non-Muslim tribes believed what happened at Ard weakened the Muslims, and they were no longer the powerful force which gained victory at the Battle of Badr. Many of these tribes took this as an opportunity to fight against the Muslims in order to conquer Medina. For example, the Banu Asad tribe mustered fighters to attack the Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, preempted their attack by dispatching a Muslim army of 150 fighters to the non-Muslims' homeland and neutralized their mission, dispersed their fighters and obtained some spoils of war. Another non-Muslim tribe gathered some fighters to attack the Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dispatched a force against them who managed to kill their leader and defeat their band of fighters. This has been discussed in Imam Safi Yur Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 296 to 297. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, faced each difficulty and attack with patience and steadfastness. This reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil, and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for His sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties, and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. Proof of Love In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a tribe living outside Medina, claimed to have accepted Islam and requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to send some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to their tribe in order to teach them more about Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dispatched some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, but they were betrayed. Some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were martyred, 
others were captured and turned over to the non-Muslims of Mecca as prisoners. When one of these prisoners, Zayd bin al-Dathina, may Allah be pleased with him, was being executed, he was asked whether he would prefer to swap places with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He swore an oath that he would not like the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to be even pricked by a thorn if it meant he escaped execution. A non-Muslim leader, Abu Suwaban, commented that he had never witnessed a group of people love someone more than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, love the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 86 to 88. Every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The other Holy Prophets, peace be upon him them, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688 which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Yet they barely know him as they are too busy to study his life, character and teachings. This is foolish, as how can one truly love someone they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on the life, character and teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious, as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. Finally, it is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on Judgment Day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. A True Believer In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a tribe living outside Medina, claimed to have accepted Islam and requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to send some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to their tribe in order to teach them more about Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dispatched some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, but they were betrayed. Qubay bin Adi, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of those who were captured and sold to a non-Muslim of Mecca, who desired to execute him in retaliation of the killing of his relative, who Qubay, may Allah be pleased with him, killed during the Battle of Badr. Qubay, may Allah be pleased with him, requested a razor to clean himself on the day he was executed. A female slave sent her small son with the razor to Qubay, may Allah be pleased with him, who was chained up in their house. She then realized she made a mistake and feared Qubay, may Allah be pleased with him, might kill the child in an act of revenge for his execution. She found the child sitting in his lap, and he then handed the child over to her and commented that he would never harm a child. On that day, while being taken to his execution, he requested to offer two cycles of prayer, which he was permitted to do. They tortured him, hoping he would renounce Islam, but he remained firm. Eventually, he was executed and crucified by the non-Muslims of Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 86 to 88, and in Imam Muhammad Kanlawi's Hayat Sahaba, Volume 1, pages 509 to 510. Even in such a difficult situation, Qubay, may Allah be pleased with him, maintained his good manners towards the non-Muslims. 
In a narration found in Sunan an nasr number 4998, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the signs of a true Muslim and a true believer. A true Muslim is the one who keeps their verbal and physical harm away from others. This in fact, includes all people irrespective of their faith. It includes all types of verbal and physical sins which can cause harm or distress to another. This can include failing to give the best advice to others, as this contradicts sincerity towards others which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. It includes advising others to disobey Allah, the exalted, thereby inviting them towards sins. A Muslim should avoid this behavior, as they will be taken account for every person who ACTS on their bad advice. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. Physical harm includes causing problems for other people's livelihood, committing fraud, conning others and physical abuse. All of these characteristics contradict Islamic teachings and must be avoided. A true believer, according to the main narration under discussion, is the one who keeps their harm away from the lives and property of others. Again, this applies to all people irrespective of their faith. This includes stealing, misusing or damaging the property and belongings of others. Whenever one is entrusted with someone else's property, they must ensure they only use it with the owner's permission and in a way which is pleasing and agreeable to the owner. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan an nasr number 5421, that whoever illegally takes someone else's property through a false oath, even if it is as small as a twig of a tree will go to hell. To conclude, a Muslim must support their verbal declaration of belief with actions, as they are the physical proof of one's belief which will be needed in order to obtain success on the Day of Judgment. In addition, a Muslim should fulfill the characteristics of true belief in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. An excellent way of achieving this in respect to people is to simply treat others how they wish to be treated by people, which is with respect and peace. Overlooking and Forgiving In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leader, Abu Sufyan, commented that they should send someone to assassinate the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A better one who overheard his comment, secretly held a meeting with him, where he agreed to carry out this evil plan for a fee. The Bedouin set out to Medina and found the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in his mosque with his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commented that the man intended treachery, but Allah, the Exalted, would foil his plan. When he drew close to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Yuzid bin Hader, may Allah be pleased with him, pulled the man away and while doing so found a dagger on him. The Bedouin was subdued, but before anyone could harm him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questioned him about his plan. When he informed him of his plan, the Bedouin was handed over to Yuzid, may Allah be pleased with him, as a prisoner with the instruction not to kill him. The next day the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, spoke to the Bedouin and gave him the option of being released unharmed or for him to accept Islam. The man accepted Islam. He commented that he recognized the truthfulness of Islam when he first entered Medina. When he first observed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he lost all his strength, something that never happened to him before. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, perceived his treachery even before he did anything. These things convinced him of the truthfulness of Islam. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 92 to 93. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself, but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190. Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress.
Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid, a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the Exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. Firmness in difficulties In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a non-Muslim, Abu Bara Amir bin Malik, visited the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in Medina. He did not accept Islam, nor show enmity towards it. He suggested that some companions, may Allah be pleased with them, should be dispatched to his area in Najd to invite the people towards Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was hesitant as he suspected they would attack his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Abu Bara guaranteed their security. Around 70 learned companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were dispatched but they were attacked by another tribe in Najd, the Banu Sulam. They were all martyred, except one who was carried away wounded. This has been discussed in Imam Safi or Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 299 to 301, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, volume 1, pages 1234 to 1235. In life, a Muslim will always face either times of ease or times of difficulty. No one only experiences times of ease without experiencing some difficulties. But the thing to note is that even though difficulties by definition are hard to deal with, they are in fact a means to obtain and demonstrate one's true greatness and servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, in the majority of cases people learn more important life lessons when they face difficulties than when they face times of ease. And people often change for the better after experiencing times of difficulty than times of ease. One only needs to reflect on this in order to understand this truth. In fact, if one studies the Holy Quran, they will realize the majority of the events discussed involve difficulties. This indicates that true greatness does not lie in always experiencing times of ease. It in fact lies in experiencing difficulties while remaining obedient to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is proven by the fact that each of the great difficulties discussed in Islamic teachings end with ultimate success for those who obeyed Allah, the Exalted. So a Muslim should not be bothered about facing difficulties, as these are just moments for them to shine while acknowledging their true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, through sincere obedience. This is the key to ultimate success in both worlds. Breaking Pledges In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation informing them of their treachery and he left and returned to Medina before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101. In this regard, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 5 al maidah verse 11. O you who have believed, remember the favor of Allah upon you, when a people determined to extend their hands in aggression against you, but he withheld their hands from you, and fear Allah. And upon Allah let the believers rely. This has been discussed in Imam Wahidi's Asbab al-Nuzul, 511, page 67. 
In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that breaking promises is an aspect of hypocrisy. The greatest of promises a Muslim has made is with Allah, the Exalted, which is to obey him sincerely. This involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. All other promises made with people must also be kept, unless one has a valid excuse especially, the ones a parent makes with children. Breaking promises only teaches children bad character, and encourages them to believe being deceitful is an acceptable characteristic to possess. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2227, Allah, the Exalted, declares that he will be against the one who makes a promise in his name and then breaks it without a valid excuse. How can the one who has Allah, the Exalted, against them on Judgment Day, possibly succeed? True Justice In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation informing them of their treachery and he left and returned to Medina before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then dispatched a message to the Banu Nadir, warning them to leave his territory and protection. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could have taken revenge immediately against this non-Muslim tribe who broke their pledge and plotted to assassinate him, but instead he adhered to justice and gave them an opportunity to leave peacefully. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted, in the correct way, according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind, by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people, by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam, by committing injustice to people, in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. Point one, so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. One must be just towards their dependents by fulfilling their rights and necessities according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. They should not be neglected nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice, as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and oneself. Evil Support In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him while secretly planning to assassinate him. 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation informing them of their treachery and he left and returned to Medina before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then dispatched a message to the Banu Nadir warning them to leave his territory and protection. The hypocrites urged the Banu Nadir to stay and offered their support to them. They claimed that if the Banu Nadir resisted against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they would support them. If the Banu Nadir fought, they would fight with them and if they were expelled from the territory, they would leave with them. In this regard, Allah the Exalted revealed Chapter 59 Al-Hash, Verse 11. Have you not considered those who practice hypocrisy, saying to their brothers associates who have disbelieved among the people of the scripture, if you are expelled, we will surely leave with you, and we will not obey in regard to you, anyone, ever, and if you are fought, we will surely aid you. But Allah testifies that they are liars. This encouraged the Banu Nadir to stand against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Ultimately the hypocrites did nothing when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, decided to fight against the Banu Nadir. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101, and in Imam Safi Yor Rahman's The Sealed Nectar, pages 302 to 303. Muslims should note that a major sign of true love is when one directs their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and facing destiny with patience. This is because obedience leads to success and safety in both this world and in the hereafter. A person who does not desire safety and success for a person can never truly love them irrespective of what they claim or how they treat the other person. The same way a person becomes happy when their beloved obtains worldly success, like a job, they will also desire their beloved to obtain success in the hereafter. If a person does not care about another obtaining safety and success especially in the next world, then they do not love them. A true lover could not bear knowing and seeing their beloved facing difficulties and punishment in this world or in the next. This is only avoidable through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, they would always direct their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. If a person directs another towards their own selfish interest or the interest of others instead of the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. This applies to all relationships such as friendships and relatives. Therefore, a Muslim should assess whether those in their life direct them towards Allah, the Exalted, or not. If they do, then it is a clear sign of their love for them. If they do not, then it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Foregoing revenge. In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation informing them of their treachery and he left and returned to Medina before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then dispatched a message to the Banu Nadir warning them to leave his territory and protection. The hypocrites urged the Banu Nadir to stay and offered their support to them. They claimed that if the Banu Nadir resisted against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they would support them. If the Banu Nadir fought, they would fight with them and if they were expelled from the territory, they would leave with them. This encouraged the Banu Nadir to stand against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Ultimately the hypocrites did nothing when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, decided to fight against the Banu Nadir. When the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, besieged the Banu Nadir, the latter requested the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to spare their blood and instead grant them safe passage so they could evacuate the area with their belongings. 
Instead of taking revenge against the Banu Nadir for their evil plan, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, allowed them to take whatever they could carry except weapons. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself, but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190 Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the Exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22 and let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. No compulsion in faith. In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation informing them of their treachery and he left and returned to Medina before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. As a result, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, besieged and defeated them, but exiled them instead of killing them for their many ACTS of treason. Before the coming of Islam, when a polytheist woman from Medina would lose her children at a young age, she would make a vow to raise her next child as a Jew, hoping this would prevent the child's death. As a result, these children were raised amongst the Banu Nadir tribe and were therefore expelled with the rest of the tribe. When their biological parents, who had now become Muslims, desired to keep their children in Medina and impose Islam on them, Allah, the Exalted, revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 256. There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. So whoever disbelieves in Taghut false objects of worship, and believes in Allah has grasped the most trustworthy handhold with no break in it. And Allah is hearing and knowing. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101, and in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2682. Islam is something which must be accepted by a person's heart, not just through their words and actions. As the affair of a person's heart is hidden, forcing them to accept Islam becomes a pointless endeavor. This clearly refutes those who claim Islam spread by the sword. Allah, the Exalted, has repeatedly condemned and harshly criticized those who accept Islam with their tongues, but reject it in their hearts meaning, hypocrites. This would be the outcome of the one who is forced to accept Islam. Allah, the Exalted, would never be satisfied with this code of conduct, as open disbelief is preferred over hypocrisy. This is obvious, as the lowest level in hell has been reserved for the hypocrites. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 145. Indeed, the hypocrites will be in the lowest depths of the fire. In addition, the Holy Quran makes it clear that the people of the book, Jews and Christians, living in an Islamic state, can live in peace and with full rights even if they do not accept Islam by paying a tax. 
If Muslims were allowed to force others to accept Islam, there is no need to prescribe this tax. Chapter 9 at Tawbah, verse 29. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful, and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture, fight, until they give the jizya tax. Extreme Generosity In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him, while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation, informing them of their treachery, and he left and returned to Medina, before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. As a result, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, besieged and defeated them, but exiled them instead of killing them for their many ACTS of treason. The spoils of war were gained without any fighting, and was therefore handed over to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He gathered the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, and offered them a choice of equally sharing in the spoils with the companions from Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, or allowing the companions from Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them, to take all of it thereby allowing them to no longer need the financial assistance of the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, such as living with them. The companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, replied that he should distribute all the spoils to the companions from Mecca, may Allah be with them, and they would continue aiding them financially as well. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, pages 1269 to 1270. This is connected to Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92. Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And whatever you spend, indeed Allah is knowing of it. This verse makes it clear that a person cannot be a true believer, meaning, they will possess a defect in their faith, until they are willing to dedicate the things they love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Even though many believe this verse applies to wealth, but it in fact means much more. It includes every blessing which a Muslim likes and loves. For example, Muslims are happy to dedicate their precious time on the things which please them. But they refuse to dedicate time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, beyond the obligatory duties which barely takes an hour or two in one's day. Countless Muslims are happy to dedicate their physical strength in different pleasurable activities, yet, many of them refuse to dedicate it to the things which please Allah, the Exalted, such as voluntary fasting. More commonly, People are happy to strive in things which they desire, like obtaining excess wealth which they do not need, even if it means they have to do overtime and give up their sleep. Yet how many strive in this way in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience? How many give up their precious sleep in order to offer voluntary prayers? It is strange that Muslims desire lawful, worldly and religious blessings yet overlook a simple fact that they will only gain these things when they dedicate the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. How can they dedicate minimal things to Him and still expect to achieve all their dreams? This attitude is truly strange. Blind Imitation In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, visited a non-Muslim tribe, Banu Nadir, who he had previously made a pledge of support and peace with, in order to ask for financial assistance. They replied that they would help him, while secretly planning to assassinate him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received divine revelation, informing them of their treachery, and he left and returned to Medina, before they had a chance to enact their evil plan. As a result, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, besieged and defeated them, but exiled them instead of killing them for their many ACTS of treason. After their exile, a Jewish scholar named Amra bin Suda, 
who belonged to the Banu Kuraiza tribe living close to Medina, passed by the abandoned homes that belonged to the Banu Nadir. After witnessing this, he returned to his tribe, the Banu Kuraiza, and assembled their leaders. He openly admitted that this occurred because they disobeyed Allah, the Exalted, by not accepting and following the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Each of their leaders admitted that the signs found in their divine scriptures clearly indicated the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the Holy Quran. They even mentioned some senior Jewish scholars who had passed away before the coming of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and how they urged their people to accept and follow him before they died. One of these leaders commented that the only thing which prevented him, and by extension his followers, from accepting Islam was the other leader, as he did not feel comfortable to oppose him, and added that if that leader accepted Islam, so would he and his followers. But out of fear of losing their prestige and worldly benefits, and blind imitation of one another, they failed to accept Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 100 to 101 and 108 to 109. Blind imitation of others is a major reason why people reject the truth. A person should utilize their common sense and choose a way of life based on evidence and clear signs and not blindly imitate others like cattle. Blind imitation is even disliked within Islam. A narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4049, indicates the importance of not blindly imitating others in accepting Islam, such as one's family, without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one surpasses blind imitation and obeys Allah, the Exalted, while truly recognizing His Lordship and their own servanthood. This is in fact the purpose of mankind. Chapter 51 ad Dariat, verse 56 and I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. How can one truly worship someone they do not even recognize? Blind imitation is acceptable for children, but adults must follow in the footsteps of the righteous predecessors by truly understanding the purpose of their creation through knowledge. Ignorance is the very reason why the Muslims who fulfill their obligatory duties still feel disconnected from Allah, the Exalted. This recognition aids a Muslim to behave as a true servant of Allah, the Exalted, throughout the day, not just during the five daily obligatory prayers. Only through this will Muslims fulfill true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. And this is the weapon which overcomes all difficulties a Muslim faces during their life. If they do not possess this, they will face difficulties without gaining reward. In fact, it will only lead to more difficulties in both worlds. Performing the obligatory duties through blind imitation may fulfill the obligation, but it will not safely guide one through every difficulty in order to reach the proximity of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. In fact, in most cases blind imitation will lead to one eventually abandoning their obligatory duties. This Muslim will only fulfill their duties in times of difficulty and turn away from them in times of ease or vice versa. Key to all evil in the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, Allah, the Exalted prohibited alcohol. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, page 1281. Abrogation is the process by which one command or prohibition, after some time, is replaced by another command or prohibition. Allah, the Exalted, employed this technique in order to make the transition from a non-Muslim to a strong Muslim easier for a person. If all the final commands and prohibitions were put into full affect in one go, this process becomes difficult. This is the reason why alcohol was not forbidden immediately in Islam, as giving it up in one instant would have been difficult for most people who drank it. Instead, it was prohibited in stages. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 219 They ask you about wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin and yet some benefit for people. But their sin is greater than their benefit. And chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 43 O you who have believed, 
Do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying. And finally, chapter 5, al maida verse 90. O you who have believed indeed intoxicants gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. This process is also adopted by medical doctors, who do not prescribe the full doses of medicine straightway, and instead build up the dose over time, so that their patients adapt to them in a positive way. This strategy was, in fact, a great blessing and mercy from Allah, the Exalted, as countless people who accepted Islam would have rejected it if all the final commands and prohibitions were revealed in one go at the beginning of Revelation. As indicated by the final part of this verse, even though Allah, the Exalted, undoubtedly has the authority to do this, yet He chose the path of ease and mercy for the people. In addition, the prohibitions and commands of Allah, the Exalted, do not exist to make people's life harder. They only exist in order to benefit people in both this world and in the next, even if these benefits are not apparent to people. For example, the negative effects of alcohol, which science has proven, was not always apparent, such as its negative effect on the organs of the body. It only became unlawful in Islam to protect people from this and other harms. In addition, it is an aspect of faith to accept something without understanding its wisdoms. If all the wisdoms of the commands and prohibitions were made apparent, then it would not allow Muslims to possess complete faith. Allah, the Exalted, does not benefit from these commands and prohibitions only people do. This process of abrogation is in fact an aspect of the protection and help of Allah, the Exalted, so that one can succeed in both worlds with ease. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah number 3371, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a Muslim must never consume alcohol as it is the key to all evil. Unfortunately, this major sin has increased amongst the Muslims over time. This is the key to all evil as it gives rise to other sins. This is quite obvious as a drunk loses control over their tongue and physical actions. One only needs to look at the news to observe how much crime is committed due to drinking alcohol. Even those who drink moderately only cause damage to their bodies, which science has proven. The physical and mental diseases associated with alcohol are numerous and cause a heavy burden on the National Health Service and the taxpayers. It is the key to all evil as it negatively affects all three aspects of a person, namely their body, mind and soul. Chapter 5 al maida verse 90 O you who have believed indeed intoxicants gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. The fact that drinking alcohol has been placed next to things which are associated with polytheism in this verse highlights how important it is to avoid. It is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3376, that the one who drinks alcohol regularly will not enter paradise. Spreading the Islamic greeting of peace is a key to obtaining paradise, according to a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 68. Yet, a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrat, number 1017, advises Muslims not to greet someone who regularly drinks alcohol. Alcohol is a unique major sin as it has been cursed from ten different ways in a single narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3380. These include the alcohol itself, the one who produces it, the one it is produced for, the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who carries it, the one to whom it is carried to, the one who uses the wealth obtained through selling it, the one who drinks it and the one who pours it. The one who deals with something that has been cursed like this will not obtain true success unless they sincerely repent. Gambling In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, Allah, the Exalted, prohibited gambling. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's The Noble Life of the Prophet, PBUH, Volume 1, page 1281. 
The fact that gambling has been placed next to things which are associated with polytheism in the following verse highlights how important it is to avoid. Chapter 5 al maida verse 90 O you who have believed indeed intoxicants gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrat, number 1262, that a Muslim should donate charity as compensation for saying to another that they should make a bet. If talking about placing a bet has a penalty, can one imagine the seriousness of actually gambling? Gambling not only destroys a person, but all those associated with them, such as their family. It is associated with many other sins and conditions, such as alcoholism and depression. A person might win some wealth through gambling, but in the long run they will only ever be a loser. Sincerity to the Holy Quran In the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, left for an expedition called Dart al Rika. When they stopped at a valley overnight, he ordered two companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to stand guard at the mouth of the valley while the army slept. One of these companions, Abad bin Bish, may Allah be pleased with him, took the first shift while the second companion, Amar bin Yazir, may Allah be pleased with him, slept. Abad bin Bish, may Allah be pleased with him, began to pray. During his prayer, a non-Muslim enemy soldier spotted him and struck him with an arrow. Abad bin Bish, may Allah be pleased with him, removed the arrow from his body and continued praying. This occurred four times before he woke up Amar bin Yazir, may Allah be pleased with him. The non-Muslim soldier fled when he realized that there were two guards. Amar bin Yazir, may Allah be pleased with him, inquired why Abad bin Bish, may Allah be pleased him, did not wake him up when he was struck with the first arrow. He replied that he did not want to stop reciting the Holy Quran, until he finished his prayer. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 115 to 116. Muslims are not expected to behave in this manner, but they are expected to show true sincerity to the Holy Quran. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Quran. This includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. Beautiful Character in the fourth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, left for an expedition called Dart al Rika. While returning from this expedition, the weak camel of Jabir bin Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, was lagging behind the rest of the army. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, noticed this, he told him to dismount from the camel. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then prodded the camel a few times with a stick and told him to mount again. The camel then became strong and fast. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked him to sell him the camel. Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, offered to give it to him as a gift, but the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, refused and a price was agreed. As Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, recently married, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, held a wedding feast for him. When they returned to Medina, Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, 
brought the camel which he agreed to sell to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, saw the camel, he gave it Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, as a gift, and gave him the money they agreed to, in the sale and some extra. This has been discussed in Ibn Kathir's, The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 117 to 118. This was the attitude of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, towards others. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2003, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the heaviest thing in the scales of Judgment Day will be good character. This includes showing good character towards Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. It also includes showing good character towards people. Unfortunately, many Muslims strive to fulfill the obligatory duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, but neglect the second aspect by mistreating others. They fail to understand its importance. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515, clearly advises that a person will not be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. Meaning, the same way a person desires to be treated kindly, they must also treat others with good character. Otherwise, they will not succeed, as the only truly successful people are the believers. In addition, a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their verbal and physical harm away from others and their possessions, irrespective of their faith. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3318, that a woman will enter hell because she mistreated a cat which led to its death. And another narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2550, advises that a man was forgiven because he fed a thirsty dog. If this is the outcome of showing good character and the consequences of showing evil character to animals, can one imagine the importance of showing good character towards Allah, the Exalted, and people? In fact, the main narration under discussion concludes by advising that the one who possesses good character will be rewarded like the Muslim who persistently worships Allah, the Exalted, and regularly fasts.